Today, the subcommittee is holding a hearing on HRES 134, which would require the clerk of the House to make signatures on discharge petitions public from the time a petition is filed, rather than after 218 members have signed, as the current rule provides for. HRES 134 is itself the subject of a discharge petition, which just last Wednesday received the requisite 218 signatures. Under House rules, a motion to discharge the Rules Committee from responsibility for HRES 134 may be brought to the floor on Monday, September 27, or any subsequent second or fourth Monday of a month. Up until the time the motion is made, the Rules Committee may report HRES 134, and it's quite likely that the committee will do that. The procedure for getting a bill to the, floor, to the House uh, floor by way of a discharge petition has been a feature of the House's legislative process since 1924. The history of the procedure shows that the reason our predecessors wanted to keep names of, of signers undisclosed was to keep the discharge process from becoming a way for, for lobbyists, for special interests, to pressure members to force action on their pet bills. Congress wanted the discharge process to be a last resort rather than a routine way to obtain House consideration of a measure, and they figured that if the process were kept free of outside pressures, uh, that is the way it would work. The key decisions on keeping names undisclosed until a majority of members had signed a petition date back to the 1920s and the 1930s, long before anyone envisioned the televising of congressional proceedings or the opening to the press and the public of virtually every other official action that the Congress takes. Viewed in the context of the scrutiny that is applied these days to everything else Congress does, our discharge process seems anomalous and difficult to justify. Still, I think that most people, whether they support or oppose disclosure of discharge petition signatures, would agree that disclosing names from the start is likely to change the way the discharge process is used. As yesterday's roll call editorial warned, and I quote it, Un unlocking the drawer will open a Pandora's box, seriously tampering with the legislative process. We cannot say with any certainty whether the discharge process would be used more frequently as a result of the disclosure of signatures, but it seems highly likely that special interest groups will begin routinely urging members not just to co-sponsor bills, but also to sign discharge petitions on them. Even though the two actions are quite different, a member might want to co-sponsor a bill to show support and urge action on a proposal, but not want to sign a discharge petition because he wants committee consideration on it, uh, of it, because before it goes to the floor, uh, supporters of a proposal are likely to demand that members do both uh, to show that they are truly committed to a proposal. Legislating by discharge on a routine basis is something that I would think even the strongest proponents of disclosure do not want to see happen. By bypassing committee consideration, that is the input from experts at hearings and the refinements made by members who understand the issues involved in more depth than the rest of us might, uh, we would be shortchanging the deliberative process that is so essential to producing a good legislative product. The result of short-circuiting the legislative process by taking a bill as introduced straight to the floor uh, for a vote is likely to be laws that are not well thought out. Another disturbing aspect of increased use of the discharge process would be the lack of opportunity to amend some bills that are the subject of a successful discharge petition once they are brought on the floor. For some types of bills, no amendment would be allowed unless the member who has been recognized to manage the bill acquiesces to it. For members who feel that uh, the number of amendments that are allowed to be offered on the floor are, are often too severely restricted as it is, the floor procedure for measures which are brought up pursuant to a discharge motion uh, should be a very serious concern. We have some very distinguished witnesses uh, who have graciously agreed to be with us today to discuss these and other implications of changing our rules to disclose the, uh, sig the signatures on discharge petitions. We hope that they will also give us their best advice on whether we should make any additional changes to the discharge process along with disclosure. Some of us are very interested in trying to figure out a way that we can provide for disclosure of names as called for by HRES 134, but also ensure that the primary way the House processes legislation continues to be through its committees, and that discharge remains the last resort procedure that it has been throughout its history. Um, I'd like to recognize, if I may, our good friend uh, Jerry Solomon, gentleman from New York at this point. Ordinarily, our ranking member on the subcommittee is our friend from California, Mr. Dreyer, who's down at the White House, as I understand it, standing close, standing shoulder to shoulder with this president on behalf of NAFTA. We're happy very much, we're very happy, uh, Mr. Solomon, to have you here today, sir. And you were recognized at this time for anything you might like to say. Well, I thank the gentleman, and I, I wonder why I wasn't invited to the White House um, on behalf of NAFTA. 
and but I'd be glad to discuss that with anyone if they'd uh, care to <laughs> later on. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, our ranking Republican member, as you noted, uh, of the subcommittee, Mr. Dreyer, has been detained due to a meeting with the President, and I ask unanimous consent at this point uh, to enter his statement in the record, if I might. Without objection, such would, such would be the order. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I couldn't help but note that uh, you mentioned the word pet bills uh, in your, your opening statement. And uh, pet bills, uh, in my opinion, uh, are so-called porkers, uh, pork barrel bills, and uh, that benefit a member's uh, district specifically. And to my knowledge, uh, we have never, ever, and I've done extensive research work on this and also leaned on several scholars, uh, to my knowledge, there has never been a discharge petition filed on a porker. So I don't think we can, uh, we have to worry about uh, those, wait, kind, those kind of bills. Just you wait. Mr. Chairman, let me, uh, let me commend you and Chairman Moakley on agreeing to hold this hearing on this subject of discharge petition secrecy. You have already demonstrated by today's hearings that discharge petitions are not necessarily contrary to the interests of the committee system. Uh, what they can be is a prod to committee action desired by a House majority. And after all, that's uh, what we operate under here is uh, a House majority. Second, I want to commend our lead witness and the sponsor of this discharge petition on this sunshine rule, Mr. Inhofe, for his tireless efforts, and I mean tireless, in bringing this matter to our attention and getting the 218 signatures on his discharge petition to ensure that the House has a chance to vote on his rule change. As one of the signers of that discharge petition, uh, I really must express a little resentment at uh, the attempt by some of the opponents of discharge sunshine to portray this as a move to, uh, to benefit special interests. Uh, I want this committee to know and the general public watching these proceedings that I was not approached by any one or any two or any special interest lobbyist to sign this discharge petition. I did it because I was glad to do it. In fact, any lobbyist worth his salt would probably stay away from urging members to file, uh, to sign a discharge petition since that would only, I think, poison the working relationship that they have with committees. And boy, they have that working ship with, uh, with committees. I signed the discharge petition first and foremost because it's the right thing to do. We have no business conducting any of the people's business in secret, period. This secrecy requirement is a relic of the dark ages that should have been uh, thrown out uh, back in the 1970s when we brought sunshine to most of our other proceedings. And some of us here were, were here in those days. Secondly, I signed it because I know the committees tend to pigeonhole legislation that a majority of the people want acted on. I've got a whole slew of legislation dealing with uh, the terrible problem of drugs with our kids today across this country. All that legislation has been pigeonholed for years by sequential referrals and with the pride of, uh, of subcommittee chairmen uh, and even ranking Republican members who don't want to let that legislation out on the floor. The discharge petition is a way for a House majority to remind committees that they work for the House and not vice versa, just as we work for the people. And if a committee is not responsive to the House in reporting legislation, then the House should have a right to discharge that legislation and have the guts to do so in the open and not in some dark drawer. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I signed that petition because the people in my district, once they became aware of this arcane uh, rule uh, and through editorial campaigns and radio talk shows, uh, asked me to sign it. And I know the gentleman participated in literally dozens and dozens of those talk shows across the nation. And that is really what this is all about. It's the people's house being responsive to the people. I know that scares some of the folks who will testify in opposition to this sunshine rule. But to me, it should be what our democracy is really all about. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to uh, this list of distinguished witnesses coming before our body. And uh, uh, we certainly uh, hope that we're going to get some good results out of this hearing. And I commend you and Chairman Mopley again for holding the hearing. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Solomon. Thanks for your kind words. Uh, we are honored to have with us our chairman of the full committee, Honorable Joseph Mopley from Massachusetts. Yeah. I thank you uh, very much, Tony, for having the hearing. This is what we promised uh, all along when the signatures were being uh, 
gotten for the discharge petition. <clears throat> and I think that this is really an openness. This is the open hearing uh, more than a discharge petition. This is in front of all the witnesses, in front of C-SPAN, and, uh, and I think all the facts should come out here. Uh, I think the majority of the House has spoken that they want uh, openness. Uh, that's fine. Where do we go from there? And I think this is where the, uh, the committee will do its best work. Uh, it, it was strange that uh, this uh, committee was being criticized yesterday for having hearings today. I mean, I, I thought that's what openness in government was all about, having hearings. And I, I feel that legislative hearings are, are much more open than just someone signing a discharge petition. So I hope that uh, we'll hear from all the experts on all sides and finally come out with some kind of legislation that uh, maybe there won't be any change from in off and maybe there will be. But I, I think today is the day that we should decide and regardless of what this committee decides today uh, Mr. Inhofe can always uh, have his day in the sun on September 27th. Thank, thank, you, very, thank you very much Mr. Chairman. We also have with us uh, our committee member, distinguished friend uh, from Florida Mr. Porter Goss. We start, we have, we have at least 13 witnesses today and uh, you're a distinguished group and we do appreciate very much you taking the time out from your busy schedules to come up here and be with us, but our lead off witness is the, the gentleman who's uh, responsible for all of this, uh, our good friend uh, uh, from Oklahoma who's serving in his fourth term, uh, the Honorable James N. Inhofe. Jim, you are welcome to start, sir, please. I, I, and as I understand it, you're going to do us the honor of joining us up here later on. Yes, and I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, at the dais later on so that I might be able to pose some questions to other witnesses. And I, and, I, and I thank you very much for having this. I, I was very pleased and uh, uh, back when, I guess it was during the interim, they decided they're going to have hearings because it's been a very active interim for me. Uh, because we're limited in our opening remarks, I want to, uh, it, there's not time to tell the whole story, but I'd like to have the committee uh, know how long I have been concerned about this. When I was first elected to Congress, my first, uh, my first day was in January of 1987, and I walked up to a member of, uh, I won't use names here, I often do, but a uh, member of, of the House on the floor who's from my part of the country who is of a very extreme uh, liberal philosophy and contrary to mine, and I said, now tell me something, we're going to be serving together and you're in the top 5% most liberal members of Congress, and I'll be in the top 5% most conservative members of Congress, and yet we're from the same part of the country. How do you account for that? And before he could answer, another guy came up uh, from, we just overheard the question. He is one who is a well-known, fine individual, but a liberal member of Congress. He said, it's easy, Inhofe. All you do is vote liberal and press release conservative. So I started checking, Mr. Chairman, to see what type of a system is in place that allows people to be one thing in Washington and to be something else when they're back home. And that's when I discovered the uh, the discharge petition process. And historically, I would have to agree with you as to the intent of John Nance Garner back at the time when this first went into effect. I believe the intent of Garner back in 1930 and 1931 and then ultimately written down in 33 was to provide cover for members of Congress who wanted to carry out uh, an agenda here that was contrary to the agenda of their electorate at home. And so he installed into a system, a discharge petition system that was already in place, a new ingredient, and that is secrecy. So that a person had, having to sign a discharge petition has to walk up to the desk and, uh, and uh, has to read a warning, an important notice that it's against contrary to the rules to disclose any of the content or the names or even the number of names. And I felt this is wrong. Well, the uh, history went on from there. There are a couple of times when we pulled some bluffs. I have to confess to you, Mr. Chairman, in order to get some things out of the uh, uh, out of the Rules Committee and other committees, we had to say that we were going to disclose the names of those who didn't sign. And I have to tell you right now, that was a bluff because we didn't have a list of those. It's very difficult to accumulate a list. First of all, it's difficult under any circumstances to get 218 people to walk up to the, the desk and sign a discharge petition. It's a lot easier to get someone as a co-author on a bill. But uh, starting now back in, in March, I have to correct something that was in the editorial that, uh, that you quoted from. They said that Inhofe, in a period of three weeks, got 218 signatures. That, of course, is not right at all. When we went into our recess on the 6th of August, I had 211. 
And uh, the entire August recess was devoted to getting the other seven, which we were successful in getting. In addition to the seven, about nine more who said they wanted to sign and who have submitted that in writing and will stay hitched. Uh, so it was a long, arduous process, and I think it's important for this committee to know and event that you're not aware of it, to, uh, to, get, to get a list of those who sign a discharge petition. You have to go up, you're assigned a number, you come back, and then you get someone else to go up, and they assign them a number, come back and say what number it was, and was there anyone in front of you? And Mr. Chairman, you might remember when I came up to you on the floor of the House of Representatives and asked if you would join in this, uh, what I consider to be the most significant reform in the history of Congress. Congress, and you were very polite to me and said you uh, thought it over and decided you were not in favor of this. But that's what I had to go through on each one of these signatures. So it's a lengthy process. And that brings us to the arguments against it. When they say that this is going to be a type of government where the committee process is circumvented, that's not true at all. In this case, I introduced this back in March. You've had all this time, this committee has had all this time, uh, Mr. Chairman, both chairmen, to hold a hearing if you wanted to hold a hearing on it. It was when it was obvious to me that there was not going to be a hearing that I went and started into the discharge petition process. And it took months and months to get it done and ultimately to have the 218 signatures. I would say that when, not if, but when the secrecy is taken off of this, that it's not going to have any impact uh, at all on the committee system because it's a long task to get eight, 218 signatures on anything. It's a lot easier just to go ahead. But the fact that it can be done is going to encourage chairmen who otherwise are going to sit on something to go ahead and have hearings. And that's what we want to accomplish with that. The argument, there are two other arguments. One I, I won't even mention, but if it comes up in questions, I will address it. But one of them is that, well, we can't, we've, we can't do a with secrecy because we don't want the special interests and lobbyists to know what we're doing around here. And that is the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard of. The special interests and the lobbyists already know what's going on around here, Mr. Chairman. It's the people who don't. And I think I look upon this as the last and only vehicle left for the will of the majority of Congress to be heard in Congress. Reference has been made to a, I understand they circulated a, a, an editorial around here from the Tulsa World, my hometown newspaper. And I would only suggest that if you want to start circulating editorials, there are over a hundred that we have, editorials all around the country. And of all the editorials and all the newspapers around the country, there are only two that oppose it. That's the Boston Globe and the Tulsa World, both of them very liberal newspapers. And all the rest are very much for it. Just this morning, I think the last sentence in this morning's Washington Post, hardly a Republican newspaper, is probably the best one. It says, but in a democracy where elected officials have an obligation to be candid and accountable, there is no reasonable argument against Inhofe's change. And I think that pretty much says it all. Let me say one last thing about liberal versus conservative. I've, it's true, uh, uh, Mr. Solomon, I did uh, 69 talk shows over a four-week period, and that wasn't a very enjoyable. They call that a recess, I guess, but it wasn't much of a recess. One of those was in the state of Massachusetts, and a guy called in. And he said, Inhofe, I don't agree with you. I'm a liberal Democrat, but I, and I'm a party leader. In fact, I'm an elected official in the Democrat Party in, in Massachusetts. He said, I don't agree with you on limited terms. I don't agree with you on a budget balancing amendment. I don't agree with you on a lot of your conservative philosophy. But I do agree that all of these issues, whether I agree with them or not, should be openly debated and ultimately a a recorded vote. And Mr. Chairman, that's all I want. I'm not trying to impart my conservative philosophy on others. I'm just saying that we want openness in government, and I am very confident that we're going to get it. Thank you, sir. Let me ask you a couple of specific yeah. questions, if I may, having to do with your resolution. Your, it does not specify how, when, or where the clerk should, t should make public the names of signers of discharge petitions. Was it your intention that the names of signers would be published in the congressional record on the day that they were signed? Uh, would you be amenable to making the, the language uh, of your resolution more specific in that regard? Well, what, what I, left your it, I left it nonspecific because I felt if I made it specific, then there would be criticism as to how we were going to do it. I think public record is a good way of putting it, Mr. Chairman. And it, to me, it would make, make it a lot easier for the people at the desk, all they'd have to have is just something that's posted out there. People go up and sign it, and then anyone who wants to walk by and see it uh, would have access to it. 
A second question. The other, uh, there are some other pending discharge petitions. Yes, sir. Obviously down at the desk, which were signed by members with the under understanding that their names would not be disclosed. If we adopt your proposal, do you think it should apply to the pending petitions, or do you think I would should, have no objection to having again? it not apply to those? Uh, uh, that wouldn't bother me at all. I would suggest, however, that it would just delay those particular things for another legislative session because procedurally it'd be difficult for them to. Um, uh, to get that number and have it up there before uh, adjournment. Since I didn't know that question would be asked, I will go ahead and answer it without consulting with the two uh, authors of those discharge petitions and uh, say that uh, uh, maybe it'd be better not to change the rules in the middle of the game. Thank you. Um, Mr. Solomon. I, I was looking at Mr. Solomon when I said that because he's the author of one of them that's up there. We just called on Mr. Solomon. Yes, sorry. Right. Let me uh, let me first of all uh, relay a little story to you, uh, which is similar to yours when you first came here. Uh, uh, you said you have a next door neighbor who is quite liberal. You're quite conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I happen to be in that top five percent in uh, fiscal conservatives as well, and my next door neighbor is Bernie Sanders <laughs> from Vermont. <laughs> so we have we have a similar situation. Uh, secondly. Uh, Jim, let me just really praise you for what you what you have done, and to go beyond that, and just to tell you that uh, first of all, you have done nothing wrong. There has been criticism uh, from some parts that uh, you were wrong in releasing the names. Let me just tell you right here and now that there is no language in the rules of this house that prohibits public disclosure, nor in the original legislative history uh, when it was adopted. The secrecy standard was developed later by statements of speakers from the chair uh, and thus became precedent, which doesn't mean a doggone thing, because we are a democracy here in this body. We operate by majority will, and speakers cannot set rules. Uh, speakers can try to, uh, but the House has the right to override the ruling of any speaker and challenge the ruling of the chair and then the majority rules. You know, you can go all the way back to 1932, and we've researched this, and there's some people out here in the audience that have done it too, but uh, back in 1932 was the first time that any speaker ever made reference to any kind of secrecy at all with regard to discharge petitions. And on that date, Speaker uh, Jim, John Nance Garner announced that such petitions would, were to be filed with the clerk and that signatures cannot be made public until uh, a required number of members have signed it into the petition. He did not refer to any specific authority or express any specific rationale for this secrecy uh, in, in the injunction. You know why? Because he didn't have it. He couldn't. Uh, there is no authority, period. Uh, as far as enforcement, you know, because of whatever this precedent is, it's never been enforced. And as a matter of fact, the Democratic Study Group back in 1960, uh, when they wanted to uh, uh, get signatures on the Civil Rights Act, uh, they went to the New York Times. Not a word was raised anywhere about it. And there never has any, except for some people uh, whose noses get out of joint. Okay, so let me assure you, my friend, you did nothing wrong, and I am so proud of you. Keep it up. We're going to win this one. Uh, there was also uh, some uh, statements made that uh, we shouldn't be dealing with this here now because the joint committee, the uh, Hamilton, Boren, Dreyer, uh, Domenici, Solomon uh, joint task force is going to deal with this. <laughs> we ain't going to deal with it. It's not even on the agenda. They won't put it on the agenda. So it's not out there to be dealt with, with this big reform package that we're not going to have come October, I'm predicting. So uh, this is the time, Mr. Chairman, and my good friend Joe Mookley, for us to really deal with this and, uh, and That's get what we're doing. I would say to my friend, you're playing a lot of dead horses. It's been decided that this thing is going to be open and the signatures will be available. And uh, nobody's accusing Mr. Inhofe of anything at all. We're delighted to have him here to oh, hear. We're just clearing the record. Well, that's because, fine. Uh, you haven't, and my good friend Joe Mokley haven't, but others have, have been highly critical. Well, keep going. So, uh, you got to, all the time uh, you want. We want to do it, right? <laughs> but keep it short. I intend to take whatever time I need. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, Mr. Inhofe, we're, we're told that public disclosures will benefit uh, the special interest the most. 
can you tell us which special interests have been urging you to press for this disclosure rule? Let me, well, uh, who are these special well, interests? Well, one of the, the, let me point out the major weakness in that argument. If, if you were to poll the special interests or the lobbyists, you'd find that most of them would be opposed to this reform, and I'll tell you why. They'd much rather have a system where the committee chairman controls everything, the total agenda, then they only have to work on one guy. This is going to make them work on everybody because all of a sudden members of Congress are going to start getting involved in the process that the system we have today, we have a handful of leaderships. The leaders make a determination as to what our agenda is going to be considered. So wouldn't, if you were a lobbyist, wouldn't you rather work with just one chairman that controls 20 people than have to go out to all 20? Secondly, what's the one thing that, what is the one bill that, that lobbyists would not want to pa be passed most? Limited terms. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen with this, but certainly it'll, it'll probably bring it out for a debate and there will probably have to be a vote at some point. If there's anything a lobbyist doesn't want, it's limited terms because once he learns how the behavior and the voting behavior of a member of Congress, he doesn't want to have to go back and relearn somebody else every year. So uh, it just the opposite is true. There's, it's, uh, it's just not even realistic to use that as an argument. Well, no, but, and, and let me answer your other question. You mentioned this committee on reorganization and what's the proper name of it? A committee on uh, restructuring? Joint committee for the Solomon Commission. The Solomon Committee, all right. Uh, there are four <laughs> there are four co-chairmen of that committee and three of those four are strongly supporting my reform. In fact, the, the, the idea of their support of it is we're not going to be able to get all these things through unless we break that veil of secrecy down so we can have things open. I'm talking about David Boren, United States Senator from Oklahoma, is one of the strongest supporters of my system. I wrote up here with him yesterday. I, let me just go ahead and read a statement that he that, uh, have here. A lot of people don't know this. David Bourne and I were both elected in 1966 to the state legislature. He, and then he was in the House and I was in the Senate. He was a Democrat and I was a Republican and we did all the reforms. We introduced the reforms. He said, 25 years ago, Jim Inhofe and I teamed up on a bipartisan effort to reform Oklahoma State Legislature and we still agree about the need to make government more open and accountable. All of us do a better job when we know that we will be held accountable for our actions. I believe that Inhofe's proposal is consistent with the challenge given to the Special Joint Committee on Congressional reform to improve Congress, and I support Jim Inhofe. I mean, you know, this argument that we keep hearing, Mr. Chairman, that we want to hold off to after they do their thing, uh, they're not going to address this. This only has to do with the House, and they're supporting it anyway. Nobody here is suggesting except our friend Mr. Solomon. I'm sorry? Nobody no, here is no, suggesting it's been, that no, we I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I have to correct you. This has been suggested over and over again in the paper that, uh, that we be delayed. In fact, Mr. Uh, Moakley has made that statement. Well, I might just say to the gentleman, it's too bad that uh, Senator Bourne is not going to have a vote on this issue. But, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> this is a House rule. So, uh, he, he, he knows that. Uh, if he, he were that. a member of the House, he'd be supporting us. Uh, but he can right. still support openness. Right. In, exactly. Yes. Well, yeah. let me just say that uh, from a personal point of view, uh, uh, I really do hope term limitation is the first bill that comes out of this uh, discharge petition because that's really what the American people want, and that's really how we're going to reform this House is with term limitations. But uh, let me just ask you one last question because we really need to get to the other witnesses as well. Uh, isn't this the, the fact that we are here today at this hearing, isn't this a fact that the discharge petition works and the committee system does hold up because all this did was prod the House of Representatives to move uh, and our good chairman here, uh, Tony Bielenson, to hold the hearing? Uh, I don't know what the motivation was for the hearing. I would only say that the hearing wasn't, uh, I don't believe they decided to have the hearing until the, it was during the recess sometime. And we went into the recess at one point with 217 signatures, then six came in and took their names off. So I think it was pretty, uh, it was imminent that it was coming up and I uh, would only speculate that that's the reason that they had hearings on it. Well, again, I thank the gentleman for his leadership in this effort, and uh, when you're done, uh, you're welcome to come up and uh, join the dais and uh, thank you, sir. continue with the hearing. Thank thank you. I, I do want to say, if I may, if I may, Jim, you correct me if I'm incorrect. It's my understanding that we were not asked 
beforehand to have a hearing on your resolution. I mean, it's not as if uh, the Rules Committee refused to, to discuss this matter to have a, have a hearing on this uh, matter. Mr. Chairman, I'd have to respond that uh, when you, when a bill is introduced and the Speaker puts it in a committee, in this case last March in the Rules Committee, uh, it's pretty evident that the author of the bill would not have brought the bill up if he didn't want it to well, be that, heard. That, if I may, let's, let's be frank with, with one another. There are thousands of bills introduced each year into this House. Mm -hmm. This committee has had several hundred referred to it. We don't automatically hear all of them. Uh, I believe it is correct, and you may correct me if I am not correct, that we did not have a request from the author to have a hearing on this bill. I'm not arguing anything else. I'm simply suggesting that uh, I don't believe that I do not believe this committee was derelict and not hearing this no. bill was not requested by the author. And I, it did I not a, have that many co-sponsors. I, I have a great deal of respect for you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have to say that the committee has been known to all of us as being a graveyard when you're uh, when it goes in the committee. It's not going to come out, and um, I assume that was the case. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Not, I'd have to, what, what bills did this committee ever kill? What, bill, what bills were ever held up on this committee, Mr. Inhofe? Well, I'd have to defer to somebody on the committee that is more the, familiar well, with the was agenda. Was there any, on bill, the so. any bill that ever was reported from a committee up here for action that was never reported out in the last two or three years? Oh, if there have been, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you would yield, if there have been two or three hundred bills re referred to this committee, uh, this subcommittee, uh, this is the first meeting we've held in nine months that the committee has been in uh, uh, in, uh, in operation for this this uh, 103rd Congress. So uh, uh, none of the bills have been reported from this committee. So there's been no bills that have ever been reported to us from working, from authorizing committees that haven't been reported out uh, in reasonable times since I've been ch uh, chairman. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you're talking about uh, other committees reporting bills to this right. committee. This is not the case. Uh, this is a direct referral from the, to, the uh, to this. To to the 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 Let me say two things again. Mm -hmm. One is, the fact of the matter is the author did not request a hearing on the bill of this committee. Two, my friend from New York knows that this chairman, at least of this subcommittee, <clears throat> has always, so far as I'm aware, held hearings on any subject matter that, that our Republican friends on the subcommittee wanted us to hold hearings on. We were not requested to have one on this. I'm not arguing anything else, Jim. Okay. I'm just saying that, you know, that nobody asked us to hold a hearing on this bill. And uh, uh, would, would my good friend yield? Of course. Because I have the greatest respect for you, and uh, and and uh, a lot of what you say is true. But but uh, which you, part you're, wasn't? You're, you're stretching a little bit. I have a bill before this uh, subcommittee on uh, on uh, drug testing, right. which uh, uh, we have, and you have promised me a hearing on it, but you've never. Well, I don't. Re I don't re re Jerry, I don't recall that. But you can have the hearing in the next couple of weeks. Good. I mean, seriously, I don't. I don't recall you having asked me for a hearing. Well, I take your. Bill. I take it your word. And Absolutely. Uh, afterwards, I look forward to having that hearing. On that bill. It's you got important. it. Thanks. Why do you have a drug bill in this committee? I don't understand that. But anyway. Test the legislature. Okay. Absolutely. You got your hearing. And Mr. Inhofe would have had his. Any further questions of the gentleman from Oklahoma? Mr. Moakley. Excuse me. Uh, I'll come back to it. Mr. Inhofe, uh, you, you, you're talking that Senator Boren is in, in favor of this discharge petition, so he's in favor of an open, open uh, legislative process. Yes, sir. Uh, have you have you looked at the Senate one man hold uh, bill they have over there? Where one senator uh, anonymously can uh, put a hold on any bill over there, and nobody even knows who it is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me refer you. You may have missed in the, this morning's. Um New York Times, Cliff Cross wrote an article, and, he, and it's about David Bourne supporting this in case there's some doubt as to whether or not he no, does. No, I'm, I'm not The answer to your question is no. I'm a member of the House of Representatives. I don't spend time. I, I figure they may have their problems over there, but, but I'm dealing with the problems in the House. Yeah, but since Senator Bourne, you know, talked about uh, your re uh, resolution, have you ever, has he ever mentioned the, the Senate uh, one hold, one no, man he hold is, bill? He has not mentioned that to no. me. Are you aware of it? I'm not aware of it. Okay. Uh, do I gather then the intent, the sole intent of your special uh, discharge petition is to, for openness in government? Yes, I, I think the openness in government and also for the will of the majority to be, uh, have a vehicle to work and, and it does not under the present situation. And when I say the will of the majority, that's the will of the majority elected to the House of Representatives and those who elect them. Those who elect the, the, the members? Mm -hmm. Well, we are a representative of government, so we have to represent those people who elect us. I'm trying to make it that way, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I think we all try to make it that way. 
Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, if I might uh, uh, use a few examples. They generally use the examples that we've talked about already here in, uh, of, of things where the people, 90% of the people at home want, and yet we never do bring up. But aside from the obvious ones, the limitation of terms, the budget balancing amendment, lie down and veto, look at things like true, uh, true tort liability reform. Look at things like real, true uh, campaign finance reform. Anything that goes into a committee to be discussed, to be debated, and to be ultimately voted on has to pass the judgment of a handful of people who are the leaders in Congress. And I think that system is not representative. So you think that every bill should be heard by committee, then? No, absolutely not. I think every bill that a committee chairman should have to have the responsibility and a motivation to give consideration to each bill instead of just uh, not, not hearing them at all. all right. do, do you think that... Uh, or say we, uh, you know, the 218 people have spoken for for open government. Do you think that uh, that the bill should be discharged immediately to the fall after the uh, 218 names have been uh, gotten? I don't really care when it's discharged to the floor, just as long as it doesn't string over until adjournment when everything dies that's in that drawer. Uh, what I object to is some things that I've heard about parliamentary procedures and changes in our rules around here that have been discussed either openly or not openly, I'm not sure, that would make it more difficult to get Discharge petitions, for example, I heard, and I think it was attributed to you, that one of the alternatives might be to change it from a simple majority to two-thirds. You know, to get 290 signatures on motherhood would be a virtually well, impossible. That, no, that uh, was a, then, then the other let me, thing... Let me explain that. That was a conversation uh, that they said, well, what are some of the alternatives? I didn't say that that was going to happen. I'm just saying, you know... Well, said, I, I got that from Congressional Quarterly, so maybe they're wrong. No, then no. The other, I, the, probably the Congressional Quarterly spoke to me, but I didn't say I was going to do that. I said... That the, or the other thing that Congressional Quarterly suggested was that uh, there's some discussion around here that instead, after getting 218 signatures, instead of having it, the committee of jurisdiction, a discharge from that jurisdiction, having it come to the floor, that it would merely force that committee to act on it. Now, I would violently oppose that because that is completely uh, circumventing the, 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 the system. Otherwise, there'd be no way of getting a thing out. And it'd be total, absolute total control by committee chairman. And if that comes up, that's going to require, by the way, it's my understanding of the rules, that if that is an attempt to this committee, or anyone on the floor to do this, that that will require a public vote, a recorded vote, and I don't think it's going to pass. In other words, you can't say that, all right, you've reformed the discharge petition system, so we're going to do it do away with discharge petitions, and that's what I hear coming out of here. Mr. So what, Chairman, would you just yield for a moment? I understand the RTC bill is coming on the floor, and we have to uh, uh, carry the rule downstairs, so if you'll excuse me, we'll be returned as soon as we can. All right. Uh, you didn't hear out of this committee uh, that uh, what you just uh, spoke about? No, I heard that from the Congressional Quarterly, and, and uh, that was attributed to this committee. Not to me. To you, yes, sir. Well, uh, again, I think that, uh, that somebody's taking some liberties. Uh, are you willing to uh, then do away with the committee uh, system altogether? Then, absolutely but, not. Well, if if this discharge petition uh, is successful. It doesn't give the committee then the right to to sit on the uh, bill and have a hearing? Is that what you're saying? Let me go ahead and give the documentation on this first thing. This is a, a, uh, a, a quote attributed to you by the Congressional Quarterly. And it says on point number three, giving a committee facing discharge 30 days to report out a bill in question with any amendments it desires. Oh, saying yeah. that that is going to come from the committee as opposed to being discharged to the floor where it can be heard. Now, what was your other question? No, that's no. I, I did say that I think that if a discharge petition uh, is is eminent, that there should be a time allowed for the committee, a set time that, that doesn't put over to the next session, but maybe the 30 days or 30 working days or whatever to uh, to have a hearing on the bill. 
But the chairman will yield. Let me let me tell you, Jim. An awful lot of well, an awful lot of people, including a lot of members from your own party, have suggested that, that would be a sensible way of dealing with this. And if the bill, in fact, is successfully discharged, it should perhaps go back to the to the uh, committee of jurisdiction, which would be limited. Would have to report the bill, you know, within a certain set period of time. You could have you could have under the rules or under the uh, proposal a requirement, for example, that the bill as originally introduced also has to be one of the alternatives available on the floor. But I know an awful that, lot of members who. Mr. Landed. Chairman, that isn't the issue what is here. The issue? the issue here is instead of being discharged so it goes to the floor, yes. that it would merely provide that the committee must act on right. that bill. Right. And within a set, certain set period, that bill would come back through the Rules Committee well, to the floor. the product of the committee would, yes, yes. not necessarily yes. the bill. So you, would be forcing would act, so you would be forcing action by the committee on the subject matter that, uh, that you're interested in. That doesn't yes. please you. No, the the point number three that was articulated that was attributed to members of this committee was that instead of saying that a bill would have to be discharged into the body of the whole so right. that uh, there could be a recorded vote, that it would instead be st remain in the committee and the committee would be forced to act on it. That right. committee could act on it in such a way to kill it. And no, it's no, dead that, and no, going. No, no, no. Well, that, that was the that's understanding. The, well, that, that's uh, not my understanding. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy to hear yeah. that's not the no, no. not going to happen. There'd be no way of, of, of allowing that. It seems to me. But it well, does. It would if the rules provided for it. Yes, and of I'm, course. But I mean, I, I don't. I don't think anybody's thinking good. out loud I'm, or quietly. I, that makes me very happy. That. But there are good arguments to be made, are there not, that we not automatically discharge onto the floor without possibility of amendment or without possibility of review by the committees of jurisdiction? Uh, the original bill is introduced. It may have been a very poorly devised bill. It, the author and a lot of other people who signed the discharge petition would very much perhaps want a, a committee of jurisdiction, original jurisdiction, to have 30-day period or so in which to Absolutely. comment on it, to hold public hearings, which never otherwise would have been held. You have Mr. no objection yeah, to that. I have no objection to okay. that, Mr. Chairman. That's going to happen anyway because this whole process, as I mentioned in my opening statement, would take a good 60 days, and there's plenty of time for the committee to do all the work it needs to do. Okay, anyway, sorry to interrupt. There's no, no. There's no problem. I have no problem with that. In fact, if well, anything, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe this strengthens the committee system. That's what I was referring to. Once it's discharged, you can't kind of just take it to the floor and go with that. I think that the committee then must act on it within a certain yes, number of days and, and what is to the it? floor. Yes, Mr. Chairman, what is accomplished by that is that it that is not accomplished in the absence of that is that there will have to be a recorded vote at some point. It can't be killed without a recorded vote. And that's all I want. But we've got oh, to maintain got no a problem with that. We've got to maintain a deliberative process, and we've got to maintain a process whereby the public and interested people can come and testify. And you don't have that if a bill is discharged directly to the floor. It's not discharged directly to the floor because, it, uh, first of all, there's 30 days. Secondly, there's a period of time of two months prior to that. So you have a good three months. In prior to what? To prior to the 218 signature being acquired? That's correct. That what? That what would happen? Well, the, it's already in the committee. The yeah. committee can uh, call up a hearing any time during that 45 to 60 day period that it takes to get 218 signatures. There's a lot of time to do that. So the committee has all the time in the world to take yeah, care of Yeah, but there will be a lot of bills down there, you know, with discharge petitions, and the committee chairman or committee isn't going to know Mr. which chairman, one. Mr. Chairman, let me ask you a question. Have you of ever course. tried to get a discharge petition no. signed? No, I haven't. No, I have on several occasions, and this is the first time we've been successful. It's long, arduous, tedious process of getting one signed. You have to explain an issue to each person. Now, to get co-authors is nothing. You can get co-sponsors on bills in, in a third the time. This is a long process. It leaves it in the committee for a long time for them to do their work on the bill. Now, this all it does, it does have the effect the of encouraging the chairman to bring it up. Okay. All right. Well, I, I, I don't want to take any more time and argue at this point. Back to Mr. No. Oakley. For one of the alternatives that was mentioned was that once the discharge petition receives those names, then the committee of jurisdiction would be mandated to work to work on that bill within so many days and report it back to the floor. Now, do have any opposition to that? And report it back to the floor? Yeah. In other words, the bill will be reported back to the floor? Absolutely. That's a system that we're looking at right now. That's what. Uh, that's one of the. All, we we don't know what's going to come out of the hearing, but that was the, the statement that I gave to the congressional. Well, it, yes. My understanding of the statement that you gave to the congressional quarterly, as it was presented to me and the gentlemen's in this room now, if the rules would provide for him to explain that, is that instead of having it discharged to the floor, that it would merely force action by the committee, but not necessarily to report it out to the floor. 
Well, and, maybe I said forced action for the yeah. committee, but I, I meant that it would be reported yeah. because it was discharged. And, and Mr. Chairman, let me just add that uh, we have a tendency here in Congress to overcomplicate things. I'm talking about making signatures on a discharge petition a matter of public record. And that, to me, takes care of all these other problems. You still have time to work on the bill. There's still ample time to, for the committee to do its work. And to well, that was my initial day. question, is that uh, opening up the, the, the names, uh, the number one priority of your uh, legislation? That's right. Openness and accountability. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Tony Hall from Ohio. Well, excuse me before you start. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, Ms. Slaughter. The Budget Committee now is hearing on a big session. You're right. You want your questions first? I'd, I'd like to go there. Is it okay? Is it okay, Mr. Hall? People here, I'd like to hear. May I do go that? Ahead. Just, no, I don't want to ask questions first. I just like to be excused okay. to go to budget. You are excused. Okay. It's good to have you here. It'll be good to get you back later. Thank you. <laughs> and being a member of the budget committee myself, please give my apologies to the chairman, <laughs> Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jim, good to see you. There's been a lot of editorials written about this, and and uh, there's there's a couple good thoughts in here uh, from Matt Pincus that I'd like to read from and, and get your uh, get your feeling about them. He says midway in his article uh, in Roll Call that the modest secrecy of the current discharge procedure provides its most important safeguard and one that is in short supply in Congress. It's time to think. He says discharge should be difficult and anything that would make it easier or more routine should be regarded with suspicion and alarm. Discharge should not be a process that allows stupidity to be rushed to a vote. Um, how do you how do you comment on that? What do you think about that? I assume uh, that he is saying that keeping it in secrecy uh, <coughs> offers that time to think. And, yeah. Uh, I would disagree with that. I, uh, I think there's plenty of time to think. I, I've seen these things uh, sit there in that drawer for month after month after month until adjournment day comes and then everything in there is dead by the rules. And so we have, it seems like we've had years to think and maybe we need to think and act a little bit more. Well, it seems to be a big problem around here though that we are pushed with with the thousands of bills and amendments that are introduced, you know, every every year into this Congress, and oftentimes we have to react very quickly to them without not having a chance to sit back, think about them, have oversight on them, and I think that's what this author is suggesting that um, this does give us a, a chance to think, and that's one side of the argument. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, Mr. Hall, that. If you take some of the issues that have traditionally been introduced each year and are, are uh, deep sixed in there and never do come up for a hearing because of the very difficult time that it is to, to get 218 signatures, the thing that makes that difficult, of course, is the fact that that is held in secrecy. And that is what does allow for hypocrisy to take place in this country. And this is what I'm trying to get to. I, I don't think it's going to uh, give us any more or less time to think. I think that your resolution is legitimate, and I, I think it should be examined. Um, I think that's what you're getting here. I mean, you've achieved a lot by having an open hearing. Probably something will come out of it. I find it extraordinary, though, that, um, and I guess it goes on, maybe you have more experience of this than I do. I, have, I, I find it extraordinary that people will say to their constituents one thing, hmm. and they'll lie, and they, in fact, will or not sign a petition and won't have the oh. guts to admit it. I know that it goes on with some of the members, but with a substantial number of members, I find that hard to believe. And Mr. Hall, uh, you of all people in Congress I would find that difficult to believe because I can't think of anyone I think more of than you. You and I are very close. Uh, you are incapable of lying to your people. So it's difficult, I guess, to understand this, but let's look what happened in 1988 when we had a budget balancing amendment to the Constitution and it had 246 co-authors on it. The most names we can get on a discharge petition were 140. Now what does that tell you? It tells you that 106 members of Congress really are lying to the people back home. They're saying, look, I'm a co-sponsor. That wasn't you, and you wouldn't do that, and you, you wouldn't, wouldn't consider that. But 
The 106 of them did. Well, I appreciate your comments. I, I do find it extraordinary that many, many people would do that. I think for that reason alone, this, this should be such an extraordinary process because it does get around the, the parliamentary rules, the rules of the Congress, that if it's going to be extraordinary, you ought to have guts enough to stand up and say, here I am, publish exactly. your name. So at least uh, as far as the openness is concerned, you've achieved a lot by getting a hearing. And uh, it's a legitimate hearing, what you're, what you're asking. And uh, something, I, I something share good something, might come out of this. I could share something with you, Mr. Hall, that uh, addresses this. I, I remember when uh, Ron Mazzola was uh, going up to sign the discharge petition, and uh, he was being discouraged from doing that. He said, well, stop. Let me, let me just think this through. If anybody asks me if I've signed a discharge petition, and I signed it, I'll say yes. If I haven't signed it, I'll say no. So isn't this system that's in place now only protecting those who are lying? I don't need further questions. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, uh, I would like to start off by congratulating you for having this hearing because I think the fact that we are having this hearing shows that the committee system does indeed work. And I think uh, both uh, you and Mr. Inhofe, uh, by the uh, positions of responsibility and political courage and wisdom that you have, are proving that point today. So uh, I congratulate both of you uh, and your subcommittee for carrying on. I think what we're about here is clarifying this secrecy provision which came in by tradition rather than by law and what is causing the problem uh, as we go about this and I think it's a legitimate bit of reform and reform is actually what the American people have asked for and I think that Mr. Inhofe was right to take the initiative. What is causing the problem is what are the consequences of this clarification? What does this mean? And the consequences are is it a threat to the committee system? Seems to me that we have had a very solitary effect already today in the committee system. Uh, we've heard not only is this going to uh, have some type of uh, activity taken on it which is uh, over and needed in the minds of at least a majority of the members of this House, of the 103rd Congress. But not only that, uh, we've had the commitment from you to discuss another piece of legislation that uh, Mr. Solomon feels very strongly about. He would have had it had he asked me earlier. Uh, either way, uh, we, have, uh, we have moved forward today, and I think that is very good. And I congratulate uh, Chairman Moakley as well uh, for coming back in the room, for uh, participating in this and, uh, and uh, agreeing that the committee system uh, needs to focus on this. I think that's exactly appropriate. Uh, I happen to come from the Sunshine State, and it is ludicrous for me to listen to arguments that lobbyists somehow or other are going to benefit from government in the sunshine. Let me tell you how hard we had to fight to get government in the sunshine in Florida. Some wonderful colleagues in your party, who I admire very much, uh, Senator Graham, Governor Childs, uh, were instrumental in bringing those changes to Florida. Florida is better governed as a result and has, I think, much better governance, much better accountability by government in the sunshine. Uh, so to say that somehow the lobbyists are going to prosper and blossom uh, if we change this um, is uh, to me somewhat contrary to the evidence in my own state. I think that um, the other benefit to this is that it will provide a beneficial stimulus and the right type of incentives for the committee process to work in a more responsive way of a representative democracy rather than to the, uh, to the whims of the entrenched leadership, whichever party it happens to be. Uh, and I do not make that as a partisan comment. I make it as a uh, making sure that the, uh, the nexus between leadership and followership is working well to uh, increase increase the flow of ideas, the flow of legislation, good and uh, bad ideas that will, bad presumably will be flushed out, good will presumably blossom, uh, and that is part of our process. One of the things that troubles me the most uh, as a member of this institution is not the fact that 80% uh, or 70% or whatever it is disapprove of the way Congress does its business. That's a big number and it means we should be doing some reform and I know we're addressing it and this is part of that. The one that bothers me the most is that 86% of Americans say they don't trust Congress. That is a serious statistic. If you don't trust the people you elect to do your business for you, you got a problem. 
And that's a bad statistic. Now, one of the concerns that Mr. Enhoff has uh, suggested in testimony so far, and I've certainly heard it, uh, is that somehow or other the Rules Committee, of which I'm also a member, we all sit here, we're going to somehow or other change the goalposts to what Mr. Enhoff has already accomplished with the majority of the members of Congress. We're going to change 218 to 265. We're going to change the time limits. We're going to change the number of co-sponsors. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Uh, I hope we aren't going to do that, because I don't think that is going to enhance uh, Congress's trust with the people of this nation. To suggest, perhaps, uh, as some have, that uh, we are going to have plebiscite form of government, that is uh, translated uh, in the Joe Sixpack language, town hall government in our country, uh, is not to me as frightening a consequence as it is to others, apparently. Uh, we actually do use town hall form of government in some uh, communities still, and it works very well. But I agree it would be very difficult to operate this institution that way. But to suggest that the people who are elected to be representatives in this House do not have the courage to do the right thing is, to me, uh, again, a bizarre statement. And it's for this reason. Certainly, there was a great outcry at the Budget Deficit Reduction Act, a great outcry from America. And there's no question that out outcry said, don't pass that resolution. And yet, that resolution passed by a majority of Congress. So that shows that the plebiscite feeling, no matter how intense it is, doesn't necessarily direct. Now, I'm not going to distinguish political courage from political wisdom, because I did not happen to agree with that. But the fact of the matter is, this institution went and did its own thing in that. And they were not stampeded, uh, even though in some ways uh, I wish they had listened more closely, the majority had, to what the American people were saying on that. So I feel that we have proof uh, in a number of ways that this institution can do the nation's business in a responsible way, and that bringing this little bit of sunshine in is very definitely going to enhance the committee system and build trust with the American people. Now, I don't know how you can do better than that with one little simple piece of legislation. Now, Mr. Inhofe, I want to know, have I mischaracterized anything that you are trying to accomplish or anything that you feel uh, is motivating behind what you're doing so far? No, you haven't mischaracterized it. You've made it a little more complicated. But uh, it's uh, nonetheless, that's it. It's just, just to accountability and openness is now something that people are demanding. They didn't used to, and, and I think the technological changes in the communications, that people are much more aware of what's going on here. These talk shows, they talk about us up here. They didn't used to do that. And, uh, and I think that if there's one reform that could, would satisfy people more than any other reform, it's this, just to end the secrecy. I don't in mean to complicate this, but understand the Rules Committee is going to have to deal with the consequences of this, and we are going to deliberate that. And that is our job and our responsibility. And Chairman Moakley is correct, I think, to direct us to that task. Yes. And I think you would agree with that. I would agree with that. Uh, I think that the simplicity of what you're trying to do uh, is uh, marvelous, very understandable, and very meritorious. But the consequences, I think, we do have to go through one by one. That's what we do. I see only benefit. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Hall, who I also have the very highest regard for, uh, has talked about uh, he doesn't acquaint uh, in any way with the dissembling that does go on. And I believe that. Uh, I, I'm sure Mr. Hall does not. He is a tremendously honorable human being. But not everybody measures up to those same standards. And there is dissembling. There's no question about it. And I think this will have a very beneficial effect on that. And the other thing is that it's a little ludicrous for me to listen to here, uh, and this is inside, inside the committee type response. But we talk about deliberative democracy here, and I'm suddenly <coughs> hearing wonderful <coughs> statements about deliberative democracy and time to think. And I think, my lord, how many times have we made those statements uh, when we're trying to overcome the closed rule system and the restrictive rule system about deliberative democracy and letting the, the will of the majority work its way? And I am delighted that people have been listening to those arguments and are persuaded a little bit by them. And I thank you for giving us that opportunity to make them again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Inhofe, very much, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, we thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me make one last comment, and that is that... Uh, I haven't really excuse enjoyed... Me, excuse me, we seem to have uh, somebody talking to us over some... over C-SPAN, I suppose. It's probably the public responding. Thank you, sir.
Well, I only want to comment that uh, this has been a long, a lengthy process to, to do this. It's not something I enjoyed. I would have enjoyed a four-week vacation much more without talking on 69 <laughs> talk shows. But I, I do have very strong feelings, and I don't want anyone on this committee to think that I am not totally sincere uh, in, in believing this. I went through the same thing in the state of Oklahoma some 25 years ago. David Bourne and I worked on the same types of reforms there. We were successful, and I think the time has come. The time is right for this reform. And thank you very much for the giving You're me this welcome. opportunity. You've been a legislator for 20-some 20, 20 years, huh? Um, we have two more distinguished colleagues who are with us today, and if I may, let me call you both up together. You don't have to talk at the same time. Uh, but first we have uh, Representative Jim Oberstar, who's serving his 10th term as a very if I may say so, outstanding representative from the 8th District of Minnesota, and also our newest colleague, uh, Representative Peter Barka uh, from Wisconsin. So why don't you two chaps come up, and Jim, when you're ready, why don't you speak first, sir? this uh, issue uh, of some great significance to the Congress as an institution, to the uh, entire country in the way we manage the legislative process. I think the, and I, uh, you have my statement and, and uh, I won't uh, that, that objection, the entire statement will be included in the record and you're willing some of the you're highlights of it. free to read or speak as you will. But I see this uh, proposal as an assault on the standing committee system and a serious threat to the independence of the House and to the integrity of the members of the House. The committee system is intended to be a filter, not a sluice gate. And the discharge petition would simply Every time a bill gets the 218, makes the committee system a sluice gate. The bills just flow right through, no deliberative process, no thought about them, just go directly to the floor. Uh, sort of a direct democracy of the House of Representatives uh, in, in a way that uh, <coughs> the founding fathers never intended. Uh, I made it a uh, practice of mine that not to sign a discharge petition, not even for a bill that I've sponsored or co-sponsored. And I don't think that there is any internal contradiction, nor is there a question of, of credibility or honesty. I don't think a person who sponsors a bill but refuses to sign a discharge petition is lying, as was suggested earlier. Because I think you can, you can support a principle or a concept, but also support a deliberative process and respect the views of other people who may want to change that view that you have through the hearings, the markup and subcommittee, and the markup and full committee, and then the amendment process on the House floor. <clears throat> I think this is a proposed fix for a virtually non-existent problem. There may be three or four or five issues on which uh, certain members feel very strongly, <clears throat> want to see the bill come to the floor, uh, make an issue that it's being uh, held up in one or another committee, uh, and uh, want to press, uh, uh, press the discharge petition route. But I think this committee system works exceedingly well in the House. Oftentimes, there are members who sponsor bills or introduce bills, never expecting them to be heard, in some cases not even wanting them to be heard, but giving an opportunity for that viewpoint or that uh, thought, or that concept to be expressed and, and embodied in a bill. <clears throat> this committee process was intended to filter those ideas through the broad spectrum of views in this body, the House of Representatives. Now, should, should my name be listed as a non-sponsor of the thousands of bills in which I am not a sponsor? 
Should my name be listed as a non-sponsor of a discharge petition because I choose not to, to, uh, to do that? That's a matter of privacy, my viewpoint. I, I have no problem of, of uh, saying so uh, publicly. No, I will not sign a discharge petition. I don't think the process is right. Uh, but by the same token, I don't want any special interest group in America that has a, an iron in the fire to put my name on a mailing list, send it all over America, have me uh, uh, flooded with, uh, with letters from people of whom I don't represent directly uh, on a purely procedural matter. I think this, this concept uh, will lead to a stampede mentality of every uh, group that has some special cause of its own getting somebody to introduce the bill and immediately then to file a discharge petition and then day after day the drumbeat of those who haven't signed on the discharge petition the focus is going to be on have you signed your name on the discharge petition on rather than on is that is the substance of the legislation right valid useful, important, should it go through the committee process? Every bill introduced will be suspect because it doesn't, either doesn't have a discharge petition or the petition is out there and not enough people have, have uh, signed it. And when you look at the record, the relative small number of measures on which discharge petitions have been filed uh, and, and uh, then their subsequent action on the House floor uh, it does not argue persuasively that there is a problem here from uh, 30, 1931, seven measures on which uh, there were discharge petitions that received eight, 218 signatures were brought up by other procedures. Six of them became law. I don't think you can argue that, that but for the discharge petition, those bills would not have come to the floor. Maybe in some case that prodded action. But if so, then it prodded action in a, in, a, in a committee deliberative process. But releasing names indiscriminately uh, and, and sort of focusing on and ginning up uh, these, these uh, mail-in campaigns, uh, I, don't, I don't think is a, a, is a constructive contribution to the work of the House. I think the, uh, the immediate beneficiary of this uh, resolution will be the discharge petition. There'll be a flood of them. There will be discharge petitions. Who could resist? Uh, <clears throat> except a few of us who say, no, I simply won't do it. Uh, there'll be all sorts of, of things. Then the litmus test will be uh, not whether you co-sponsored the bill. The litmus test will not be uh, uh, whether you have signed the discharge petition. And uh, I, I just don't think that, that we ought to make the, uh, the talk show hosts of this country the uh, uh, determiners of the process by which we consider legislation. You know, there's some talk r rather uh, un inexact talk about openness in the House. I've served here in two capacities for 30 years. And I started as an administrative assistant in 1963. Committee markups were held in executive session. Not even the sponsor of the bill that being marked up was admitted to the markup session, could not have a voice, sat in a hallway outside if, if he or she chose to, to get near the committee. <clears throat> and no one knew who voted and how. On, uh, on subcommittee or full committee markup. That's been changed. Committee markups are open. We know who votes almost before they vote and how they vote. <laughs> Secondly, uh, it was alleged that uh, lobbyists would love to have a system in which one committee chairman, uh, in which they could, could lobby one committee chairman and, and get all the uh, uh, members of the committee to go along. That doesn't happen either. 30 years ago, 25 years ago, even 20 years ago, a committee chairman had some very significant power, but we changed that in 1974 with the rules changes in the House that subjected committee chairs to uh, election in the Democratic caucus. And the Republicans have a similar process. 
for their ranking members. We, we have subjected committee chairs to accountability to the full Democratic caucus and subcommittee chairs as well to the, to the, to the caucus of each committee. And I don't know of a committee chair who can snap his or her fingers and have everybody drop in line. But I do know lobbyists that have been around here 30 and 40 years. And I tell you, a new member in this body is like putty in their hands. And I don't want to turn the, by term limits, and that's not the subject of this, but it was brought up by uh, uh, Mr. Solomon, the term limits that will just turn this body into a, a playground for, for the uh, lobbying corps of America, or for the unelected bureaucrats, or for the lifetime judges of America. So I, my, my recommendation to, to the uh, committee is <clears throat> consider, as you are doing in this deliberative process, consider the bill, report it with a strongly worded adverse report and recommend its defeat by the House and let's take it to the floor and give it a decent burial. Thank you, sir. Should we proceed with Mr. Barker first and then ask questions of the two gentlemen? I'm not. I don't even know what your testimony is going to be, Peter, but why don't you go ahead? I have a uh, copy of we do have a handout. Uh, I want to thank the chairman and the subcommittee members for their time. And let me acknowledge, first of all, that while I've only been a member of Congress for a few months, and I uh, therefore I don't claim to have all the answers in terms of the way that we uh, conduct the discharge petition and what kinds of reforms perhaps are necessary, I do feel that I have a perspective after serving eight years in the Wisconsin legislature um, that perhaps is relevant. Uh, while the Wisconsin State Legislature clearly isn't the same as the United States Congress, I think there are some similarities that I think are relevant to today's discussion. First of all, in Wisconsin, we have a long and treasured history of open government. Uh, we have open record laws that require almost every piece of government paper to be open to the public. And we have open meeting laws that ensure the public is notified and has a chance to participate in government meetings. And I believe Wisconsin has benefited greatly from this practice and this principle of openness. This openness accomplishes two things. First of all, through open records, the public has the ability to learn more about the government's business. And this helps hold rep representatives accountable. But more importantly, it invites public involvement. After all, that's the purpose behind what we do. Secondly, through open meeting laws, the public has an opportunity to observe government proceedings and participate in hearings by testifying and submitting written testimony. And I think these two issues are at the heart of this debate, the whole issue of openness and also that of public participation. And I understand and I appreciate the perspective that the committee process plays an important role in developing thoughtful and well-crafted legislation, not the least of which is the role of seeking public involvement and input. However, even more strongly, I do believe that the names of discharge petition signers should be public information. Many arguments have been made against public disclosure of names. Primarily, they seem to be concerned with special interest groups, uh, strong army members in the signing petitions. Uh, and perhaps there is a need to review the discharge petition process to allow more time for hearings to be held before we require that a bill be reported out. But I do not think that this is a sufficient enough reason for, not, for holding the name secret and not making them public immediately. Uh, under no circumstances do I believe the House can justify not having the public o to have open access to those records of who has signed these petitions. And in fact, contrary to what's been expressed by some people, I think in some cases the public might be upset to find out if somebody has signed a petition to move a bill, which perhaps is costly to the public, which perhaps is against good public policy, especially when it has not even had an opportunity for a public hearing. But regardless of the reason, I think that they should have access to know who has signed this document. That's why I think we do need to change from the current rules. That's why I support the effort to make the names open to the public. In my years of public service, one of the elements of state government that was most appreciated by the public in Wisconsin was our tradition of open government, and I believe that the best government is open government. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank for you. the opportunity. We, we thank both of you gentlemen for your very thoughtful and very helpful comments. I just wanted to say especially to 
a longtime friend, Mr. Oberstar, that I'm glad you made the point I was about to myself prior to your testifying, but you made the very necessary point that there is a difference in the minds of many members about signing discharge petitions and signing on as co-sponsors or co-authors of, of bills. There is nothing inherently dishonest about signing on as a co-sponsor or co-author of a bill and yet refusing to sign a discharge petition. Uh, what is what is obviously dishonorable is apparently the, our friend Mr. Imhoff in office has uh, discovered uh, is that people people do not tell the truth about whether or not they have signed on as, as, uh, uh, as, as signers of the discharge petitions and that point is certainly valid but I think I do want people to understand that there is a valid difference between between signing a discharge petition and signing as a, on as a co-sponsor of a bill questions of either of these two gentlemen mr. Oh, chairman well, mr. Goss Thank you very much. I appreciate the testimony of both gentlemen. It uh, just goes to show that uh, we can have a very legitimate difference of opinion for exactly the same goal, which is to do the best possible job we can on behalf of the people we represent. And there is obviously a difference of opinion, which is why we're here. I think that uh, Mr. Overstar hit a, hit a, hit a note uh, on this, this question that is part of our problem. Uh, and, I, and if I misunderstood or misheard you, uh, Jim, let me know. But you're talking about introducing bills, uh, that some members introduce bills and they don't even want them to be heard. Uh, they may have a reason for introducing that bill and hope that it dies somewhere in the black hole. And you even raise the specter of going to the chairman of the committee and say, I've introduced this bill, but don't ever let it get anywhere. Now, the question is. I, I haven't suggested that. No, but you did. I didn't say that. No, you, didn't, you did not I, say that. I don't think that. No, no, I don't, no, like, I don't like that to be attributed to me. All right, I will withdraw that and say, in my mind, that specter was raised. Okay. Uh, and I will say that what you said, that not even members introduce bills, not even wanting them to be heard. Now, why would a member introduce a bill and not want it to be heard? Why is that terribly relevant? I mean, you're... you're because what we're talking about here is accountability. That's exactly the point. I mean, this is, we're talking about the trust of members of Congress and the trust of the institution. I cannot imagine why a member would introduce a piece of legislation, possibly use franking money to say, I've introduced a piece of legislation, create an expectation that there is such a piece of legislation, and then uh, hope that the legislation is not going to be heard. But that that fact, is bizarre. It may be bizarre, but the gentleman should know that, in fact, that does happen. Well, uh, I'm I've, asking Mr. Overstar to explain to me why it happens. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I can't crawl into the mind of uh, everyone who has uh, done this, and, and, and it certainly is not a widespread practice, but it does happen, and a member will introduce a bill simply to get a, a particular interest group off his or her back. I've introduced your bill, period. I haven't done that. No, I'm not saying comes, you'll have. I was asking says, about your testimony. Uh, we'd like you to co-sponsor the bill. I said, well, I'm sorry, I don't believe in that uh, concept, and I won't sponsor it. Well, I don't I think that's a particularly it. honorable procedure. I mean, if you're not going to, if you're going to introduce a bill with the clear idea that all you're going to do is to try and fool somebody into the fact that you've done something for them when in fact you know it's very well. It's not honorable at all, Porter, but that's done by an awful lot of people, especially people who sign on as co-sponsors of bills. I, I, I hear you. And what I am suggesting to you is exactly the reason that Mr. Inhofe has brought this forward, yeah. is to increase accountability. Do you think that's going to reduce the, the number of members uh, who, who would introduce a bill and not want it heard? I have no idea whether it will or it won't. But I suggest well, I don't think it has anything to do with it. Well, my I, just, I just raised it as as a, a, a part of a uh, as an aspect of a thought process that that exists in the institution. Well, I would suggest that what will happen is you will find that those who are opposed to what Mr. Inhofe is trying to accomplish here are basically going to be put in a position of saying, we are resisting any further uh, accountability to the way we go about our business. What, what, what accountability is there if you, don't, if, you, if you do not wish, if you don't agree with the co concept of the bill and you don't wish to sign the discharge petition, what's the accountability problem? There's no problem with that as long as it's done in the public and say, I feel very strongly about this. You're given the chance to explain. What I think Mr. Inhofe has very correctly pointed out is the secrecy allows people to dissemble. And I suggest that that is hurtful to the process of democracy and very hurtful to the integrity of the institution. And unfortunately, well, why, why should we go, most why Americans we agree. A, a system in which everyone who does not sign a discharge petition has his or her name published in a newspaper. There's day nothing day. pejorative in that. It's, I didn't or, sign or, a discharge petition because I didn't wish to, and these are my reasons. Or I did because of why, these. Why should we be subject to having that 
uh, ha having names published in a, in a newspaper or in some newsletter or in some inside organization circular day after day after day because you, you don't wish to sign a discharge petition. Let me, That's nonsense. Let me redefine why we're here. We serve the public. Yeah. We operate in the public. We are accountable to the public. To suggest there is some form of cover for us by some procedure is to me uh, a, a, a very... Uh, Harmful thought. Well, it has nothing to do with so accountable. It has to has to do with making uh, making every member of this house a target of some special interest group. Who, who do you cares? believe? Uh, or do you get do you get uh, letters and uh, so forth? You talk about being flooded with letters uh, on mailing lists and so forth. Don't you get those letters now? I do. I, every I other member of about, Congress does. About, about my name not being on a discharge petition. Though. No, no, not on a discharge petition, but on any given issue. You know, if you won't sign with us, uh, we're going to we're going to make it known to sure, our membership. You, get that all the time. you mean you must? I have AARP. I have a lot of senior citizens, and I get a lot of conversation uh, with them, understandably, or any other uh, areas where they think it's important. That's on and the every substance member of the legislation, has that. but it's not on the on the form. It's not on a. Uh, uh, meaningless procedure. It's not meaningless. This enhances accountability. There is not a m person in the United States of America that is not looking for more accountability from elected officials these days. You got all the accountability you want now. What what does the discharge petition signature li non signature list? do for accountability. It simply says you cannot be hide, hide behind secrecy anymore. Whatever it is you feel, whatever your motivations are, you have to be able to respond in public to the people you work for, the people who pay you, and say, well, it, why did you do it? Can't the same group just simply ask members, are, are you a signer on a discharge petition? Right. And then the, they say no. Uh, and, and the question is uh, whether or not that's the appropriate answer. Are you honest or not? That's part of the question. And one of the ways you ensure honesty mechanically is by You're increasing test accountability. Everybody in this institution by, by having an honesty test? It's not, it's not our test. It's the people they represent. <laughs> well, that's what you want to do with this, with this gimmick. I think that this is not a gimmick. I suspect no, it is. You think government in the sunshine is a gimmick? No. But this is a gimmick. In what way? It, it's just it's a means the Republicans have found to embarrass the Democratic majority in the House. And if we were if we were the minority, we'd probably be doing the same thing. Uh, let me assure you, Jim, I have a great deal of respect for you, and I would not be uh, making a distinction if we were talking about Republicans or Democrats or Independents or United We Stand people or Libertarians or anybody else. This is a question of trust between the elected and the electees. I don't think it has anything to do with, with trust. I, if, if a person signs a discharge petition, they can tell the world about it. If a person chooses not to sign a discharge petition, they ought to have the right, uh, a matter of privacy, either to not to, Whoa, not to matter say... matter of privacy? Not, not to say that, th that they have, have signed it or, or to admit that they have signed a discharge Acting petition. Acting in their public capacity, the public has a right to know what they're doing. Now, they can choose to be candid, they can choose to dissemble, they can choose to be, total, they can choose to be totally honest, they can do anything they want, but they need to be accountable, and the public needs to be assured of that accountability, and that's one of the benefits of this. Which public? The, the public who's interested, any public. Well... A very limited public, perhaps, in, in, in some instances. Maybe some inst other instances is a very broad public. But I, I, I think you're, you're, you're talking, you're, you're creating uh, an issue that doesn't, uh, that doesn't exist out of a problem for which, uh, 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 for which there really is a cure. The, the committee system works. It, it, it may be, I guess, that the committee system does work. But let us say that 218 plus a few more members of the 103rd Congress feel that it could work a little better if we use this discharge petition openly rather than secretly. May I say gently, this is an interesting discussion, it really is. Uh, I think it's probably also moot, um, because I think probably the decision has been taken, more or less, that, that uh, Mr. Inhofe's uh, position is going to prevail. I mean, I do think that these things, for, the, for good or for bad, uh, that the names are going to be made, are going to be made public. Uh, I suspect even if we didn't make them, even if we didn't make that decision, uh, the truth of the matter probably is that folks have discovered now how to go about making them public anyway and, and, and getting the result they want, so that it, that too is probably moot. Well, Mr. So, Chairman, I think that's true, so but in the deliberate... You guys are having an interesting and a useful philosophical discussion. Um, 
But I, I, mean, I believe it's I, part I of the deliberative process, Mr. Chairman. I want to learn I, from Mr. Oberstar if I'm missing something because I signed that petition. I want to make sure that I'm not wrong. And I, I, so far, Mr. Oberstar has not been able to persuade you. Let me, ask you, let me ask you. you haven't been able to convince me. I, fortunately, I have 218 people on my side. Let me ask, well, you, let me ask you a personal question. 17 others who are wrong. <laughs> Mr. Goss, when, Mr. You think, when you think of the, when you think of, just, just to follow up on a point that our friend from Minnesota made, when you think of the possible pieces of legislation that might be freed and sent to the floor uh, because of, of this new procedure, which I suspect we're going to adopt in one form or another. Are those things, generally speaking, uh, bills that you approve of? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, let me tell you that uh, on any given issue, I believe in the deliberative collective wisdom of this body. I don't always agree with the conclusion, but I believe in the deliberative collective wisdom. That's the way the system works. The problem here is not voting yes or no on the issue. The problem is getting the vote on the issue. But how many of those issues that, of which you are so concerned that we need to have a discharge petition, that the committee system is so obstructive, that the rules committee has been so reluctant to act, how many issues are bottled up uh, irrevocably on, uh, 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 so, so that the only route is a discharge petition? Yeah, what are we talking uh, about specifically? I, I can give you one case. I don't pretend to know the whole panoply of legislation or that all of the authors and co-sponsors would like to move. But I will tell you, I believe that there is some legislation that is extremely important, that is not moving, that will be given an impetus. I'm not sure that it will be passed. I'm not sure what form will be. But it will be given an impetus. One is getting tough on crime legislation. Another is removing the earnings test limitation for senior citizens. Another is a debate on terms limits. Now, we all may differ on how we would vote on those, but the benefit of the debate is very much on the minds of the American people these how days. About the notch? Absolutely. I have no reason at all not to have the debate on the notch. We should have the debate on the notch. Right. Now, a lot of people are those scared are, those to are death. Those four of, issues now that you've, you've identified. I'm sure that I... Out of, out of about about 3,000 bills have been introduced this session. But, Jim, understand, I am only one of 435 plus five delegates times four. That adds up to about 1,700 pieces of legislation. I've only given you my wish list. Oh. You think there's 1,700 bills that are being delayed in committee because a committee chairman doesn't want to act on them? I have never done the survey, but I know there are enough that are important oh, to I, me. I, I think that's grossly overstated. I, I'm not saying that. I said I have no idea. I, I'm just simply saying there are enough of importance to me so that at the very least, the threat of the discharge petition on the committee system may have a salutary effect to get a hearing. And again, the idea is to get the hearing. It's not necessarily to force through a yes or a no vote. It's to bring the matter to debate. The, the this petition brings it brings the bill directly to the floor. May I gently for say debate? May I gently sure, say that you gentlemen have voting. made your points. <laughs> They're well taken, both of you. <laughs> and maybe you'll go off in the out in the hall and finish this discussion. <laughs> we've, got, we've got another eleven witnesses we want to hear from, Mr. Inhofe. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I've enjoyed this very much. I just want to make one comment. I uh, Mr. don't make Robert, a provocative one because we want to get on to the next. Mr. Witness. Overstar and I have worked together on the on the aviation subcommittee, and we've been uh, we've accomplished a good deal there working together. But I have to say, Mr. Oberstar, I think you've made one of the best, most compelling arguments for my reform, and that is that we have a lot of people who introduce bills they have no intention of passing. I can't think of one noble motive behind that behavioral pattern. And this system that we have in place, in absence of my reform, protects that. Well, I, 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 I've raised that point because I think that there are people who do introduce bills that they don't uh, uh, intend to have pass. Uh, but I, I don't mean to characterize the institution as uh, overwhelmingly uh, that, that's <laughs> in, in that mode. Uh, certainly that is, uh, th that is an exception rather than a rule. But uh, I don't think this chart petition is a cure for that problem. I think cure is just don't introduce bills that you don't believe in. Yeah. Mr. Barger, could I ask you one question? Were you in the state legislature? Yes, I was. Uh, I was also in Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, if a bill is bottled up in the committee in, the state, in your state, and uh, you're in the state legislature, and you want to have it come out, what is your process? The process here is that on the first Tuesday of a month, uh, you can uh, make a motion on the floor where it's an open vote uh, and it's a majority vote that it takes if a bill has been in committee for more than, I think it's 45 days. So then if a majority of the members vote in favor of that, uh, then it's immediately moved out of the Rules Committee and up to the floor. Uh, that's essentially the same system as is in Oklahoma, and it's all out in the open. There's no cover and no secrecy, and I think you have a fine system that we should emulate. Thank you. Thank you both very, very much. Thank you.
Our next witness is um, Mr. Richard Beth. He's an analyst uh, in American national government for the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress. Prior to coming to CRS in 1980, he taught courses in Congress and government at uh, Southwest Missouri State University and at Boston University. Mr. Chairman, I understood that the witnesses that were to follow me have yes. a time problem and we're going to be moved up ahead of me. All right, that's fine. Um, Thank you. Kind of you. The two gentlemen who I think are coming together. Mr. Robinson here too? Yeah. Come on up. That's fine. Hide. The next two people, we have a panel of two good friends who helped us before on other matters of difficulty. Uh, Mr. Hyde Murray is Assistant Director for National Affairs of the American Farm Bureau Federation. He spent 30 years as a staff member of the House, and it's good, as always, to have you back, sir. From 1979 to 1988, he was elected by the Republican Conference and the House as Minority Counsel. With him is Mr. Peter Robinson, founder of Bailey Morris and Robinson, a government affairs unit of Ketchum Public Relations. Prior to his current position, Mr. Robinson was a senior aide to speakers Tom Foley and Jim Wright. He also also served as Assistant Parliamentarian of the House of Representatives for 12 years. As I said, two long time and good friends and people who know the ways of the House, and it's very good to have both of you back here to advise us on this matter. Mr. Murray, do you want to go first, sir, or uh, yeah. however you all want? Well, I'll, I'll try to thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. For uh, this opportunity to discuss the House rules and the precedents relative to discharge petitions and the discharge calendar. And I want a special thanks to the other witnesses that let me go ahead uh, earlier today because later I disappear into the 19th century as Vice Chairman of the Civil War Sites Advisory Committee, where we are testifying today before the Senate. So as I listened to the debate, I didn't know whether this was Pickett's Charge or Little Round Top, but we'll uh, maybe uh, test, it, uh, test the waters and find out. With many reforms, there's usually a conflict between two or more reasoned and rational approaches. In this case, the conflict between open debate and disclosure on one hand and then the need to have strong and effective committees on the other hand presents to you and to every House member a great decision. The committee structure in the House is basically designed to give the House the time, the expertise, and the persistence within the committees to formulate sound law, and then I would add this, and to kill bad legislation. The House itself and its alter ego, the Committee of the Whole, are fully equipped to modify, ratify, or to reject the work of the committees. But at some point, the House must decide where the balance exists between legislating in committee and legislating on the floor. Many of the House rules are biased toward committees. The rule of germaneness, the rule of reference and committee jurisdiction, for example, favor an orderly consideration of bills by the committee empowered to hear and decide specific issues. The discharge petition itself is per se clearly in derogation of the power of all committees, including the rules committee, because it provides a mechanism to veto the veto of the committee. Mr. Button. Press the button just one. There, that button? Okay. The discharge petition is per se in derogation because it, uh, it uh, provides for a mechanism to veto the veto of a recalcitrant committee that just wants to say no. In drafting the current discharge petition rule, the House appears to have drawn it narrowly by, for example, not letting members sign while they're in the hospital or by proxy and by keeping the names confidential. Allowing the publication of names would, be, would appear to put more pressure on other members to sign the petition, and it would make it most awkward, to say the least, for a member to remove his or her name. And it would make the observation that uh, the removal of names isn't per se a uh, haven for hypocrites. Sometimes members change their mind, or sometimes they sign things and didn't realize the full implications of what they signed. And many times in the House now you'll see members asked to be withdrawn by unanimous consent as co-sponsors of bills. Now in, em in an effort to enhance your understanding and to be helpful in your consideration of this aspect of the rule, I'll start by highlighting some of the early history of the rule as recorded by former House parliamentarian and later congressman and chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Clarence Cannon and uh, read to you from volume 7, sections 107 and 108, a copy of which is attached to my statement. 
And then finally, in the interest of time, that a commodity that Plato uh, noted as the costliest of the valuables, I would next propose to share with you some rationale as to the use of the current rule uh, based on the book that Pete Robinson and I worked uh, together on, uh, the book on Congress. Finally, I would propose to anticipate some of the ant implications involved in changing this 61-year-old precedent that the publications of members' signatures and deletions should remain prohibited. Well, first, take, take a look at uh, the ruling by, or the history by Clarence Cannon, and I won't read the whole thing because it takes a little while, but I hope you'll have a chance to study it and put it in your hearing record for consideration by all the members and students of this process. But he makes the point that the rule was adopted in its present form uh, January 3rd, 1935. And originally, all reports were presented in the House on a motion of the chairman of the committee or by any other member, and a motion to discharge the committee from consideration of bills seems to have been in frequent use and practice in the House as it is in the Senate, then and as it still is. However, at a very early date, and this was the 40th Congress since 1867, uh, the uh, motion was no longer privileged as an order of business. And he goes on to say that the first record of an attempt to reestablish the privilege of the motion appears in the 48th Congress around 1873. And then discussion went on for various le uh, periods of time in through there, and it uh, flowed back and forth, first as part of Rule 28, and then later transferred to Rule 27. And finally, it gets down into the early 1900s, and then, and then on into the uh, 20s, when the rule was uh, crafted to go to 218 threshold, whereas earlier rules uh, had been 145 names as the threshold. Now, he makes this statement, and I think this is just as germane today as it was when this brilliant 31-year-old lawyer from Missouri wrote this book. And that was that the problem of formulating a practical provision for the discharge of committees is one of the oldest and most perplexing in the history of the House. And you're the inheritors of that perplexity now to try to draft a discharge process that leaves the committee work integrity alive and still respond to the will of a majoritarian organization like the House of Representatives. And uh, he goes on then to tell a little bit about that history. Then the other uh, ruling is the ruling in February 23rd, 1932, when Mr. Robert S. Hall of Mississippi announced the filing of a motion to discharge the Committee on Rules, of all people, from considering a resolution providing a special order for the consideration of a bill relating to drainage and irrigation, as uh, reported by the Committee on Irrigation and Reclamation. Let me say parenthetically that in the history of the House that I've had anything to do with, the Rules Committee itself has been the target of obstruction and of efforts to change its role. From time to time in the recent history, the 21-day rule has been adopted by the House, which would say that if a recalcitrant Rules Committee refused to report bills by committees and it laid over 21 days, it could be brought directly to the floor by the chairman who was uh, sponsoring the legislation out of his or her committee. And then, of course, the calendar Wednesday process is in derogation of the Rules Committee. So there are, there are these pressure valves or avenues to do. But it's this, it was this ruling in 1932 where the chair said, quote, these signatures cannot be made public until the required number of members sign the petition. Now, highlights from the current practice that leave you with four thoughts. One is that this is an unbottling rule. It's uh, the power of committees, and as a longtime committee counsel, I can tell you that one of the powers of the committee was to be deaf as well as to hear. That uh, there were a lot of times that bills were killed because they were bad bills in the opinion of the committees. They didn't let them see the light of day. That was part of the legislative process. That's part of the power. The power to act carries with it the power to not act or the power to act adversely. That's, that's an inherent power that the committees enjoy, and this process unbottles the committees from their role in that function. Now, through the history of the rule, it's interesting, almost ironic, to note that the only two times since 
1938 that the rule has been successfully used, successfully used, was in 1938 to pass the Fair Labor Standards Act, and in 1960 to pass a government-wide pay raise for government employees over the objection of President Eisenhower. So on the history books of the uh, 393 bills uh, under the discharge process, uh, only two of them became law, and it was in those cases, historically, it was liberals two, conservatives nothing. Uh, that is part of what I'd like to leave with you as a thought, that this is a two-edged sword, that the discharge petition process is a two-edged sword, not just uh, applies to one philosophy or one party. As you point out, it's a bicameral, bipartisan issue. The next thing I'd leave with you is the thought, or the fact, I guess, that the modern application of the technique is to discharge the Rules Committee, not to discharge the Legislative Committee, but to discharge the Rules Committee. And that way, it, it exposes members to a great vulnerability. Now, maybe you want to expose them to that, but the exposure that the members have isn't whether they're for or against Proposition A, it's whether they're for or against letting the House consider Proposition A. It's whether you're going to be open-minded and allow a matter to be considered, not whether you vote for it or don't vote for it. That's been part of the history of the, re of the discharge petition. There have been numerous instances where the discharge petition was successful, and the bill got on the floor and was defeated because of the merits of the bill. So it's not always a successful tool to enact things. The final point I would leave with you is the history of most recent times when Congressman Stenholm used this rule successfully. They used this discharge petition to get a vote on this balanced budget amendment, and he reached the threshold of 218, and then the committee reacted uh, to that request by a majority of the House, reported an alternative rule, which was patterned very closely after the rule that Mr. Stenholm had drafted, giving him the so-called king of the mountain spot in the lineup to be able to offer the final version of a balanced budget amendment and maximize his chance of winning. And of course, history tells us he fell short in that effort, but it did, uh, it did go uh, that way. Now, finally, I'd like to uh, continue to ampli uh, amplify on my thoughts on sunshine. Uh, with a, the with a, uh, publication policy, it, I think it does axiomatically make uh, more intense lobbying. Now, that can be good or bad, depending on what you're lobbying for. It can be for cutting down waste in government, or it can be this m marvelous magnet called tax cuts. Hardly anybody's ever against tax cuts. And who is going to be against considering tax cuts of some kind, whether it's notch babies, or whether it's uh, benefits for Social Security elderly, or what, whatever. There are a lot of virtuous causes, and many of them cost money, and many of them are hard to vote against. But by making them subject to the discharge process, the members are put on the line to, to do that. In this instance, I relate my own experience when I was a courier in the yesteryear of the conservative coalition, which included your predecessor, the Honorable Paige Belcher from Tulsa, a wonderful gentleman and a wonderful congressman. And I can remember being a courier with people in this room named Howard Smith and Bill Colmer, and then Jerry Ford and John Rhodes and Charlie Halleck. And there was a thing called the conservative coalition that was going strong in those days. And in those days, we were bottling up a bill called the food stamp bill. We thought that would be a terrible bill to enact in those days. And uh, we were successful in bottling it up for a number of times. I would think now with the voting process of the discharge petition, that would be pretty hard for the Agriculture Committee to bottle up a bill that's a popular constituency supporting spending bill such as food stamps. Conversely, uh, the, as I mentioned, uh, in the current environment, cons conservatives could uh, target not only taxes, but a number of other uh, high des highly desirable programs to, to uh, attack. Now, when you take the combination of conservatives cutting taxes and liberals spending more money, I think you have the possibility of a two-double punch, one from the left and one from the right, 
beating up the poor old budget, which is already in a difficult condition and in uh, deficit. So the law of unintended consequences looms for all of you that uh, the affection for sunshine might bring with it implications that you didn't uh, count on. So finally, leave you with this thought. As these hearings demonstrate, a good argument can be made on both sides of the question of publishing members' names on a discharge petition. But eventually the leadership and the individual members will have to decide which technique will be the best way to produce good law. Careful, thorough subcommittee and committee deliberation, and in some cases, internment or more participatory, open, but less thorough consideration in the Committee of the Whole and the House. And Clarence Cannon's echo still resonates in our ears. The problem of formulating a practical provision for the discharge of committees is one of the oldest and most perplexing in the history of the House. Thanks, Mr. Murray. That was very thoughtful and, again, helpful testimony for us. Mr. Pete Robinson. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Moakley, and other distinguished members. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today on this very important subject. Hyde stole a little of my fire. I was going to use the same Clarence Cannon quote. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> my main idea for the committee, uh, as it considers the pressing and almost irrefutable proposition that secrecy and discharge signatures cannot be maintained, is that in reviewing this issue, the committee must review the entire discharge mechanism. An approach which only makes members' names public would have a dramatic and unbalanced effect on the committee system and on the deliberate consideration of great national issues. According to the Concise Dictionary of American History, the American Revolution was fomented by committee, organized by committee, and in great measure conducted by committees. Alexis de Tocqueville, the French political scientist and historian, observed that whenever 19th century Americans encountered a problem, they immediately formed an association or committee to deal with it. The committee system is so essential to our American political system. My gut instinct on first hearing about this controversy was to favor the status quo the secrecy of discharge signatures arguably being such an important protection against abuse of the rule. At any given time, public opinion polls would endorse bypassing committee deliberation for certain issues. I am one who represents industries with vital interests before the Congress. I don't think that I would ever counsel a client to use a discharge rule that was easy to invoke. However, I can guarantee you that there are many out there who will. And grassroots and concerted lobbying campaigns have become so sophisticated that this could be a real opportunity for certain issues to abuse the system. However, I do not believe that the principle of discharge signature secrecy, a principle not even re required by the language of the rule itself, can stand up to legitimate public scrutiny, so to speak. We demand and receive openness and accountability from our representatives in every other way. The congressional reforms of the past two decades have changed committee and House procedure to require that members put themselves on the record and defend their decisions before the public. This clock cannot nor should it be turned back. But the disclosure of these signatures must also be viewed in context with other significant changes since the early 1900s. Committees are more responsive to the public and to members at large than they were 60 years ago. Sessions and committee votes are for the most part open and recorded and committees are not ruled by the iron grip of seniority and the whim of entrenched chairman. Openness and accountability, principles endorsed by the Democratic and Republican Party organizations last fall, have been ingrained in most of the House procedures. It also has been, become extremely important for the operation of the House to have good committee reports. We have a laundry list of requirements now placed on the language of the committee's report on requirements such as the Budget Act and the like. The co-sponsorship of bills, a relatively new phenomenon, allows members to express their collective endorsement of particular legislation with the right to add, to re reconsider, and to withdraw support. I would just say parenthetically that I can think of, uh, of cases where members might introduce bills without intending them to receive committee consideration for very good reasons, such as floating trial balloons. Just about everyone has a, has a bill out on health reform. It doesn't mean that they think their idea is going to be the one that reaches the final pr approval. But it's a way of airing ideas 
And frankly, with our multiple committee jurisdiction, there may often be cases where a committee chairman has to protect his own committee jurisdiction and introduce his own bill as a, as a warning shot to another committee chairman. And I don't think these are abuses of the rule, they're simple tactics. I would also point out that over the last two decades, Congress has enacted another type of pressure valve against committees that don't act. We now have a variety of special statutes providing expedited procedures for subject-specific legislation. These statutes often provide for committee discharge if the committee doesn't act within a certain time. Rescission bills and, and trade agreements come to mind. In light of these carefully crafted statutes, should the general discharge rule be so easy to invoke? Then there's recommittal, a, min a minority right ever more important as rules become more restrictive in, in current practice. I would point out that the discharge rule is a double-edged sword. The Rules Committee cannot report a rule denying the motion to recommit, but the discharge rule could be used to discharge the committee from a rule which denies altogether the motion to recommit and any concerted majority could use it in this fashion. I'll just touch on a, a couple of issues and maybe make some suggestions. <clears throat> One might argue that a truly deliberative discharge process requires two separate decisions. First, whether le legislation should emerge from the subject matter committee, and second, how the legislation should be considered in the House. You might provide that a discharge petition against a rule might only be allowed in the event of successful discharge or reporting of a bill. The point here is that the deliberative process is turned on its head if the only question becomes how rather than whether to consider a particular legislation. How about the mechanics of the discharge petition itself? If names are going to be disclosed throughout the process, why not have a layover period for the discharge petition to sit at the desk and either either accumulate more signatures, which is most likely, or have some withdrawn. With the flurry of activity at the clerk's desk as the rule now sits, members may be closed out at the last minute from registering their own rights. It's been suggested there be a threshold before signatures are made public. I myself don't, f don't favor that, figuring that either you have secrecy or you have non-secrecy. <clears throat> Are the present time periods under the rule enough for deliberate lawmaking? Do they reflect the requirements for committees to hold hearings, to uh, put together committee reports, to get executive branch statements of position, to run it through the budget committee and the CBO? None of these extensive requirements existed in the, in the early 1900s. <clears throat> a related question is the multi-jurisdictional system currently in place. Discharge removes any possibility for committees with significant, although secondary, jurisdiction to review legislation. Creative drafting along with pressure for discharge may prevent committees with appropriate expertise from ever considering legislation and may exacerbate jurisdictional conflict. Another issue has been the question of the majority required on a discharge petition. You might well consider in the case of constitutional amendments that a discharge petition should take two-thirds votes. <clears throat> Finally, based on a lot of these ideas, <clears throat> you might consider uh, a practice which, according to the House Rules and Manual, actually existed before the present rule, which was an enforceable motion to instruct. This would... Uh, be consistent with many of the legislative veto statutes now in the books. <clears throat> you might provide that the petition is actually a petition for a motion to instruct the committee to report. And if signed up, uh, and then I would suspect then voted upon in an expedited fashion, that the committee in question would have so many days to file a report. And if it did not file the report, the bill would be discharged to the House then a separate discharge petition against the Rules Committee itself so that the Rules Committee couldn't bottle up the legislation. <clears throat> These are only some thoughts. There will be many other ideas. In closing, uh, I simply recommend that you do not address the question of disclosure or secrecy in isolation. Thanks, Mr. Robinson. Yours, too, was extremely, I thought, helpful testimony to us. Um, was the kind of pressure that, that, was, that was brought to bear on members to sign the discharge petition in this particular instance a harbinger of what we can expect for other discharge petitions, do you think? Um, or was this an unusual case? 
I, I take it you suggested by your testimony, Mr. Robinson, that an awful lot of people are going to see the advantage of, of going directly to, to use this. I, I suspect also that people will stop worrying about or bothering about co-sponsorships of their bills and go directly to um, petitions to discharge. Yeah, I, I in fact, on the co-sponsorship rule, make people think about it more carefully and uh, perhaps prevent a decent piece of legislation from collecting the support it might otherwise gain. I think uh, I haven't really followed the lobby on this particular issue, but what I see is the is the uh, probable consequence of private lobbying for different kinds of issues, not something related to the structure of this body. I don't think that lobbyists are going to come out of the woodwork on term limits one way or another. I think they probably won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. <clears throat> but on something like the notch issue, uh, and particularly on other tax or financial matters that might affect particular industries uh, where public support can be galvanized in a, in a certain area, uh, I do see it as a big opportunity for special interest groups. You do have to galvanize, as you put it, you have, you have to galvanize public support. So I take it we're talking about groups or people or interests with resources uh, and access to whatever it is that galvanizes the public. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we're talking about people with, with a lot of resources, whether one approves of them or not. Uh, well, we're also talking about people, I suppose, with access to the media, um, which leads one to suspect that, I mean, the liberals, whom our friend Mr. Inhofe was, was alluding to earlier on, may not have the access to the radio shows and, to the, uh, and to, the, to the folks who can whip up public sentiment the way the conservatives can these days. Does that suggest that, that uh, conservative causes will profit by this and liberal causes will not? Or as Mr. Murray suggests, uh, it's a two-edged sword and everybody's got to be careful because even if right now that might be true, sometime later on it won't be. And, uh, have to be careful. Mr. Chairman, sir, if you have any questions. Hey, uh, in the debate, the, uh, the matter of co-sponsoring and discharge petition has kind of been meshed and in, in, uh, I, I think that's probably lost its meaning. Would you, for the uh, edification of the panel, just Give the uh, your opinion of what would happen if uh, if they went the discharge petition route uh, and they make the litmus, litmus test the signing of the discharge petition rather than the co-sponsoring a bill. I think co-sponsorship will then lose a lot of its meaning, uh, and <clears throat> co-sponsorship. Co-sponsoring a bill and signing a discharge petition, it seems to me, are two very, very different things. Um, uh, Co-sponsorship -co had a very good reason. It was to cut down on the number of bills introduced, for one thing, and it was to allow members to show good support for, uh, for certain ideas. Um, I'm not sure what the effect will be, but I, it certainly is not going to help the what I think is a very good, a valuable system of co-sponsorship. As a result of your years of experience, do you think that uh, if the uh, discharge petition uh, were made uh, easier, uh, that people may take that route rather than the committee route in, in, in order to get the legislation to the floor, or do you think that they would still go through the committee route? Mr. Chairman, it's very hard for me to predict that, um, but it is my fear that a, that, a, that a discharge rule, which is so much easier to satisfy, uh, and I don't think anybody can deny that disclosing the signatures is going to make it easier to sign up a petition and very hard to have members withdraw their names. Um, I simply fear that it will be used more and more frequently. The, the chairman yields just for a moment. Yes. I'm sitting here thinking about this. Um, 
can respond to it if you want or, or not. But I'm just thinking about you know myself or any one of us as individual members. There are different kinds of bills one introduces. Um, spe you know, speaking only for myself, but I assume it's true of other members as well. Some of them are just sort of ideas or thoughts that I think are good or useful, and you know you want to get before the members and you hope they're heard somewhere and you hope they finally get out and you introduce the bill and you may send around a dear colleague letter and you know and and, and uh, try to try to get a, get some folks to to decent members from both parties to, to sign a, on as, as co-authors, and you kind of let it go at that. You, you pester the chairman, you have a hearing if you possibly can, whatever. There are other bills which people introduce. I don't think I do particularly, although I suppose a decent member, number of members do. Many of us don't, I'm sure some do, which are in a sense sponsored by or certainly of interest to outside groups of one sort uh, or another. And if you introduce a bill for them, it just seems to me uh, that from now on you're going to be engaged. They're going to insist. They're not going to care about whether you get 112 co-sponsors or not or whatever. Uh, they're going to say, uh, they're going to, I think part of the understanding will be if you carry a bill on their behalf or a bill which they're interested in or people outside, a lot of them are, are, are pushing for, they're not going to be satisfied with anything less then you're going for discharge. I mean, well, why, why should they be? It's, it's really quite a different situation from what we've got now. And uh, one which you know, should trouble us all to a certain extent. I'm not arguing against your proposal, Tim. I'm just saying that it's going to change the way that things are done around here. And we're all going to feel pressures, both as authors of bills and as members, um, in quite a different way than we have ever had in the past. Mr. Chairman. I was sure. going to uh, Hi. Sorry. insert an angle that you may not have thought about on commemoratives. National Onion Month, yeah. Smokey Bear's birthday. Now it, the requirement is to get 218 <coughs> signatures to send it to committee. Why not uh, go in the discharge petition route right away? And who can resist uh, Smokey Bear's birthday? Uh, who, won't, who, won't, who would not even consider debating Smokey Bear's birthday? I think the discharge petition device, the calendar may become partially cluttered with commemoratives uh, as well as substantive type legislation. But we've done a fairly good job in recent years of, of trying to keep under control yeah. and save a lot of money in the process. Thank you. didn't mean to inter interrupt. No, that's all. I just wanted uh, Pete to, uh, to make the difference on the, on the uh, discharge petition, the uh, signing of discharge petition and the, uh, the uh, other matters. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief because I know that we have other witnesses and um, other agenda problems. The, um, the question that I, I'd like to address, though, I think the Chairman has raised, uh, I think there's a very distinct difference between authorship, sponsorship, co-sponsorship, and signing a discharge petition. I may very well be opposed to an issue, uh, but would like to think that the time has come for debate, and that might be my motivation for, for signing a discharge petition. I think there's a tremendous distinction between debate uh, and approbation or, or opposition to, to an issue. Uh, and, and I don't think we're going to be losing anything on that. If anything, I think we're going to be saving some money uh, because maybe we'll stop some of these frivolous uh, bills from uh, being trotted out by everybody. That might be a useful benefit to this. It's not something I'd frankly thought of before. And, and to suggest that somehow outside groups are going to prevail more, I mean, I have a, a tremendous amount of realtors in my district. And I also got a whole bunch of uh, encouragement from the National Association of Realtors to support the Budget Deficit Reduction Act. Well, it turns out that the National Association of Realtors weren't apparently talking to the people in my district who are in the real estate business who didn't think that was a very good idea. So I'm getting mixed mail. I'm smart enough to make the difference, and I think every member of Congress is smart enough to understand the difference in the mail that comes in of, you know, what's a special interest, uh, you know, signed petition, and, and what's real. Uh, I don't have any of those problems at all. But I think that you get, we're getting a little bit away uh, from what we, are, we started out to do here, and that is to say, can we increase accountability uh, without causing damage? And my answer is, even though you've made two very persuasive presentations, I haven't heard any justification for secrecy yet. None at all. Uh, I don't think uh, Pete said it outright. And I think the uh, uh, public disclosure cat is out of the bag. That bo That's out of the bottle. I don't think that's in the dialogue. You're going to have public disclosure one way or another. Now it's sort of semi-public because the in-group can figure out how many people signed the petition. And by memorizing only five names at a sure. time, they can figure out the whole roster. So it, 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 I think the dialogue is on what do we do now? publication yeah. plus. Uh, I understand that we, we are now uh, at a point where there's such an incredible
incredible, uh, compelling <coughs> desire for reform and change in Congress that is really backed by a legitimate constituency across the country. This is not something that somebody's made up. It's there. Uh, there's a gentleman in the White House who I think would attest to the fact that change is what people want in this country. And this is part of that process. Uh, and trying to make this work properly, I think, is, is what we're doing here. And I say, you know, the fact that the committee system works is, is being proven right now. We are deliberatively discussing the pluses and the minuses of the, quote, unintended consequences that you've talked about. But I am, I am a, a little bit worried that, you know, floating trial balloons is a justifiable reason to throw a piece of legislation into a committee hopper. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it that are a lot of cheaper. And, and frankly, to be candid, uh, if, if some of the testimony we've heard earlier uh, is accurate or is, is, is more on target, um, that's not the reason uh, a lot of this goes out. Uh, there's a lot of ways to float a trial balloon. We all know that. But, but to actually go through filing a bill uh, to do it uh, and then just leaving the bill alone or not, or not giving it any authorship uh, and leaving the paternity question out there, it seems to me uh, it doesn't accomplish anything. And on the contrary, there may be a negative consequence to it. Uh, it I can assign some bad motives to that. I won't, but I could. Um, so I, I, I think that we, we don't lose anything. Now, the other, the other point that was brought up was this question about more pressure to sign, more awkward to pull your name. Those are interesting questions, but it's, you know, maybe one of the problems is that people in Congress are too worried about popularity or some adjunct of popularity like re-election rather than earning respect for doing the job right. And it seems to me I would rather be accountable for making the explanation. But if the people don't know to ask me the question, how can I be accountable? Am I going to go volunteer it? So I think that what Mr. Inhofe is prescribing here is an additional round of accountability, uh, and, and I frankly welcome that rather than the opposite. I have no problem getting up and saying, I made a mistake, or this isn't what I thought it was, I'm removing my name from sponsorship. I cannot conceive of too many times when I would say, but I don't think we should have a debate on something if it's topical and the American people are asking for it uh, and it seems to be the right time. Uh, I would probably say yes to a discharge petition, even though I may vote against the issue. Sure. And I make that distinction as a very important one. Yeah, that, they're all different motives. I can remember Mr. Inhofe's uh, predecessor, Mr. Belcher, at the briefings for the new members saying, discharge petition, don't sign them. Sure. And if you sign it, don't take your name off because then you look like you're a wishy-washy or you're a hypocrite. And in the first place, uh, they shouldn't sign it because it disrupts the process you have in committee. That is as a general rule. Now, the petition still exists as a leverage. And as you search for some ways to keep that balance between orderly process and committees and then having a floodgate open for a competing time with 435 representatives all having their favorite causes, uh, you'll uh, try to uh, leave the petition in a way people with good conscience can sign it and still vote against the bill on final passage. I can absolutely assure you that I can visualize very simply uh, the proposition of somebody coming to me saying, will you sign a discharge petition to get my legislation on the floor? And I said, yes, I will, because I want to vote against it. There, okay. <clears throat> I am willing even though, to... Even though you think it's going to it's going to pass because of that discharge petition, whereas it's something you don't like, you're giving an opportunity for this for this person to get the bill to the floor. So this legislation you think will be bad for the country will pass and will become law. Tony, I, I don't have the wisdom to say what's good or bad for the country. I think, as I said, the collective wisdom of what goes on here is what's... You're, you're being a little cute, if I may say no, it. I'm I'll not. say it nicely. All right. I, I'm not trying to be in any way less than straightforward. If I think it's bad legislation, I want to have the opportunity to get up and say, I think this is bad legislation, persuade my colleagues that this is bad legislation. I can't do that if the darn thing doesn't come into debate. You don't have to if it doesn't come into debate. Yeah, not bad so legislation sure. doesn't get passed. Well, unfortunately, we, did, we talked about secrecy. We so never you get a got chance to, to say it's bad, but this terrible stuff passes and the country is thereby degraded. I've seen it happen in my own time here. Uh, let's take the boat uh, decal fee, the recreation fee. How in the world, after that got voted down in subcommittee, committee, on the House floor, did it suddenly get included in the final legislation in conference committee? Now, we haven't talked about secrecy and conference committee. That's the next one. But let's talk about it at a step at a time. That was bad legislation. The House has been forced to repeal it. The Congress has been forced to repeal it. That was a lousy piece of legislation. But you're not responding to my question. I thought I just did. I don't think you did at all. I mean, you're saying, you're saying that although you're 
you're unutterably opposed to this piece of legislation that you think is bad for the country, you will sign a discharge petition so it can go on the floor and you can argue against it, even though, you know, the process I'm saying, of I'm signing a discharge saying, petition will, makes it I'm possible saying, for us to pass this bad piece of legislation? I'm saying I could visualize being put in that position. I can't imagine a piece of legislation that is bad for this country getting 218 votes seriously. Let's say we couldn't get this budget deficit stuff out of committee. You would have signed a discharge petition to put it on the floor so you could vote against it? You don't have thereby to Thereby enable it to pass? By law, we have to deal with the budget question. So that's a somewhat of an extraneous question. Well, I'm using that just as an example. Well, pick an example where we aren't constrained. Take any other example. <laughs> okay, well, what do you think of what ask me? And I'll try to give an answer. But the, the, the question of the deafness of the committee to act is a good point. But don't forget, each member has the same right to act or not to act. And give the members the ability to do their job. That's all I'm asking. And in that debate is our opportunity to hear to speak, to persuade, and to listen and learn. That's what deliberative democracy is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've been very indulgent. Jim? Shane Hoff, do you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Let, let me just clarify something here. The, the gentleman, I think, in response to an early question by Mr. Goss, is it my understanding now that you folks do support eliminating the secrecy? Is that correct? Yeah, I, I, uh, I let Pete answer for himself. <clears throat> yes, I do. I don't. I don't think in this day and age that when you actually consider this issue, that you can support the secrecy of the signatures. But part of my my urging is that if you started with a discharge procedure now, never having had one, would you make part of that secrecy of the signatures? I think not in this day and age. But you also, in crafting the rule, would consider everything else that's related to that and that's different in this body now than in 1910, 1920, 1930. So at, at the present time, then, the two of you support my effort to make uh, signatures on a discharge petition public? Yes. yes. Okay. I, well, I thank think you very you're much. a hinge of history, and you're going to take your place with Clarence Cannon. <laughs> rule. Well, you know, I have to make this one comment. Uh, if I thought this were doing it as a minority, I have the full intentions of the Republicans taking over this place, 1996, so uh, we're the ones who have to live under this also. Well, that's, that's what's going to be the test that you'll have to think of. You'll have to put on a majority hat so that you'd consider the, exactly. other, the other restrictions in addition to publication. There, may, there should be some other breaks so that this doesn't become the first resort for consideration. It becomes the fourth or fifth or last, but it's not first. Well, uh, there, there seems to be some notion floating around here that discharge, the discharge petition process is something that's easy and quick. It's very difficult. It takes a lot longer to get a name on a discharge petition than it does to get a guy to co-author a bill. For the gentleman, you That's true now, Jim, but we don't know yet. You know, we don't know what it's going to be transformed into. That's what we're concerned about, and how do we deal with it? Nobody's well, arguing, I think, at this point, as you Well, Mr. Chairman, I would only say that uh, I, I'm here to defend uh, my proposition to right. make public the names on a discharge petition. I think once we do that, get that out, we can look at that and then see if the system needs to be refined more, and if so, th then we'll have the majority wishes of the, of the majority elected to Congress to deal with it. Uh, Mr. Overstar made the statement, the statement that uh, there are a lot of people who introduce bills that have, don't have any intention of having a hearing on them or having any kind of uh, progress made on those bills. And uh, this system that is in place in the absence of my reform protects that type of behavior. Is it, do you think that's um, a type of behavior that should be protected? I, you know, I think you'd have to leave to the conscience of every member the reasoning of why he or she sponsors or introduces a bill. Some of them may be commemorative, some of them may be for, uh, as uh, has been said before, for a trial balloon to see what the public support for the lead proposal is. Some of them may be uh, introduced without knowing all the implications and later want to change it. So. Uh, it, bill introduction, I think, is yeah. in the heart of the member. That's a so. So what this might uh, have the effect of doing is making a more thoughtful process before someone just runs in and drops a bill in. Who have to stop and think about it? Do I really want this? Isn't that correct? This yeah, would make it, them more 
accountable to themselves and their own ideals and their own the, desires. The ancient Greeks put it that they said the uh, gods save their most severe disappointment for those who get what they want. <laughs> and yes. uh, if, if a member sure. were held to the accountability that they're going to, what they introduce would become a law, they may be a little more sober about what uh, is dropped in the hopper. Well, I, I appreciate very much that Mr. Chairman, I just make this comment. They, uh, the, I'm, I'm rather surprised and very pleasantly surprised to hear the response to my question. I do appreciate your testimony. We thank you both very much for coming up here. Thank you. Um, let me ask witnesses uh, feelings about about uh, time problems. We have to take out about we have to take off about ten minutes now to go downstairs and vote. It's my intention, unless there's some objection, that we come right back up here in ten minutes and keep going. Mr. Chairman, is there any? Uh, can we do this on a revolving basis? Yeah. Keep it going because we do have witnesses. That okay. Came from, Let's do uh, that. That's Mr. all right. Chairman, I, mean, uh, uh, I, I am going to be making a one-hour speech to a group of majority uh, in place. I would not be here. I would uh, appreciate the fact that you let me be here as, as long as you have. And then come back. And go Thank you. We will continue then. Um, and we'll take turns going down and voting and coming back up and keeping the, keeping the hearing going. I'll okay. uh, we are now, we now do go back to a chap we probably, I suppose, should have st started with perhaps at the very beginning of the day. Uh, Mr. Richard Beth, an analyst in the American National Government for the Congressional Research Service for the Library of Congress. Prior to coming to CRS in 1980, he taught courses in Congress and government at Southwest Missouri State University and at Boston University. He's CRS's expert on the discharge process. Mr. Beth, uh, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for having ceded some time to the previous two gentlemen, and we're looking forward to hearing from you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm acutely aware of the opportunity and the honor of addressing a panel of this historic and august committee as it considers these proposals. Probably more historic than august, but... As a, uh, as a, as a CRS analyst um, in the field of procedure, I spent a lot of time paying attention to what this committee has done. That accounts for my choice of adjectives. Um, as a CRS analyst, uh, in suggesting considerations for the subcommittee in evaluating these proposals, I find I have a rather large assignment, but I thought I could most usefully serve the subcommittee by addressing first uh, considerations relating to the requirement for confidentiality itself. Um, second, some historical considerations relating to the use of the discharge rule generally, and third, um, some points relating to other proposals for amendments to the rule. Uh, Please. Given the current state of the issue, I will only briefly summarize the history of the current practice on confidentiality. My prepared statement gives more detail, and my 1984 CRS report on the subject documents it comprehensively. Uh, that report is available for inclusion in the hearing record if the subcommittee desires. Yes, we intend to do so, sir. Thanks. Um, the House first adopted a discharge rule in 1910. Contrary to some recent published assertions, however, the petition didn't come into the rule until 1924. Until then, any single member could place a motion on the discharge calendar, and that allowed the House to be tied up disposing of a lot of poorly supported discharge motions. Now, the 1910 rule did require that a discharge motion had to be seconded by a majority by tellers. Of course, the House doesn't even have this procedure for teller votes anymore because it was abolished in January, but that procedure did not allow the positions of individual members to be recorded. So an element of non-publicity in that sense was part of the discharge proceedings from the first, even from 1910. Uh, this requirement that the motion be seconded was abolished in 1931, having in effect be, been supplanted by the petition. Now, the original proposal for a petition in 1924 was for members to circulate discharge petitions among their colleagues for signature. But some members in the debate on that rule expressed the fears that the petition might be circulated by staff or by lobbyists and that it would be pressed upon them in the streetcars and in the hotel lobbies. So the House amended the proposed rule to place the petition in the custody of the clerk with the signatures to be printed in the record when the required number was obtained. And I think in the following years, 
cases when the question of confidentiality of signatures came up, the speakers always interpreted this rule as requiring confidentiality. And so I think that confidentiality, while not explicit in the rule, does rest on an interpretation of those provisions. There wouldn't be any point in putting the petition in the custody of the clerk. It wouldn't help to prevent pressures unless the signatures were to be kept confidential. And also I think the provision that members be, uh, that signatures be published when the petition was entered yeah. led to the interpretation that they not be published before the petition was entered. Uh, by entered, I mean it received the full number of signatures. The best example of the speaker ruling on the practice of confidentiality and showing that the rationale was to insulate members from what they called pressures was probably the 1934 statement of Speaker Rainey that there is a reason for not publishing the names. Publishing the names invites people generally to bring pressure on members to sign or to take their names off. I think this is pertinent today because one of the chief arguments now being advanced against confidentiality is that it prevents constituents from holding members accountable for their actions on discharge petitions. And this argument seems to me to be essentially the flip side of the 1924 argument that publicity, and which has also been used today, that publicity would expose members to pressure to sign. These two terms seem to reflect essentially the same thing described in two different ways. One person's accountability, maybe another person's pressure. So I think both sides of the argument are agreeing on what the consequences might be. Now, in the past 60 years, as previous witnesses have mentioned, Congress has shifted its general views about openness in proceedings. Uh, when the discharge petition was established, open markups, open conference meetings, re even recorded voting in the Committee of the Whole were long in the future. So it's now for the subcommittee to decide whether the current proposals are another appropriate step in the same direction or whether they're a step too far. Both sides of this argument about confidentiality also suggest that abolishing confidentiality would likely make the requisite signatures easier to obtain. There didn't seem to be any disagreement about that this morning. Um, because today's rules usually afford the leadership, the majority party leadership, effective control of the House floor agenda. And I mean to include this distinguished committee in that statement. Public access to pending petitions would therefore probably do more to foster demands for expanding than for limiting the agenda. On the other hand, few members who oppose a measure or who consider a discharge petition on it unnecessary would be likely led to sign a petition simply because the act wasn't confidential. Many discharge petitions wouldn't excite a high degree of public interest anyway. And the change would not affect the means available to the leadership for recovering control of the floor agenda in the face of discharge efforts. So the effects of the proposed change on how many petitions get filed or entered might not turn out to be very large, at least in the long run. This might not have all that major an effect. I offer that as a suggestion to the committee. Now, the other argument that's been offered then that has been discussed here this morning for making the signatures public draws an analogy with uh, co-sponsorship. In its starkest form, the argument holds that if you um, if members can declare their public support of a measure while still not signing the petition, well, then they're being hypocritical. That conclusion might, it seems to me, be considered overdrawn. And, and other members have said this too. It seems to me that a member who, other witnesses, I meant, a member who placed value on the importance of the committee system and its deliberations might sincerely favor a measure and yet still want to hear the committee's knowledgeable views before making a judgment. Um, the, uh, Mr. Goss raised the question of signing a discharge petition when to bring something to the floor even if you weren't in favor of the measure. But the question is also on the flip side. Would you decline to sign a discharge petition on a, member you on a measure you favored on the grounds that it still needed committee consideration? The chief function of co-sponsorship is to allow members to stake out positions on issues. Therefore, to make an analogy between co-sponsorship and the discharge procedure might mean that publicizing signatures would encourage members to sign petitions partly for position-taking reasons. Position-taking has highly legitimate legislative functions. 
But a discharge petition has formal consequences in procedural terms for the agenda altering the normal processes of committee and floor deliberation. And the committee may wish to consider whether mixing those two functions might tend to distort or confuse the procedural functions of discharge. One suggestion has been to permit a discharge petition to be filed only when a measure has 218 co-sponsors. This mechanism might help identify co-sponsorship with the position taking functions and thus help reserve discharge for the procedural functions. On the other hand, it might tend to blur the distinction between the two and thereby further the kinds of uh, distortions or confusions that I've suggested before. Um, finally, in this regard, the committee may wish to consider the specific terms of the different current proposals. House Resolution 134 would is stated that it would make the signatures a matter of public record as soon as a petition is filed. It appears that this provision would not direct the publication of signatures. It would only permit parties, including parties outside the House, to inquire about or publish signatures in cases they were interested in. And that provision might turn out to be used primarily by representatives of interests especially concerned with those measures. On the other hand, there's a provision in House Resolution 36, which is also pending before this committee, that would require listing the signatures in the publishing, the signatures in the record, once a petition receives 100 signatures. Another proposal has been to publish all signatures to all petitions, but only after sign a die adjournment. Either of these provisions would arguably also enhance member accountability to the electorate. But the main point I'd offer to the committee is that none of these proposals are contradictory with each other. They might be combined in various ways. That's all I have to say specifically about the confidentiality question. Um, and I would next uh, make a few remarks on the implications of the historic use of the rule. The discharge rule, an issue that runs through the entire history of the discharge rule, and indeed of the House rules in general, is the balance between leadership and rank and file control of the floor agenda. The discharge rule is, the, in practice today, the only form of proceeding in the House by which you could get a measure on the floor if it was over the opposition of the Speaker and the Committee of Jurisdiction and the Committee on Rules. The standing argument against discharge, therefore, has been that it supplants the normal operation of the committee and leadership structures that the House has historically found necessary for structuring its deliberations. The 1910 rule resulted from the revolt by minority Democrats and progressive Republicans against the centralized control of the agenda by Speaker Czar Joe Cannon. The same coalition was responsible for the 1924 revision, which was abandoned in 1925 when the old guard recovered control of the House. But then that 1924 rule was restored in a modified form by the new Democratic majority in 1931. Now, both the 24 and the 31 rules were drafted largely by Representative Charles Crisp of Georgia, a former parliamentarian of the House and the son of a former speaker. His 1931 explanation of his proposal, which is essentially the current rule, and particularly of the provisions for discharge of the Committee on Rules, are not only a gem of clarity, but remarkable to me for its avowed reliance on patriotic principles of democracy and bipartisanship that I think might well commend itself to the attention of Congress today. He seems to have been a kind of crusty, old-fashioned gentleman, and he thought he did a good job. And if the House is now about to make substantial changes in this rule for the first time, maybe, then I think he deserves a moment of recognition. And I hope the subcommittee might be willing to include that 1931 description of the rule in its hearing record. Um, the history of discharge under the CRISP rule is documented in my 1990 CRS report for Congress, which I will also make available for the subcommittee's record if desired. It shows that from 1931 to 1992, 42 discharge petitions received the requisite signatures and were entered on the calendar. By the way, some witnesses may quote slightly different figures. I want to point out that mine are based on the number of different measures subject to discharge, not on the number of separate discharge petitions. For, petitions were entered on 42 measures. My prepared statement presents new figures on the results of those 42 situations, which I will just only summarize right now. 
Discharge efforts are often described as successful when the petition is entered. However, only 22 of the 42 measures ended up reaching the floor under the discharge procedure mainly between 1935 and 1960. 18 of those passed the House, but only three received final approval. Of the other 20 measures, 11 never received floor consideration at all, in spite of having gotten the 200 or the required number of signatures. Nine measures, the remaining nine, ultimately reached the floor, but by means other than discharge. And that includes five of the seven cases in the most recent two decades. The leadership brought each of these nine measures or an alternative to the floor under other procedures before the discharge motion could be offered. Usually the committee on rules reported either the rule on which discharge was sought or an alternative, as I'm sure the chairman knows. In contrast to the measures actually considered by discharge, seven of these nine measures received final approval. That means they became public law or whatever else if they were a, a simple or concurrent resolution. Thus, the discharge rule, the present discharge rule, could be viewed as most effective, not when it's used directly, but when it instigates the leadership to take action by which it also recovers control of the floor agenda. These figures suggest that the House has reached an implicit judgment in favor of a discharge rule that's hard to make it work, but it can be made to work effectively. They also suggest that the rule the House has settled on offers a way for members to get their issues onto the floor agenda, but also enables the leadership to recover control of the processes for considering those issues and the substance of the issues themselves. So the question the measures now before this committee raise can be posed as whether in today's circumstances this balance between leadership and rank and file remains appropriate. The, that's all I wanted to say about the, the second topic I propose to take up, the, the implications of the history of the use of the rule. Then I would conclude by briefly making some remarks about other possible changes in the rule, if that's agreeable. The suggestions for other changes in the discharge rule chiefly affect either signature requirements or the categories of measure subject to discharge or the effects of considering a measure without benefit of committee recommendations. As far as signature requirements are concerned, eight of the 42 measures on which discharge petitions were entered while the present rule has been in effect involve constitutional amendments and seven of those failed to receive the two-thirds vote necessary for the House adoption. Also, from 1931 to 1935, only 145 signatures were required on a discharge petition. Six measures on which discharge petitions were entered reached the floor while this requirement was in effect, and the House agreed to only two of those six. These figures suggest that when a discharge rule permits a petition to be entered by a smaller majority than needed to agree to the measure, it results in the House considering measures that lack sufficient support to pass. The leadership has typically opposed spending the time of the House on such measures. The argument has been made that the House doesn't have time to consider everything. Choices have to be made. Supporters, on the other hand, may argue that negative decisions and shaping future views are also legitimate deliberative functions. But if the House now agrees to reconsider the level of signatures required, it would presumably do so because it has come to an altered judgment about the desirability of permitting petitions to be entered by a different majority than required to pass the measure. On the other hand, if the committee believes that making signatures public will generate large increases in discharge activity, it might think that some increase in the signature requirement could tend to re restore the existing balance in the rule. Another proposal would require that a certain proportion of signatures come from each party. This device could give each party a veto over the other's discharge efforts. In particular, it might prevent discharge on items favored by more than 218 members of the majority party. The House has also historically avoided writing into its rules requirements explicitly based on party. Another possibility is that members might be permitted to add their names to a petition even after it was entered, so the member wouldn't get frozen out when 218 was reached. This practice might reduce pressure on members to sign for fear of being frozen out, as apparently did occur last week. Now, as for alterations on measures subject to discharge, the most extreme restriction would, of course, be to abolish the rule altogether. 
The committee may wish to consider whether this action would eliminate not only a possible avenue of minority party agenda influence, but also a potential mechanism of accountability by the majority party's floor and committee leaders to their own party colleagues. An incent a, a provision which gives them an implicit incentive to take up members desired by colleagues. For example, since 1931, 20 petitions on which dis 20 measures on which discharge was attempted have come to the floor through the regular procedures even when the petition was not entered. And 10 of those became public law or otherwise received final approval. So I think that shows the potential for use of the rule implicitly as an in as as a mechanism of accountability. A less sweeping change would require all discharge efforts to file petitions both on the legislative measure and then on a special rule for its consideration. This procedure might make discharge more complicated without decreasing the likelihood of success. It just gives more hoops to jump through. If members have to sign twice instead of once, they probably will. An alternative, first proposed in 1910 by Representative Swager Shirley of Kentucky, who later chaired the Appropriations Committee, might be to permit discharge only of special rules, retaining only the second method of discharge that Crisp considered the preferable one. This change would prevent a committee from insulating itself from discharge by reporting. It would ensure that every discharge attempt presented an appropriately designed procedure for consideration of the measure involved. It would also continue to permit the Committee on Rules to use its practice of preempting discharge proceedings by reporting an alternative special rule. And in that way, would tend to facilitate the use of discharge as a means of leadership responsiveness to member agenda preferences, rather than its use to precipitate struggles for control of the floor. The current rule also permits, prohibits action on a subject by discharge more than once in a session. In the conditions of today's legislative process, this prohibition might be extended from the single session to the entire Congress. Finally, several suggestions have been made to deal with the difficulties of considering legislation without benefit of committee recommendations. One suggestion would require that when a petition is entered, its initiators supply information covering matters usually found in a committee report, which would be then published as a House document. And the Committee of Jurisdiction might also be invited to contribute its views to that document. That would give the members more of a basis for decision. Another approach mentioned this morning would be to lengthen the time between entry of a petition and the time when the discharge motion may first be offered. Under the present rule, in other words, discharge motion offered on the floor. Under the present rule, a maximum of one month is possible between entry of the petition and making the discharge motion. That is, that's the longest the minimum can be. But in 1925 to 1931, we had a very strict discharge rule in effect, which in fact wasn't a discharge rule. It only provided for motions to instruct committees to report. It allowed those motions to be made only on one day a month, and the committee was then instructed to report within 15 days. If we count those as legislative days, such a proceeding would give the committee one to two months for hearings, markup, and reporting after the petition was entered. A rule of this sort might once again foster committee responsiveness to member agenda preferences while maintaining overall committee and leadership control of the procedure. It might also be possible to offer the extra time only if the committee was actively proceeding with the measure. Those were all the considerations I wish to offer. I am aware that I've taken longer in presenting them, far longer than an elected member of the House would be afforded to present an amendment on the floor. And so I can only hope that the um, considerations I've offered have repaid the committee's. <laughs> well, I, I, I only hope that the considerations I've presented, presented adequately repay the committee's kind indulgence. We thank you, Mr. Beth, very, very much, um, both for giving us a little of the history of this procedure and some very helpful suggestions for what we might do with it. Uh, I, myself, am going to withhold asking any questions at this time only because I'm anxious to hear from some of the other folks who've been invited, who've been waiting patiently all day. But 
David, you're more than welcome to ask some questions if you care to, sir. Tony also asked me not to ask any questions, but uh, let me. Uh, I asked you let privately. Me, I didn't ask you publicly. Let me. Uh, let me uh, thank you for the testimony and say that I, I apologize. I was uh, down at the White House on this NAFTA issue, and the reason that I uh, was not here this morning for the opening of the hearing, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, is that I was tied up with your president, um, our president. And uh, let me let me say that. Uh, that your testimony is, is very helpful. And you, you raised what is one of the key words on this whole issue, and that is accountability. You, you mentioned that, and it seems to me that that really is the motivating force behind the attempt to, uh, to make this uh, public. And I, I don't think that any of us want to end the opportunity for committee action to take place. I think the goal is to encourage committee action when it hasn't taken place. And uh, so uh, with that, I, I will simply uh, thank you for your testimony and appreciate the fact that you're here, and I look forward to meeting another witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. appreciate Chairman. the distinguished ranking minority member's comments. <laughs> I thank you very much for your testimony, and, and, and it's, uh, we'll uh, be looking at it very closely. And uh, I feel like, Tony, that uh, we have so many people here that uh, rather than going to any extensive questioning at this time, I'd like to hear from the other witnesses. Thank you very the much. The committee is aware, and, and I thank the distinguished chairman, uh, that the CRS analysts will continue to be at the committee's disposal uh, yes. later on if, if you want to pursue it in yeah, that We fashion. appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, next two chaps, I think we'll, since they know each other, come up perhaps as a panel. Uh, Mr. Thomas E. Mann is the Director of Governmental Studies for the Brookings Institution. He is co-director of the Renewing Congress Project. Mr. Mann has taught courses at Johns Hopkins University, Georgetown University, and the University of Virginia. Mr. Norm Ornstein is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. Mr. Ornstein also serves as a co-director of the Renewing Congress Project. He's an elections consultant to CBS News and a contributor to the McNeil Lara News Hour. <clears throat> Both gentlemen, again, this was the case of uh, our earlier panel, uh, have come often at our, at our request to, to help us out and to help out other committees. And we are grateful again for your having taken some time out of your busy private lives to come up here and speak to us today about this particular matter. Do you have any, who wants to go first? Tom, Mr. Mann? Okay. If you'd uh, like, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You I'm happy else, to be uh, here. I actually see this as finally as an opportunity to respond to questions put to me by Mr. Dreyer on two occasions when I testified here before he is. We just got him in from the, the Joint House. Committee on the Organization of Congress. He noted that there was no discussion of the discharge petition in our Renewing Congress reports quite accurately. Uh, it turned out at the time as we were grappling what, with what we thought to be the important problems the institution confronted this was not high or medium or even low on the list and therefore wasn't in our report but I used the invitation from this committee to uh, review the matter uh, and it's frankly been a very educational experience uh, both prior to coming here and to listening to the to the testimony uh, uh, this morning I take the sincerity of, uh, of the sponsor of H.R.E.S. Uh, 134 and its supporters uh, as absolutely genuine. Um, but I have to tell you, I, I conclude that there is a real mismatch um, uh, between the need for this rules change and its political visibility and attractiveness uh, uh, right now. Uh, as I look at it, I really think it's a solution in search of a problem. Unbelievably attractive, in fact so attractive that I think I agree with the chairman that it's unlikely the House will not move, uh, move in this direction, but I, I really do believe it is more a political act than, a, than an act of uh, to correct a problem within this legislative body, and my worry, quite frankly, is that though it's unneeded Needed, its adoption may lead to a set of changes, some of which we can't now anticipate that will alter the nature of this body. In some respects, the, the debate and handling of this issue is emblematic of what happens all too often in this institution, which is someone outside presses a hot button, uh, there is an instant mobilization 
Members get scared. Many of them uh, who haven't been involved in developing the legislation don't really have a clue as to what it's, what it's about, but they quickly figure out what the politically safe position is. And I'll tell you, there's no question that to be politically safe on this issue is to be for accountability and openness and, and sunshine. There's, there's no question about it. So my own guess is that while if you were able to ask members sort of privately and honestly and sincerely whether they think this is a needed solution to identifiable problems, a majority would say no. But put on the record, uh, given the nature of the political debate on this issue, a majority will say yes. And in some respects, by signing uh, Mr. Inhofe's discharge petition, they already have. I think in some way, the your reaction to this proposal is based in part on your image of the institution and its problems. There is one uh, image which is that this is a body that is insulated and unresponsive to public sentiment. That it's a that it's a complex, hierarchical uh, body where autocratic actions by party leaders uh, uh, and committee chairmen frustrate the will of uh, the majority in the country. And therefore, what needs to be done is, is to make changes in that system to allow this body to be more representative. That's, that's sort of one view of the institution and its problem. There's another view. The, the other view is that the problem with this institution is that it's hypersensitive to public opinion, that what goes on in this body all too often, often is pandering, fanning uh, public passions, and too little engaging, educating, bargaining. That is so much in this body is geared toward how it will look outside and uh, too many members too often have too many incentives to tell people what they want to hear rather than tell people what they need to hear. It's easier and safer to respond to the moment. And right now, the, the trio of Perot, Limbaugh, and Bartley uh, has, has mounted a campaign outside the institution that so much has the rhetorical advantage, kind of like the rhetorical advantage now enjoyed, I think, by the opponents of the NAFTA treaty, that, that uh, it may well be impossible to, uh, to overcome that. No. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do think, uh, basically, that a routine and perfectly reasonable legislative procedure has become conflated now with other party and ideological agendas and ways that confuse the public and, and threaten to undermine uh, the deliberative quality of, uh, of this institution. I think most unfortunate is the portrayal of Congress as closed, secretive, dominated by committee chairman, unresponsive uh, to the public. I know of no serious uh, student of Congress who believes this characterization has any basis uh, in reality. Congress has its share of problems. And Norman Ornstein and I, my colleague here, have spent the better part of the last year trying to diagnose some of those problems and prescribe a set of solutions that would deal constructively with them. But I think I can assure you that insulation from an unresponsiveness to public sentiment is not a feature of uh, of the contemporary Congress. Indeed, the Congress and its leaders today are less equipped institutionally to cool the temporary passions of the public than ever before. I would submit that the framers of our system would be appalled to see how campaign finance practices, negative campaigning, orchestrated grassroots lobbying, and television and radio have made it more difficult for members to do what is politically unpopular in their districts, but but right for the country. Fact is, majorities rule in the House of Representatives. By the way, the same cannot be said of the Senate, where anonymous holes and filibusters regularly frustrate uh, majorities. Virtually all serious legislative proposals that have genuine support among a majority of members find their way to the floor. The discharge petition is an important, though seldom used, safety valve uh, <clears throat> to ensure consideration of legislation when a majority of members, without the threat of political pressure, believe the leadership is inappropriately thwarting action. 
It was never and never should be designed as another means by which outside groups can pressure members into forcing action on a piece of legislation. It was a way of dealing with the arbitrary exercise of power within, within the chamber. Uh, none of us know what this change would or will lead to, and I don't propose to uh, have an absolute uh, fix on that. My worry is that it could lead to a routinization of the, of the discharge petition as an alternative agenda setting item, uh, which I think would diminish the deliberative quality of this institution. It, I believe it would encourage government by plebiscite, in spite of the discussion earlier that suggested that was uh, an extreme view of its consequences. I can imagine the attractiveness of submitting discharge petitions for 50 percent percent cuts in congressional salary uh, and the pressure to get members to uh, to embrace that. In fact, I can imagine all kind of mischievous proposals coming forward. There was a discussion earlier today about, about political cover and how awful political cover is. I don't think political cover is, an, is really an, an awful thing. In fact, I think the whole nature of presidential leadership and of congressional leadership is to structure choices before the members in way that will encourage the emergence of national general interest over local and special interest. That's part of what the legislative agenda setting process is all about. I, I would commend to you a scholarly analysis, uh, a book called The Logic of Congressional Action by Doug Arnold of Princeton University that lays this out. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not undemocratic. It's responsible and absolutely necessary in a democratic system where, as James Madison told us many years ago, your job is not to simply reflect public sentiment, it's to refine and enlarge that sentiment. Now, I understand the surface appeal of this resolution. Few members of either party are comfortable defending a procedure that condones secrecy and hypocrisy. But House Republicans are drawn to it for another reason. It is not easy to be a permanent minority in a majoritarian legislature. It is particularly frustrating in times of deep partisan division, when opportunities for bipartisan cooperation are limited, and when the majority uses its control of the Rules Committee to limit amendments by the minority and avoid politically embarrassing votes. In our Renewing Congress reports, we have recommended procedural changes to give the minority party and individual members meaningful opportunities to offer alternative versions of legislation. But I strongly believe that revising the discharge petition with HR, HRES 134 is not the way to deal with these frustrations. House Republicans, as well as Democrats, have a stake in preserving the deliberative character of this institution. At the same time, and in conclusion, I oppose efforts to dilute the current discharge rule by requiring a supermajority or by some other means. This resolution should be defeated on the merits. The present discharge rule makes sense and works. The status quo should be reaffirmed. I realize that in these populist times when Congress bashing is the rage, this position is neither popular with the public nor comforting the members. But I believe it is the wisest course for this committee in the House to take. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Let's go to Mr. Ornstein for a minute. David, you question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I also want to uh, start by acknowledging uh, Mr. Dreyer, who, uh, uh, besides uh, his position on uh, this subcommittee, is also a co-chairman of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. And over the years, uh, while um, uh, Mr. Inhofe is getting an enormous amount of national attention uh, on this issue, and uh, he, of course, has worked extraordinarily hard on it, uh, I don't think anybody has uh, pushed this issue more uh, than Mr. Dreyer. And even though uh, I disagree with him, and he has pushed me to try to move in a different direction, directly, indirectly, nicely, and otherwise. Um, and we agree on, uh, I think, the overwhelming majority of other areas where we're looking towards congressional reform, including all the areas that Tom suggested where clearly, and, and, and uh, NAFTA, where clearly there are uh, uh, 
very legitimate reasons to uh, provide the minority with rights uh, that they deserve that ought to be a part of this process. Uh, we part company on this one. I have been sitting here all morning and hearing all the stirring talk uh, about uh, openness and accountability and uh, members having the courage to stand up and say where they stand on important issues. Uh, Mr. Solomon, who also has been in the forefront of this issue, was particularly stirring. My heart was fluttering as he spoke. And I look forward to the time, perhaps next year, uh, uh, when uh, votes on leadership issues in the Republican conference, uh, which have always been closed, and we have not known how individuals have voted, and for years we've always wanted to know. And we know there's a tremendous hypocrisy that takes place where members say they support different individuals for leadership positions and then don't vote that way because they're secret. That all the members of this committee are going to move shoulder to shoulder, I am sure, to make sure that this bastion of hypocrisy and secrecy will be opened up and we'll have roll call votes on leadership positions. So that I'm sure will be the next crusade for the uh, guardians of openness uh, and uh, accountability. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Yogi Berra, if uh, James Madison were alive today, he'd be spinning in his grave. Uh, <laughs> And that would probably be true as well of James Burnham, who was uh, perhaps the father of modern conservatism and of the National Review, who wrote the book Congress and the American Tradition, who would be appalled, frankly, at this kind of populist move made by people in the name of his beloved conservatism, which would go against virtually everything that he believed was the case. And he believed the framers wanted to be the case with this institution. Uh, to take what Tom said and move it to just a slightly different level, the framers really did recognize that there were two models of of democracy. The plebiscitary model, which is one where Congress or a legislature or a democracy would reflect public opinion just like that, reflect the passions, and basically not have a process of representative government. And the deliberative kind of democracy, the Republican small r kind of democracy that the framers intended to put in place. And they wanted very much to guard against all different kinds of tyranny, including the tyranny of the majority, and to build in lots of safeguards to make sure that you could guard against a plebiscitary form of democracy. There are lots of ideas that have majority support that should but not be enacted, that need to go through a lot of filtering process, or that need to be killed. Some of those ideas may be popular but bad. Others, frankly, may be popular but good but simply don't meet the test of trade-offs that any legislature has to make when there are limited resources to go around or when the timing might not fit in a particular issue. Now, a couple of those, for example, might well be removing the earnings test on Social Security without finding a comparable source of revenue uh, because undoubtedly it will be a drain on the Treasury. This is a very good idea. It's an idea of uh, justness, but it's not going to meet the test unless you can come up with something comparable that will add to the revenues. The same for the proposals of a couple of years ago to cut the payroll tax. I happen to believe the payroll tax is a wrong form of taxation. It's, a, uh, it's a, an onerous uh, and particularly regressive form of taxation that taxes jobs. I'd like to see it cut, but not without substituting some other form of tax that's going to be better for the country. In many instances, we have a process of trade-offs that are the essence of a legislative process, and in particular the essence of a committee system, where you've got to make delicate compromises and not allow things that are good because sometimes uh, good things have to be balanced to create something that serves the public interest. What I fear out of this process, this small change that seems trivial in many ways on the surface, is that it is going to create a great deal of difficulty to continue to have the kind of trade-off and deliberative process that we've had where you can put things together and bring them out that represent a balancing test of interest because balances will no longer be allowed in this case. Now, it may be that this will not result in any dramatic change. And on the one hand, Mr. Inhofe says, well, a discharge petition is so difficult to obtain now, there's no reason to believe that dramatic things will happen. But I quote Mr. Inhofe, this is the most re important reform in the history of Congress. If nothing significant is going to happen here, then obviously this is not the most important reform in the history of Congress. More important, for example, than opening up markups where bills have been put together in committees. He obviously believes and expects that this is going to result in a large number of significant pieces of legislation, constitutional amendments, and rules changes that have not been enacted into law up to this point because majorities' wills have been thwarted being enacted into law in the future. 
And I suspect he's right on that score. I don't believe we're going to open up the floodgates here and that every piece of legislation is going to emerge by discharge petition from now on. What I do believe is that the discharge petition, which has been and has been intended to be the last resort in the legislative process, will become the first resort in many instances. And I believe that interest groups that are aggrieved in this process because they don't get what they want in the, during the balancing stage are going to have a neat way to come around the next time to get redress of grievances when they don't have to be considered as part of a larger issue, balancing the budget or reducing the deficit, for example, but can find a way to be considered on their own narrow grounds of their equity or an issue as they devise it and define it. And I suspect, for example, that when we have the health care issue come up, if it does pass, one of the key questions here in any health care reform is going to be what gets into or doesn't get into the minimum package of benefits that's available to everybody. Unless we totally bust the budget in this country, we're going to have to put some limits on what goes into a uh, minimum package of benefits that will be available to all Americans under a health care package. That means that some interest groups, some professions out there are not going to get everything that they want. And I will guarantee you that if we get a health care package that passes, the following year, probably before the following year, we are going to have bills introduced and discharge petitions pushed very hard for the chiropractors and the optometrists and the acupuncturists and every other group that doesn't get what it wants out of this minimum package of benefits, demanding equity and redress of grievances, and all of their patients will be coming forward. You're against medicine as we practice it, and it's going to be extremely difficult to resist. That's resistible if you consider it as part of an overall package. It isn't going to be under those circumstances. We may start with some of the measures that uh, are now introduced uh, in, in the discharge route, including uh, perhaps votes on a line item veto or votes on uh, a uh, term limit measure. But before very long, it's going to be the notch babies, it's going to be uh, the acupuncturists, it's going to be all of those groups, the real estate people who didn't get what they wanted separately out of the deficit reduction package, coming back for it again. And they're going to be framed in a very different way. What Pete Robinson said earlier, I think, has enormous relevance. This is a very different system today than existed 60 years ago or 80 years ago or 85 years ago when these rules changes began. We are now in a system where the ability of both radio talk show hosts, sophisticated grassroots organizations and others to frame issues in narrow, simple terms, which we see all the time in California with initiatives and referendums, by the way, now is something that is a dominant feature of this process. I can't tell you the number of members of the House who have said to me privately that they see a real trade-off here and they really see the difficulty in this particular issue. But in their districts, it's being framed for them in simple terms. Are you for or against secrecy? And their answer is, how can I say I'm against secrecy? I can't get into the complexity or the subtlety of this issue. I just have to sign this petition. That's going to happen over and over again. And as Hyde Murray, who was perhaps the most distinguished minority staff member who served up here over the last 30 or 35 years, said, beware the law of unintended consequences. We don't know what they'll be, but I suspect that we are opening a Pandora's box here that is going to be difficult, if not impossible, to close. There may well be no provision that we can make to change this that will provide an adequate balance and we'll all come to regret it uh, and uh, the deficit is not going to go down as a result of this change it's going to go up thanks thanks to both of you for your for your comments um, generally speaking I agree with, with both of you but we're faced with a question of course of what do we do at this point um, mr. Mann, I guess wants us to defeat uh, the resolution I suspect I don't know that that's not in the cards uh, if, if, in fact, I'm correct about that, uh, what do we do? Uh, let's assume for purposes of argument that uh, things will be made public. Um, do we change, do, do we change the uh, procedure somewhat? Do we do something in order to ensure that there is subsequent, although limited, in time, at least, so it's got to come to the floor, committee uh, discussion or deliberation on the matter? Or do we continue to treat uh, uh, discharge bills as uh, as they currently are are treated. See, I think the possibilities now exist for committees to respond to successful discharge petitions. And while you might <coughs> try to codify that in the law, you mean under existing you, rule? Yes, you really aren't dealing with the major problem and consequence, which is a change in the strategy used by 
those outside the institution. Agreed to completely. To I, don't, I don't know. Canada. I don't know what so, we can do about that. So, you? but I guess what I'm what I'm telling you is, um, and I know it's not very helpful because you're supposed to have something. You can't beat something with nothing. But I'm I'm arguing now. One of your responsibilities is the as the committee deliberating on this is to is to speak the truth to the House and Let's tell assume. them okay. tell them Fair what's enough. going on here. Fair enough. Assume we do and assume we lose. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I part company with Tom a little bit here. I, I think the current procedures are not going to be adequate to, to the task. The problem is that if you have the 218 signatures and you move uh, on the floor when the date and time comes and you move the previous question, uh, then, uh, as we will see in this particular instance, uh, Mr. Inhofe can get a vote uh, on what he's asked for without significant debate, without alternatives being offered. Yeah. And that can happen. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, you ought to, if you are not going to be able to succeed here, go back and think through at least a better balanced test here that may well be having, uh, if a discharge petition is successful, requiring uh, within a certain reasonable period of time that that bill be discharged from a committee with a rule that requires an, uh, a, a, uh, an amendment uh, to whatever the committee might offer, that is the original bill as offered. Not necessarily in order of amendment, perhaps with other amendments being considered so that you can get that up or down vote, but make sure that it's in the context of at least some committee deliberative process. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel very much that, that way myself. Uh, the one great problem with that, if in fact one sees it as a problem, is that if you, if you ensure that sensible committee deliberation will become part of the discharge petition process, you give an even stronger argument to those who are pushing for signing the discharge petition. Because you can say, look, I just signed it, but uh, it's not going to come out on the floor in its current lousy shape. I know it wasn't very well thought out, and the bill is introduced as stupid, and I would never vote for that. Uh, but if we, if we do uh, discharge it, get the 218 signatures, it does go back to the committee of such and such, original jurisdiction, for 30 days or 60 days. It does come back out with a, with a rule of one sort or another. We will be allowed to vote on it. But meanwhile, the, the public will have some chance to have some input and the committee will have some chance to deliberate. So uh, why shouldn't anybody, you know, what, what excuse does anybody at that point have for not signing, for not signing a... Uh, well, I, you know, I, I have a lot of sympathy with Tom's position because I, I don't think anything we do now is going to uh, close this box again. That's right. The fact is if you have uh, somebody with a bill to provide redress for the notch babies or to allow the acupuncturist in and his full uh, partners in the, uh, boy, I'm mean, going to get letter, letters from the acupuncturist now. <laughs> they join the ones that I got from the Notch Babies the last time. Uh, that once that's there, or to go back to one where we had a successful discharge and what I think ended up being a bad change in public policy, the uh, uh, withholding of uh, interest uh, and uh, 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 dividend income, where you had this populist appeal and uh, a fright campaign that began, and it was, you're going to snatch the savings away from the widows and the orphans, give us back what we want. If you do something like that, or that, that gets introduced, there's nothing that you can do Everybody that seems can offer as an amendment that's going to make it better, particularly. People are always concerned about notch babies, but I suspect that that, that may not be a, a good example, because if we, for example, let's say a notch baby bill of some sort or another were, were discharged and went back to the Committee of Original Jurisdiction, I guess it's Ways and Means Committee, they take a look at it, it comes back out through the Rules Committee and goes to the floor, I can only assume that even though we make an order, even the original portion, which says, you know, change this and bring the benefits up, we will also require that the money for it be found somewhere, that we yeah. raise some taxes or cut some other benefits, which will keep, present people with a very difficult problem. And uh, and I'm back with, with my friend Mr. Goss. Uh, I mean, I think that'll resolve itself. But there are a lot of other things that won't. Yeah. I just I just think, the poor, the, I don't mean to pick on you, Norm, but yeah. I think uh, everybody keeps talking about notch babies. I don't worry about that one nearly so much as I do about other things which don't which don't have any uh, which don't have any sort of trade-offs on the other side which will make it more difficult for people to, to vote for them but I do think any efforts to codify an elaborate elaborate
generate procedures to deal with the new publicity given to this will have the effect of further routinizing uh, the procedure uh, That's true. and encouraging people. The reality is that the discharge petition has worked well in the past in prodding committees and leaders to uh, to report out legislation. In fact, as, as Mr. Beth reported, that's its most frequent route of impact, not so much in having that that uh, legislation pass immediately on the floor off the discharge petition, but getting the leadership and committee and uh, in the House to respond, I think, I think that's what you're going to have to depend on. You're going to make life much, much more difficult for rank and file members and and for leaders because they're going to be putting out fires uh, on a regular basis. But I don't think you really help that process by codifying a referral to a committee for a certain period of time and the like. Except that you want to ensure as best you can that if in fact this procedure is used more than it has been in the past, and I suspect it will be, and more successfully, more often than in the past, that at least you you ensure that there's some kind of deliberative legislative comment and, and, and deliberation on the bill, and some, and even more important, if I may say so, uh, some opportunity for the public to make its views known other than through mm -hmm. the talk shows, whatever it may have been that instigated the thing in the, in, in the first place. So that when you finally do get to vote for a bill on the floor or some alternatives or some amendments, that somebody's put some thought into it, and you've got to, if you end up with something, it's a pretty decent legislative product instead of something which uh, may not have well have been, may not well, may well not have been thought out, thought well of. Uh, the, the greatest the fear that, that I have here is that we're going to end up with the equivalent of the referendum process. Mm -hmm. Something comes up and it's environmental. This is the environmental referendum. Whatever is in it. And of course, that's under that gonna, process, that's what we're get. you yeah. get horrific debate, which does not focus on real issues or trade-offs, and no opportunity for amendment. And what I fear here with no change, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a, really a couple of lousy alternatives that now face us. But what I fear here is that we're going to end up with an up or down vote on secrecy, an up or down vote on environmentalism, an up or down vote on reform. You're for it or you're against it. Without, in the committee process at least, you can move away from that kind of rhetoric to a real consideration of some of the shades of gray, the subtleties, the trade-offs, the difficulties that you can't in the public arena and that you can't if this gets pushed simply to a vote without going through what we normally have, including without going through the rules process. Uh, you, you may end up encouraging or legitimizing these things more, but I'm not sure which alternative is worse. I agree completely. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for the very uh, helpful testimony. And I, I do share your concerns um, on uh, in some areas. I think that the fact that we're sitting here today demonstrates that this process does work in that the Committee of Jurisdiction, uh, the Rules Committee, and this subcommittee have decided to look into uh, into this issue. And what I was saying to Professor Beth earlier is that we want to encourage the committee process itself. Now, I'd like to follow on uh, Tony's initial statement to you. Let's assume that this is going to pass and that we are going to see the signatures on discharge petitions made public, which I happen to support. And I think that we, I, I think that we will have some problems with it, but I think that on balance, increasing a level of accountability in this institution, and you all recognize the perspective from which I and Mr. Goss and others on this committee and others in the minority are coming from. Uh, we, have, we are looking for every route that we possibly can to try and, and you know, we deal with closed rules constantly, and you all know the figures as well as I do about the, the numbers of closed rules which have limited our opportunity for debate over the years. Uh, the history of those. I mean, you're well aware of that. So we're looking for ways to respond to the treatment that we have gotten here. And it seems to me that as we look at this question now, we want the committee process to work better than it has. Most all Americans have heard of how committee chairmen have kept legislation bottled up in committee that even many members on that committee want to see uh, happen. Uh, you know, the fact that we see discharge petitions uh, made public does not mean that the committee process can't work. And uh, what it means is basically we can't, we won't see committee chairmen and a select few preventing uh, a wide range of members from uh, pursuing 
pursuing issues that they want to pursue. I don't want to see special interest groups determine the outcome of legislation here and to, to simply gin up support for a particular issues. And I am concerned about the possibility of that happening. But on the other hand, we have got to come up with ways in which we can respond to the concerns that you all raise and at the same time be more accountable to the American people. And what I'd like to, to hear from you is what recommendations would you have, assuming that this is made public, to deal with the concerns that you uh, appropriately raise? Well, certainly the, the committee system is working at one level here. At another level, though, it's not going to work because the fact is, at least in my judgment, we're going to do something that's really bad and that's going to backfire. And now all we can do is try and clean up after the mess that's been created because the committee system has not worked in that sense. And I'm afraid we're going to have large numbers of additional messes. Uh, uh, if not huge numbers, we'll have at least enough significant ones and ones that really will hurt uh, that, uh, that we're all going to regret this. And I suspect uh, there'll be some uh, populist efforts in the trade uh, area that uh, you will uh, mobilize to fight against, uh, uh, maybe very uh, uh, much uh, at the beginning of this process, uh, uh, once once we unleash it and once we get it underway. Uh, now, otherwise, as you know, um, beyond what we've talked about here, and we are really of, of we're both of two minds. I think about how we respond to this particular problem now. Whether you just say, "All right, it's done, and let's not encourage it anymore, or do anything more about it," or try and do something that creates a little bit better trade-off to guard against the worst case of simply an up or down vote on something defined in the worst terms without uh, real deliberation or amendment. Um, uh, that's a difficult one. Otherwise, as you know, both of us in the Renewing Congress Project have supported a whole series of areas that respond to the minority concern here. And there's no question that a good part of what's happening with this particular issue, it's too bad it's been framed in partisan terms, but it is, it has been. 173 of the 175 Republicans signed on here, and I think a large number of them for exactly the reasons that you suggested, out of frustration, out of a feeling that the, that the ability to get votes on the floor on minority alternatives hasn't been there. We've been through this in, in, uh, in this committee and in the joint committee before, and I think there are a number of areas where we ought to turn for uh, additional changes, including uh, the, the right to votes, uh, and including a motion to recommit with instructions on the floor and in, in uh, other areas. I wish, frankly, that we had turned to those which I think could provi provide a real trade-off and where we would have worked closely with you and, frankly, against the majority party, or at least many members of the majority party, and against their strong opposition in many cases, and not turn to something like this, which I think is not going to serve your interests in the end. You know, I find it very interesting that when, when you all testified uh, before our joint committee, uh, I mean, I remember you said that you'd get back to me on it, and, and this is it, but... Uh, you also, at that point, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, seem to be sort of ambivalent on this or undecided. And what has played a role in now moving from what I inferred was kind of an undecided position on your part when you testified before the committee to this very strong opposition to making public the names on the discharge petition? Uh, I think it's only fair to say that I was the one who was uh, who had no real substantive response. Norman uh, uh, came out in opposition and really used, I remember vividly, the Notch uh, example in the, uh, in, the, in, the mm -hmm. in the testimony. It, uh, uh, I'm sure one effect is, uh, once again, to see how uh, a campaign generated outside the body that is symbolic and non-substantive can, uh, can run through this chamber. Just a reminder of what happens, how Ross Perot puts the fear of God in, in members of, uh, of Congress, J just to see what can happen when you appear to be on the unpopular side of an issue. I think it's been a sobering experience to see the way this has developed over the last couple of months and, and how Mr. Inhofe has become the champion of reform on a matter that, as I began with, I think is completely out of line with its substantive importance to the House. So that was the occasion for me 
looking seriously at it, and, and then as I began to see how it fit with the, the theory of Congress that we outlined in our report, and the importance of deliberation and encouraging legislating as opposed to position taking, you know, to encourage bargaining and negotiation, to get genuine alternatives aired in committee and on the floor, all of it leads uh, quite naturally to opposition to this. In fact, I venture to say that uh, virtually every congressional scholar in universities around this country would, op would oppose this based on the, on the logic that we've, uh, we've tried to lay, lay out here. Let, let me but, respond to that too, uh, David, if you don't mind. I mean, I, I've never been ambivalent about this. Um, I did not uh, view it as a huge issue back when it was not in the public eye. Frankly, I think it's a much bigger issue now, and uh, you, you can see some of the reasons why. I will guarantee you that the radio talk show hosts who've been scrambling, the 69 that Mr. Inhofe uh, uh, responded to and went on during the recess, have not spent a great deal of time thinking about congressional procedures. And I'll bet if we gave most of them a politics 101 test, on congressional procedures, that 69 of the 69 would fail. Why have they suddenly gotten so interested in the discharge petition? Were these people interested, for example, when the big secrecy debates of the 70s were going on over opening up markup sessions? I don't think so. They're interested now because they see an opportunity to mobilize many of those. I'm not talking about Mr. Inhofe, who I think has genuine, deep feelings, as you do, and as you have expressed, you expressed long before this became a major uh, public issue. Outside groups now see this as a great vehicle to get their way to, in effect, bludgeon the institution. And most of them, it's not, we're not talking about the, uh, the blow-dried lobbyists, the Gucci crowd here in Washington so much. But some of that Gucci crowd, I will tell you, is now making a lot of money doing grassroots sophisticated campaigns using these same techniques. What's happened now is that this has become a huge cause celeb for other reasons. And now I fear it much more than I did when we had our initial more scholarly you discussions. You all may think that I lack any influence in this institution, but when I twice ask Tom Mann a question, <laughs> you can't get an answer out of him, I just call on my colleague, Mr. Innes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? <laughs> Uh, again, I, I thank you both for your, your work on this. And I agree that uh, the popularity, and, and just mention the word secrecy, you, you know, uh, and Congress in the same sentence, you know, it sends off all kinds of uh, missiles. Uh, as one who's had my office picketed by uh, the Ross Perot people and uh, about a week in a row, I guess, and, and then culminating in a meeting, uh, I'm convinced now that from people I talk to that uh, that uh, the names will remain public because the, uh, people just don't want to be facing that pressure day in and day out. But, uh, but what I say, if they can't withstand pressure on that level, how are they going to withstand further pressure on any other future discharge petition may come down the line? So I think that we were starting here that the names will be made public. Now what do we do to safeguard against uh, <clears throat> some of these uh, matters that may come before us uh, without putting, uh, you know, raising, say, the super majorities, uh, two-thirds, which should look like we were just trying to drag our feet on it. But I mean, just to be responsible and dealing with, uh, now that the names will be public, what can we do further to make sure that we've got a packet together that would work and not be seen as uh, uh, just throwing roadblocks in the way of reform, quote unquote, government. Um, Mr. Moakley, I agree it would be a mistake to try to make it more difficult to introduce or to pass discharge petitions, and those ideas, I think, ought to be set aside. The, the only questions have to do with the form in which the names are publicized. Are they publicized at the end of a Congress or immediately as the petition uh, uh, signatures are being uh, uh, gained? That's one issue. The other issue is whether you actually include in the rules uh, a period of time for the committee of jurisdiction to uh, consider the discharge petition and alternatives and report back to the House and to make sure that that committee's, the fruits of the committee's deliberation are included along with the initial discharge petition. Uh, the longer, if you were to do it, the, the downside is you routinize the 
process and you'll encourage people to do it, but if you do it, the longer period of time for genuine deliberation with, without frustrating the will of the majority to have this matter called up would be called for. So more legislative days rather than fewer, ensuring that it's still dealt with in the same session of the, of the Congress would, uh, would be advisable. Let me tell you an alternative that you have. An alternative is you report out a, a negative recommendation. It's very unpopular for you to do so, and you may not want to defend uh, your position on, quote, secrecy and, and openness, but you report it out with all of the qualms that we've discussed here today, and you see what happens. Uh, you see what kind of an effect it has on the discharge petition. See if it turns in the direction we worry. If it does, uh, you come back in the new Congress and, uh, and propose some, uh, some changes to it. Well, I think you can see the editorials all over the country that have, you know, just use the word secrecy and you know unveil the secrecy in the Congress and don't say anything about what happens in the Senate where they've got a one-man hold and filibuster you know that's okay but because the names aren't public on a discharge petition so I, as I say I think I'm talking to the members that uh, the battle for the publication of the names is I, I think that's a given I think we start from there uh, but I still want to protect and uh, the, the, the institution uh, from taking what used to be the court of last resort, making it the court of first resort. I mean, I, I just think it may be simpler to go the, the discharge petition route to get legislation to the floor than it would be through the committee process. So let me raise one other uh, possibility here, Mr. Chairman, and I must confess I haven't really thought about this very much, but as you were talking and as we were working through how we could keep this from becoming the norm in the legislative process, this may not be workable, but maybe it would be possible to have a certain number of signatures that each member is allowed to file with a discharge petition in a given Congress, and that members will have to make trade-offs. Maybe you can sign two or three discharge petitions in a given Congress. Uh, and, uh, I'm afraid so that, that would raise more problems. Would it be a tradable you, you, currency? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that uh, that would uh, in itself be an issue by itself that there'd be limited, uh, you know, you're gagging the members of Congress again, you know. It's vouchers. You know, the, the reality is that all of us know Oh, and you'll notice by the lack of uh, enthusiastic response to my notion that the leadership uh, votes be made public. All of us know that secrecy is not a good thing, but total openness is not something that any institution wants or needs or should allow. It is always a question of the trade-off. And I don't think we're going to find Mr. Solomon, Mr. Dreyer, Mr. Goss, or Mr. Inhofe immediately leaving this uh, room and going to begin the campaign to get the leadership votes made open, or to open up their party conferences, or to open up their leadership conferences to cameras or to the public. There are some things that are appropriately done out of the immediate and direct public eye. But once you get down the slippery slope, as we have with rhetoric on this issue, you can't win. And it may be that any alternative that you offer is going to be called uh, the secrecy provision. Maybe you're going to have to wait and then see wh where you can pick up the pieces afterwards. <coughs> yes, sir. Mr. Dreyer, I think has another question. Yeah. Um, just uh, briefly, uh, we uh, obviously want the deliberative process to work. That's something we've been talking about time and time again in the, in the Joint Committee. You know, this thing simply says, a member introduces a bill. That bill should be voted on. Now, there are 14 state legislators, legislatures, which uh, have a requirement of any bill that's introduced has to be voted on, on the floor of that House or uh, Senate. And if you look at those, uh, if you look at those states, and I've got a list of it, includes the Arkansas House. You know, a bill is introduced and it has to be uh, considered and voted on. I mean, have we heard of any great problems? You know, you know we, 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 we're talking about you know, how this is going to jeopardize the process of deliberation. None of us want to do that, but if a measure is introduced, why can't it be voted on? Mr. Dreyer, if members it's had self-restraint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's got to be reported out really? by Mr. Committees. Dreyer, last time I looked in my handy copy of Vital Statistics on Congress, I think I noted that the number of bills introduced uh, in the House is uh, 
45,000. Uh, uh, the workload of this institution is enormous the way it is. We're talking As about you know, sending to a five-day workload. Uh, uh, yeah, come on. <laughs> As you know, members now, some members on both sides of the aisle would like to shorten the time that Congress uh, is in session. The workload now is enormous. It is physically impossible for the House to proceed in the fashion you suggest, however desirable it may be in principle. Again, if we had vouchers and members were only allowed to uh, uh, to submit uh, uh, one bill a session, uh, two bills a session, we could probably handle it. Are, uh, are you prepared to embrace uh, that kind of rationing? Well, one or two I think might be uh, <laughs> Let's. Uh, a lot of yeah, I think talking about the state legislatures, which has been done a lot today, is worth talking about a little bit more. Many of those states, of course, the legislatures are extremely weak, not terribly meaningful, don't meet a whole lot during the course of the year. And many of them, you have a totally California different assembly. You have a, many of them, you have a totally different pattern of leadership, where leaders are uh, able to appoint all the members of the committees and the chairman as well. Where there's a great deal of control. But beyond that, in most of these instances, you don't have uh, Rush Limbaugh focusing in on the Wisconsin legislature or the Arkansas legislature. You don't have Ross Perot coming up and mobilizing his troops there in particular. You don't have the kind of crushing national publicity or grassroots campaigns that occur at the national level. It's a very different set of circumstances and a very different set of institutions. Uh, we've, we've had extensive meetings where we've talked to former leaders and members of state legislatures to try and figure out what it is, the innovations and reforms Form that have been done in state legislatures that would apply to the Congress. And where they've been applicable, we've really tried to bring them in, but far more often than not, what you hear from people who are members of this institution, Democrat or Republican, who've been leaders in their state legislatures is, they're just not comparable. The things that we could do there, we can't do here because this is a very different kind of body. Thanks. Mr. Goss, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the one thing I want to make absolutely clear, I've tried very hard to uh, carry an argument here today, probably at the risk of becoming such an advocate that I might get labeled a reform wonk or worse by Mr. Arnstein. No, you won't. We don't consider it reform, so don't worry. <laughs> Good, because that means the New York Times was wrong when they reported that. It makes me very happy. To... Not the first time, either. I think it was the first time, actually. Well, not the first time they were wrong. <laughs> but I, I want to assure the chairman that you know I am not in any way, in my advocacy of this, seeking to change the system. I, I still think this is a matter of last resort. I don't want to assure you that. I also want to assure you that I was not pressured. Uh, I do not consider this partisan. I consider this uh, an effort to improve the way Congress does its business. And I don't know if we're right or wrong. And I don't think anybody does, because there's been a lot of good discussion. And the folks uh, inside the Beltway see it a little differently than the folks outside the Beltway, it, it seems, in this case. That's not unusual. That happens a lot. Um, my basic feeling other than uh, dealing with this issue of the public's right to know, which I think is valid, and I make the distinction from Chairman Moakley on secrecy, I will stand up for secrecy in Congress and have, and I've put it online, and in fact I've even put an amendment out there, which in fact passed to preserve secrecy of national security matters that are classified. Uh, so I think there is a time for secrecy. Uh, I think we all understand that. I don't think that the discharge petition process is one of the places where it's applicable, however. That may be just a difference of opinion. Um, and if we want to talk about how do we begin to open the door further, after the discharge process, maybe we ought to go to the Ways and Means Committee. You remember the hullabaloo about the closed door meeting uh, during the budget process and that? Then maybe we can go to conference committees, and then I will support you when we've accomplished that to the caucuses. But there's a difference. The caucuses are talking about moving people. We're talking about moving legislation. And there is a very big difference, as we all know. Uh, with regard to uh, you know, what you said in the area of safeguards, I think it's extremely vital that we hear it. And I think it's been very productive and very useful. And I thank you for bringing the material forward. There are good ideas out there. And I want to be the last person in the world to, for the right motive, go forward and say, this is a good idea, and suddenly find out that I missed the pragmatics and we did something terrible that caused a whole bunch of problems. I, too, am interested in the safeguards, and I appreciate your testimony on that point. I want to assure the gentleman we've never been concerned about his motives. Seriously. Perhaps my judgment. A little bit now and then. <laughs> I don't want to suggest too much. No. <laughs> we, thank, we thank you, too, very, very much. As always, you've been enormously helpful to us. And 
appreciate your coming and sharing your ideas with us. We, th let me, if I may, call the next two gentlemen together as, as a panel. Not that you even may agree or not with one another, I'm not sure. And I don't want you to feel in any way that it diminishes any time that you may want to take in testifying to us, but perhaps having the two of you before us together will be, will be helpful. Uh, Mr. Steve Smith is professor of political science at the University of Minnesota and a former senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He is the author of three books on Congress, including a standard text on the current congressional committee system. Mr. Roger Davidson is a professor of government and politics at the University of, uh, of uh, Maryland. Previously, Mr. Davidson was a senior specialist in American national government for the Congressional Research Service. It's very good to have both of you here. Again, I thank you, as I hope I did earlier, people for for your patience and for sticking with us through several hours, but uh, this is an important subject and we greatly appreciate your coming and sharing your feelings about it with us. Mr. Smith, I guess, um Maybe we'll start with you, sir. Okay. Uh, well, why don't I just Professor, uh, I mean, Professor yeah, Smith. just give you my uh, uh, testimony and, and set that aside, uh, the written statement for okay, the well, time we'll, being. We will publish it in, in full in okay. our in our uh, transcript, but don't don't feel constrained. I mean, no. we're here to listen to you. Well, I, I uh, much of what I uh, wanted to emphasize has been emphasized at the hearing. I, uh, too, oppose um, uh, HRES 134. I think that uh, for the same reasons that uh, Tom Mann are articulated momentarily ago that uh, hypersensitivity to public opinion is one of the Congress's most serious problems today. Um, hypersensitivity to the public interest, however, is not. And I think it is critical that uh, reformers in Congress keep that distinction uh, in mind as they consider uh, reform here and in other reforms in Congress. I would like to emphasize a couple of points that uh, have been addressed uh, or only briefly touched upon by uh, others. First of all, uh, Norm Weinstein emphasized the notion of republicanism, small r republicanism. Let me re reiterate that uh, particular concern. Uh, James Madison, of course, was, among other things, a realist. His concern was in shaping institutions that reflected the real motives and behavior of, of politicians. And the critical consideration for the committee is how members of Congress really will behave uh, if the reform uh, suggested by HRES 134 uh, is, is adopted by the House. Uh, my view is that uh, it is one more step uh, for making the members not merely accountable, but hyper-accountable uh, to the general public. They will be responsive to public opinion, which shifts rapidly, which if the questions are rooted, worded rightly, we can bring public opinion full circle on nearly any important uh, public policy matter. Uh, and I really do think that it's in the interest of the Congress to consider ways uh, to make sure that the deliberative process, which by by any standard definition means, among other things, uh, that the public interest is discovered in the process of making policy choices. It is not merely responsiveness that we must seek uh, in Congress. It's also this process of discovery that must be created. And I fear that opening the discharge petition to full uh, disclosure of the names will uh, move Congress further along a road uh, that it's already taking. Something which we haven't heard much about today at all is party responsibility. All the emphasis has been on the relationship between the individual legislator and that individual legislator's district. That's an extremely important part of our system. But another important part of our system is the notion of party responsibility. The public would also like to hold the Democrats and the Republicans in Congress accountable for their actions as parties. Most rules of the House represent some balance between party responsibility and individual responsibility. It's not an easy balance to achieve because members do represent individual districts. But if you ask the public, the same public that says, sure, we ought to open Congress uh, to public view at all stages of the process, whether or not we should be in a position to hold the Democrats responsible for it, their control of the House of Representatives, the public will say yes as well. So the question here isn't one simply of public accountability. It's also a matter of balancing other principles to which the public and members of Congress adhere. And I think one of those responsibilities, surely members of this committee know full well, one of those principles is party responsibility. And the move 
To make public the names of members signing discharge petitions is one more step down the road toward reducing the importance of party responsibility as a principle governing the House of Representatives. Another issue that's come up and been given some attention is the question of what's the appropriate precedent? Where do we turn to in, in the history in the history of uh, the House uh, for, for guidance about what the consequences of H1 30, HRES at 134 are likely to be. Well, an awful lot of attention, of course, has been paid to uh, petitions, successful or otherwise, uh, during this century. Let me suggest to you that there's no guidance to be found there at all. No good measure in the history of the discharge petition for what will happen when the names are fully disclosed. And I urge the members, both those proponents and opponents of HRS 134, not to abuse the history of the discharge petition in making a case for or against this reform. But let me suggest one place that you might look toward. And it's well within the experience of the Rules Committee. And that is moving to publicly recorded votes in the Committee of the Whole. I once, uh, I served my congressional fellowship with Tip O'Neill when he was speaker back in 80 and 81. The House had moved swiftly uh, to uh, uh, adopting more restrictive rules. Some members of this uh, committee f know full well it was a group of Democrats who had written a letter to the chairman of the Rules Committee as well as to the speaker saying that things have really gotten out of hand here. We're in session until 9.30 in the evening, still voting on amendments. Every time uh, the bells ring, uh, terror strikes my heart because I'm not sure what it is we're going to be voting on next. And one thing that the Democrats did was decide to more creatively use restrictive rules to lend more predictability to floor action. Let me make a prediction for the Republicans that if HRES 134, we will years in the rules adopted on the first day of the, each new Congress, some effort on the part of the Democrats, should they be lucky enough to maintain, maintain control of the House, some effort to rein in uh, the use of the discharge petition. That will happen. As surely as night follows day, that if HRES 134 passes, the Republicans will eventually scream bloody murder that they're being restricted in yet new ways by the Democratic majority. Now, does this mean that we shouldn't do the right thing right now? Of course not. But it does mean that it might be in the interest of the Republicans to work closely with the Democrats to come up with some version of the rule, of Rule 27, that both sides can live with for the foreseeable future. I remember uh, Tip O'Neill's stories about the reform of the recorded vote back in uh, 1970. You recall that it was the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970 that provided for recorded voting in the Committee of the Whole. Two years later, the House uh, then um, uh, supplemented that with electronic recorded voting in, in the, both the House and the uh, Committee of the Whole. Now, Tip O'Neill said on the floor of the House uh, in favor of uh, recorded voting, uh, that, you know, this isn't going to be much of a change. This isn't going to be much of a change. What are we after? We're after for a publicly recorded vote on the ABM because we haven't been able to get a vote on the ABM. And we're going to get a vote on the SST because the chairman have been blocking uh, the liberal majority in this house for action on the SST. But almost surely, and he said, so surely what's going to happen is that we'll have a slight increase. We'll have maybe a dozen recorded votes in the Committee of the Whole in any one Congress on those big issues that have been bottled up in committee to this point because conservative chairmen have joined with our Republican colleagues to block action in those committees. Of course, what happened was that once the uh, new rule was in place, members found all kinds of new ways uh, to use the rule that weren't even anticipated by the opponents of recorded voting at the time it was adopted. So let me re-emphasize Hyde Murray's caution about the concern for unanticipated consequence. But this one, I think, can be anticipated because we have a very good historical precedent, and that is the move to publicly recorded voting. And the direct effect of recorded voting in the Committee of the Whole was a surge in floor amending activity that troubled members of both parties, that led to several reform efforts, and finally brought 
the issue back to the Rules Committee, which decided to use special rules to curb uh, unrelenting uh, floor amending activity. So my guess is that HRES 134 will be the Full Employment Act for the Rules Committee uh, if, it's, if it's adopted, because it will fall on this committee to curb its uh, uh, very dangerous consequences, along with the uh, Committee on Rules organization review of the uh, Democratic Caucus, which every two years will be chipping away at the effects of HRES 134. One last point about public trust and uh, public approval of the performance of Congress. My recollection is that as Congress is public, as Congress has moved to open up its meetings, to recorded voting, public trust in Congress has plummeted. If you look over the last 30 or 40 years, as public trust has gone down, it's been associated with an increase in the openness of Congress. And when you take a look at the institutions of government, which one is the most closed? It's the institution most beloved by the American public, the Supreme Court and the federal courts. Which one is the least beloved? The one that's most open and has always been the most open, the Congress. My concern about this additional move toward openness is that it provides one more opportunity for opportunism on the part of members of Congress. That's what the public most dislikes about politicians and, and Congress. And I think some great care ought to be taken for the institution's interest in taking one more step down that road. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. It's very interesting. Uh, if, it's if it's okay with you, Porter, we'll, we'll go to Professor Davidson, sure. too, and then we'll ask the two gentlemen questions, even if not knowing what the Professor has to say, they may be diametrically opposed. Professor, it's good to have you with us, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate um, this opportunity to uh, meet and discuss uh, this particular issue. I do have a prepared statement, and I ask that it be it, it will included be without objection, in the record. Included in its entirety will, in the record. Uh, summarize it, hopefully briefly. Uh, perhaps you and the rest of us have learned a great deal about the discharge petition today. Maybe more than we ever knew before, more than we ever wanted to know. Uh, but it is, a, it is an important issue. And uh, it is, uh, I think, the duty of us academic scribblers to come here uh, today and remind uh, all of us that uh, there is a history uh, that, that has to be reviewed and that uh, today's uh, procedure that we may find uh, a panacea may come back sometime to bite us. Uh, and also that, uh, that there are may be unanticipated consequences uh, to uh, even the most innocuous uh, sounding uh, resolution. I think this hearing is a vivid example that the uh, discharge petition, a rarely used procedure, uh, can work. Uh, and I think that Dr. Beth's uh, uh, very meticulous studies of this show that uh, although it hasn't resulted in a lot of legislation directly, it has indirectly uh, forced action on issues that the majority uh, wanted to have uh, taken up. Um, and this hearing, I think, enables you to place on the record this, this historical record of, of the discharge petition. A key part of the standing committee's uh, responsibilities in this chamber, and they're absolutely essential if this chamber is to operate, uh, is to review and sift legislative proposals. And in the the process kill uh, the vast majority of them. Last Congress, the 102nd Congress, there were 6,775 bills uh, uh, that were introduced. And there were 932 resolutions, simple resolutions, concurrent and joint resolutions introduced into the House. Fewer than 12% of those uh, were reported on by the committees, although uh, in some cases uh, those measures came to the floor under other procedures, so slightly more of those uh, did receive some action. And I submit as a citizen and a taxpayer, I rest easier at night knowing that those committees are there uh, to deep six uh, large numbers of the pieces of legislation that are introduced. Uh, many of these are unwise or unnecessary. Uh, they are costly schemes in some cases uh, that lie dormant in the committee rooms. Uh, some of them are politically beguiling and uh, attractive. 
It might even garner a majority on the floor. Uh, since uh, 1931, a large majority of the, of the uh, petitions that have been entered, that is, gained the 218 signatures, involve raids on the Treasury. Uh, of one kind or another, uh, veterans' bonuses, uh, uh, widows' pensions, uh, uh, federal uh, pay increases, and so on. So I would say that um, that we ought to uh, we ought to be very careful in trying to uh, to assess this process uh, on the basis of one or two or three favored pieces of legislation that happen currently to be uh, to be resting in committees. Uh, the discharge mechanism, far from being some sort of secret right, uh, is one of several safety valves uh, provided for the committee system. Uh, it's uh, important to remember that they were part of the reform effort in the early part of this century uh, against uh, a House leadership that was uh, controlling the Rules Committee and controlling the committee agenda. Confidentiality uh, of the petition process was a carefully considered and well-established aspect of this process. In adopting the rule, uh, I understand from Dr. Beth's uh, research, they, they d discussed at length the need to protect members, signers and non-signers alike, from undue pressures, not only pressures from outside interests, but also pressures from newspapers and the press and from their own leadership and from the committee leadership. And this current controversy, I think, illustrates some of those problems. Um, the hypocrisy issue, the charge that members win coming and going by co-sponsoring bills and then refusing uh, to sign discharge petitions, uh, is uh, not very persuasive. It, it conveys a rather, uh, uh, a rather inadequate view, uh, an erroneous view, of the act of sponsoring legislation. Sponsorship is not the same thing as support for the finished product. That we learn, or my students learn, in introductory political science. Uh, some of the most productive and committed legislators that I have observed, people like Senator Javits or uh, Congressman Steiger, uh, Senator Humphrey, uh, uh, and uh, Senator Pepper, were people who uh, put ideas before the committees uh, having no idea how those ideas would eventually emerge from the committee. That didn't mean that they were uh, somehow engaged in some uh, 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 nefarious or dishonest process, but they wanted to get these things on the public record, they wanted to point public attention to them, and it would simply be, I think, erroneous for people to, to assume that co-sponsorship is the same thing as uh, signing a, a discharge petition, which implies uh, getting a debate on a particular legislative veto that has not been perfected in committee. Uh, the troubling aspect of members' position taking, in my judgment, uh, centers more on co-sponsorship than it does on, uh, on the signing of discharge petitions. Uh, it's my impression, though it's an impression only, I guess, that members are far too careless in sponsoring and co-sponsoring legislation. Members' offices are inundated by dear colleague requests for co-sponsorship, and members are under mounting pressure to indicate early and, in many cases, premature support for measure. In the process, who is using whom? Uh, co-sponsors use their support as an inexpensive form of position taking, while the chief sponsoring members and their allied interest groups seek to interpret co-sponsorship as uh, a signal of unqualified support. Uh, one result of the present controversy, I would hope, would be that members would exercise greater restraint and care of, uh, uh, about agreeing to co-sponsor measures. Um, I won't go into the history uh, and operations of the discharge proposal except to say that uh, I agree with the general proposition that it, it has been more useful as a prod uh, than it has been as a legislative device. It's worked successfully as a safety valve. Uh, it serves as a reminder that the committees are uh, creatures of the parent chamber, and they're ultimately answerable to the majority wishes. It is not effective as a deliberative mechanism, it seems to me, nor do I intend, uh, think it was intended uh, that way. It should remain an extraordinary and difficult course of action to be employed when all other measures 
uh, uh, have failed. I suspect that this proposal, HRES 134, will add uh, relatively little one way or the other. Uh, publicizing the signers or non-signers of uh, discharge petitions will add uh, very little to the deliberative process, uh, but a lot perhaps to the practice of position taking, which has already, I think, gotten out of hand in the co-sponsorship area. Uh, it converts a procedural issue into a policy weapon. Uh, its contribution to accountability, in my judgment, is likely to be marginal. Moreover, as a device for uh, promoting public knowledge, HRES 134 leaves much unsaid. It merely makes the petition a matter of public record. It fails to specify how or by whom the record should be prepared or disseminated. Presumably interested parties would publicize the names. It seems to me a more effective course would be to direct the clerk to publish the lists periodically or better yet, at the conclusion of each Congress. Such a course would assure that the public record would be complete, would enable the procedure to be seen in full perspective, and incidentally would provide a little business for political scientists and historians uh, in attempting to analyze uh, the uh, effect of this rule. Uh, other alterations in discharge should be approached with caution, in my judgment. Uh, as my prior comments would suggest, I don't favor broadening access to the procedure, but I don't believe that further restrictions uh, are in order either. Two modifications in the discharge rule would, I think, improve the currently uh, somewhat clumsy post-petition procedure while assuring that the disputed uh, issue would be addressed in the issue joint. A revised rule might well, first of all, reform, uh, require formal reports from at least the committee of jurisdiction or committees of jurisdiction. And uh, let us not forget that almost one third of all uh, measures that are introduced these days in the House of Representatives are referred to more than a single committee. Uh, you would require a, a formal report uh, from uh, the committee of reference and the sponsor of the discharge petition. And it seems to me then provide a flexible but assurable time in which this, uh, these reports can be considered and then taken up on, on the floor uh, and require that they be submitted uh, promptly. It seems to me if you are going to consider uh, reporting a version of HRES 134, you should uh, button down the, uh, the procedure by which the, uh, the names are made public, make it uh, truly a, a matter of public record, and that perhaps you should address also uh, the issue of what happens when the pet uh, petitions are perfected to make sure that the committee of record and the sponsor uh, of the petition uh, get their report uh, on the public record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Professor, very much. Questions for these, either, either or both of these two gentlemen? Mr. Goss? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I, I really don't have too many questions. I think they said a lot of things that I think are uh, helpful to the purpose we're trying to accomplish. I, I would take exception on some of the comment. Um, I believe there is a, a, a tremendous importance in restoring credibility and somewhere between hypersensitivity, uh, Professor Smith and your arguments, and that credibility factor, there's probably a balance question uh, that will need to be taken into consideration. But I, I am, um, on your observation about the credibility of the plummeting approval of the institution as the shade has been rolled up, uh, it's not surprising. Uh, I dare say the same thing would happen in the Supreme Court. The message is not to roll the shade back down. The message is to clean up your act. Uh, and I, I think we part company on that point. Um, the, the other area um, that I would, you know, maybe, uh, maybe say that we're a little bit um, undecided on uh, in terms of the way we do business in the Rules Committee uh, is that I have not yet, in the short time I've been here, seen a rule that we weren't willing to waive or 
create an exemption for. I mean, we are creative beyond belief to accomplish the will of the majority leadership, and that's as it should be. Uh, if the leadership uh, has a position or will, and they're trying to do something and accomplish it, uh, that is appropriate for them to do everything they can to do it. Of course, we are going to tell the world uh, how they are accomplishing it, and we are going to protect the rights of the minorities, whether it's uh, in our party or their party. Uh, and in fact, quite often, their people get shut out too. So I, I think we are using visibility wisely, and I think we are also using creativity wisely. I think the leadership is using creativity uh, wisely uh, on the Rules Committee. It uh, doesn't mean I approve of it, uh, because I, I tend to feel that good, good uh, amendments should get to the floor for debate. How else do we ever let people know uh, that these things have been considered? Uh, it's a very difficult question. And I don't think you build credibility uh, unless you can convince people that you've done a comprehensive job of reviewing an issue. And I'm not sure anybody's convinced of that by our track record. Anybody who went back and said, boy, Congress... Uh, it does not know the facts or understand the process. Now, those were done the old traditional ways. And uh, I, Professor Smith, I was very interested in reading some of the background material here. Your statements uh, in quoting from the early Congresses, 89 to 1809, pointing out very well uh, in your Committee in Congress report, I guess done in conjunction with uh, Mr. Deering, Professor Deering, uh, legislators were capable of ascertaining and evaluating the relevant facts for each issue facing Congress. We're trying to strike that balance between what an individual member of Congress can do, knows, does do, is responsible for, and what the committee system does. And that that is always going to be in motion. There will always be friction there. Uh, and I think the time to examine it uh, is, is going to be often. It's an evolutionary process. Times indeed have changed since 1809. And I suspect that you're right in your observation that uh, alien, what would be alien to modern legislators, in fact, is alien to modern legislators. And that's one of the reasons we're having this debate today. Um, and times are changing, uh, pressures are changing, uh, and the job description is changing of what a congressperson is these days. Even the language is changing. I don't believe they used to have congresspersons. Uh, now they do. Uh, this type of thing does go on. And, and I think this, this examination process we're doing now is entirely healthy, and I presume you do too. Uh, and I appreciate your contribution to what it might lead to, but I think the uh, hard essential core of going into the sunshine in this one area is beneficial. Uh, I'm not sure that all of the fallout, whether there will be or not, will be beneficial. And I think to direct us in that point and the Rules Committee in the future to address these items is probably appropriate. And I appreciate well, your process. Well, yeah, Participation. My, my only uh, response is that uh, is, is, a, is a note of caution to uh, House Republicans. Uh, I think there are many House Republicans who today, under the restrictive rules uh, that are often imposed on major legislation, uh, are uh, less happy with, with uh, floor procedure today, uh, less happy with their opportunity to offer floor amendments uh, than they would have been in the old days when you could only get a teller vote uh, in the Committee of the Whole. To be sure, you could get your recorded vote in the full House if the amendment was adopted. Uh, but at least they were able to argue the issues. Uh, their, their arguments were uh, recorded in the congressional record and distributed as they saw fit. Uh, and they could raise those issues pretty much as they, as they wanted to, subject to germaneness and other restrictions, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, and so my, my word of caution to the Republicans is that if the Democrats seem open to uh, some version somewhat different than HRES 134, that is more likely to lock in a process for a number of years that suits your needs most of the time, that you might very well be better off with that compromise. Uh, and uh, while uh, uh, the Democrats may be uh, willing to do that under duress, given the current circumstances, I think the Republicans might be better off not taking advantage of their advantage uh, at, this, at this point and, 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 and thinking about the, the, the foreseeable future here when the Democrats look for ways to, uh, to clamp down on, on uh, the use of the discharge. I think there is an inevitability that the conversation will turn somewhat political as we get into discussing other safeguards. I think at this point, it is wrong 
to make it political. I think this is not a partisan issue. I think it's clear that the people who have indicated an interest in this, for whatever reasons, are not motivated by partisanship. They're, they are more interested in the questions of good governance, accountability, and in their view, that's that's why they've signed up. They may or not yeah. be right. Yeah, and I assume the same as Mr. Why. Michael when he introduced HRS 36, providing for um, uh, disclosure upon the uh, 100 and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, members signing a petition. And I have a, if I could just uh, comment for a minute, I think Mr. Michael had a point. Uh, to get back to my point about party responsibility, 100 is, is, is not a particularly magical number, of course, uh, but it does happen to be a majority of the minority party most of the time. And so it does mean that on most issues, um, the disclosure requirement at 100 would mean that not that, that some substantial number of minority party members would have to be signatories to a petition before their names were disclosed uh, and, and uh, whatever uh, publicity that, that would uh, generate. And I think there's some point to that. Maybe an alternative, uh, suggesting this now to the Democrats, uh, is, is to require that, that a minimum of 100 members be co-sponsors of a bill uh, so that at least a majority of the minority party is generally in support of the legislation, is willing to sign their name as a sponsor not just to the procedural statement that the discharge petition represents, but they're willing to sign their name as co-sponsors of the legislation. And, and if that substantial minority of members of the House is insisting on House action, uh, then, uh, then they'll get it. I'd be in favor of some other committee report, uh, reporting requirements, like my colleague has suggested. Uh, but I think that that uh, I think at a minimum, the House should avoid uh, the the situation that it faced with floor amendments, and that is any small minority. Initially, only 20 members. Now it's 25. Initially, only 20 members could demand that everybody go on the record on whatever uh, they decided to offer as an amendment on the floor. And my view is that that setting some minimum uh, threshold uh, is advisable, not only uh, for the benefit of the majority party not wanting to cast uh, embarrassing votes on many things, but also for most members of the minority party most of the time. Well, I, uh, you speak as a professor, I, sp I speak as an elected public official, and I and don't mean this as a pejorative comment, but I think you underestimate the fact, actually, congresspersons do have backbone, and they do have judgment, and they do exercise them. It may not always look that way in the, in the picture of visibility that right. gets out there, but I, I think members are going to take consequences, willing to take consequences, yeah. by and large. Well, thank God backbones are built with some flexibility, and uh, it's really some. essential that some flexibility be exercised for good legislating to be done. If we have nothing but stiff backbones in Congress, we're going to have 435 points of light, but no public <coughs> policy. And I think it's critical that, that some, some standards, some judgment be exercised about, about uh, when, uh, when uh, flexibility is required. I, I think the degree is whether the, the judgment will be exercised in the committee system, uh, narrowly guarded, or more broadly by the individuals. And I think that's part of this debate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Chair. Yeah, let me just, I'm sorry I wasn't here, Mr. Smith, during your uh, presentation. Let me just uh, ask a question to, uh, I came in right, Mr. Davidson, when you said you wanted to sleep better at night, and um, uh, you were referring to something as being a part of the reform measurement against the, what was, I think, thought to be, and historians thought to be, uh, historical um, uh, chairman abuse. Now, were you speaking of the discharge petition or of the secrecy issue when you made that statement? Uh, I was speaking of the discharge yes. petition, the, the, the overall process. Well, I just want to make sure so. we're reading the same history books, because uh, yeah. that, that, that is true. That's why it was put in there to begin with. It was, the, uh, it was to offer some vehicle by which the will that's, of the majority is, uh, could be exercised. And I think that's, uh, and then it was a feeling under the Garner administration, uh, if you can call it that, that perhaps they had too much uh, um, authority. And so that's when they inserted the secrecy. Uh, I want to say one thing, uh, two things. Uh, and this isn't just to you, it's to the others who have uh, been witnesses here. You, you ask the question, it's not complete enough, you don't tell you to give the details how to do it. You don't have to have details how to do it. If it's a matter of public record, it's a matter of public record. And surely we have the authority around here to establish a system whereby those signatures at the end of each day, people can look at if they're interested. Most people aren't going to be interested, but they are. They're there. That is, should not be a big deal, and that should not overly complicate this issue. All we're trying to do is say these signatures should no longer be kept in secret, and they ought to be a matter of public record. And the second comment I have to make is that all this talk about undue pressures 
Good gosh, that's what we're supposed to be. If we can't stand up to pressures around here, we should not be in Congress. And I'm really getting kind of tired of hearing people talk about all these great pressures are going to be there because people will know what we're doing. And I, I just uh, I find this somehow to be offensive. You know, Mr. Chairman, I can remember going back to Tulsa when the, the issue that comes to mind is the loan guarantees to Israel. That issue was polling about 90 percent, about nine to one, against my position, which was I was for that, and I had a very persuasive argument. I went back into a nine to one uh, audience in my district and told them why I was supporting something that nine out of ten of them were opposed to. And by the end of the about a year's period of time, it was polling the other way, about 60 percent in favor of my position. I really believe that we have access to more information up here, and it is our job to go back and share that with all these people who are too busy out making a living, uh, paying for all this fun we're having up here, to be leaders. And we're not leaders if we can't stand up to a little bit of pressure. I'm glad you came to the Middle East with me a few years ago when we went there to see our troops. I enjoyed that. Mr. Chairman, if Sir. I could uh, simply respond very briefly. Um, I agree. It's, it's, once you have agreed to the principle uh, that this is a matter of public record, the process shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, I was simply suggesting that this committee, either through report language or through a modification of your resolution, should make that more explicit. Uh, and I think that uh, I haven't thought about this a great deal, but I think I do differ from my colleague. Uh, about the idea of the threshold of 100 members. It seems to me if we are going to make these things public, uh, we ought to do it all the way so that uh, people will put this whole thing in perspective. And if there's a bill, uh, a very idiosyncratic bill that one or two members have uh, filed discharge petition on, let them, uh, uh, let them stand by that, uh, uh, as well as those that have 100 to 150 or 200. If we subscribe to the principle, uh, that these should be open. Let us have a procedure that allows the rest of us uh, to put this thing into perspective. Thank you. Any more questions? We thank the two of you very, very much. Thank you. Our next witness is Mr. David Mason, who's the director of the U.S. Congress Assessment Project for the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Mason previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for House Affairs, served for almost 10 years on Capitol Hill as a staff member for Senator John Warner, Representative Tom Bliley, and then House Republican Whip Trent Lott, a former friend, still a friend, and a former member, colleague of ours on this committee. Mr. Mason, uh, let me also thank you not only for coming to testify, for, but for sitting there so patiently for so many hours. Uh, it's good of you and Mr. Schatz and Mr. Gattuso for being so patient, but we've all been patient too. Okay. <laughs> Indeed, I'd Mr. like Mason. to thank the, thank the committee. And let me also say this to you, uh, again, with no constraints at all, to take as long as you want to testify, but do know that if without objection, the entire text of your testimony will be entered into the, into the record at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank all the members of the committee for this uh, opportunity to testify. Um, I know in my written statement, just by, by point of putting this in, in some context, that my most direct experience with the discharge process was on the uh, Volkmer-McClure gun control bill, where one of the main proponents of the dis discharge petition, well, the, the principal proponent was a Democratic member, and, and uh, one of the other activists was the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. So it's certainly not a process that is limited uh, to, to the minority party or to mo minority members. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, uh, Mr. Dingell found himself on the opposite side of this, this particular issue. Um, I think uh, HRS 134 is a sound, sensible, long overdue uh, uh, step to bring more accountability and democracy to the internal processes of the House. In terms of alternatives or other things to think about uh, in, in altering this, I'd like to suggest that you consider lowering the threshold for a discharge petition down to a third of the members on the proposition, frankly, that if that many members think the issue ought to be considered, that's a reasonable way to go. By way of comparison, for instance, that still leaves uh, uh, a requirement of about uh, three or four or five times the largest of the House committees uh, who have the right to, in essence, veto legislation or, or, or allow it to come out, a majority of, uh, of, say, 15, 20 members on, 20 some members on the largest of the House committees versus 145. Um, and I wanted to address some of the arguments, really, that have come up against it, because I think the question has been, what, you know, is there a justification in this sense for secrecy, uh, given the, the prevailing mood for reform and so on like that? 
one of the ones we heard a lot about is a special interest argument. I just want to point out that almost by definition, special interest cannot thrive in the open. That for a special interest to work its will against the general interest, it has to use secrecy, it has to use some uh, parliamentary procedure, some form of, of ledger domain that allows them to overcome the general will. Uh, and so almost by definition, a secret process uh, leads into special interest influence. And in fact, large and powerful Washington-based groups have long known who was on the discharge petition and who wasn't. Uh, the, the difference, in fact, this time was that Mr. Enhoff perceived that he was working in favor of the general interest. He didn't have Washington lobbyists to report the names of the signers to, uh, and so he did it in a more, in a more public forum. The people who are cut out by a secret process are people who don't have lobbyists, people who don't get the newsletters or whatever, or, I think perhaps importantly, people who are not as interested in the issue. Uh, people who aren't partisans on one side or the other and aren't going to be looking around for it. Uh, uh, and those are exactly the kind of people you want to bring into the debate if indeed you have a special interest proposition to combat. Um, uh, secondly, in terms of special interest, the discharge petition, as has been noted, acts more often as a spur to deliberation and not to cut it off. Uh, that it forces committees to act, and that's when it acts best, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, and of course, the link between committees and special interests is long documented scholarship and so on like that. The whole Iron Triangle notion uh, says uh, that it's, it's committees where special interests traditionally have worked their will in Congress and not on the floor, not among the general membership. Uh, so I don't think you're going to find a special interest problem here. Um, deliberation, that's been talked about a lot. And I, th I pointed out that, that the mechanics of the process encourage or don't allow a very rapid vote. Um, right now, you have to wait 30 days after 30 legislative days after the uh, legislation has been introduced, and then there's seven days after the petition uh, matures. If the House is meeting five days a week, that works out to something like 41 days. But more commonly, it's going to be about two months. It's the absolute bare minimum that you can go from introduction of legislation to bringing it up on the floor under the discharge process. And that's not uh, a very compressed period of time. Moreover, if you have an issue where 218 members are standing there the first day the petition's available to sign it, I think you're going to be, uh, other considerations are going to come into play besides the discharge process. Um, and one thing you want to be careful about, I, for instance, don't find it a harmful idea to discharge the committee and require that the committee then do some action. As long as the proponent of the discharge petition is fully protected in his right to get his alternative on the floor, I think that's a reasonable idea. However, you want to be careful about lengthening the time process too much because people have expressed concern about this becoming the first resort. Right now, if you're walking through the mechanics of the discharge petition process during an election year, you look at a, an adjournment target at around the end of September, the beginning of October, uh, and you say, I don't want to leave myself with the first Monday in, in September being knocked out because of uh, uh, Labor Day recess, leave myself only one shot in the last Monday, and who knows what will happen then, might even be in the last six days. So let's back up through August, we're out, and go three months back from there, you're already to May, and you're required to uh, have gotten started on the discharge pr process, in essence, in May in order to guarantee a shot, and probably effectively longer than that. If you tack on another 30 days, particularly if it were 30 legislative days, or some sort of committee action, you back up the process yet again, and you force people who are thinking about the necessity for the discharge process to say, I've got to start in January or February of an election year, and I think that's undesirable. So if you do make that change, Pay attention to the timeline that you're laying out and that the timeline isn't so lengthy in calendar days that you force people uh, to, to go to this process as a first resort if they have a hope of completing it. Um, uh, finally, I'd like to note that even without that, the, the current process, because of the length of time, offers ample opportunities for the committee to report, for the, for the rules committee to report a special rule and so on like that. So you may well be able to get by uh, without that, I think uh, there are rarely cases in which, uh, should the Rules Committee or the Committee of Jurisdiction want to come in and offer an alternative, that that route would be blocked to them. Um, I also just like to note a little bit with a, a amusement as a staffer who worked on the minority up here for a long time, and uh, a, a 
hearing the, the complaints and concerns about uh, the limitations of the process, the, the lack of opportunity for deliberation, the lack of opportunity to offer amendments, because it's been pointed out this is something that goes to, to a much broader segment of bills before the House. Um, uh, I know many, many times when, when we sat around and wrung our hands about the lack of opportunity to offer even a single amendment or a single significant amendment, uh, and it's fine that you address that, but you may want to think about addressing that in a broader context. For instance, just on the issue of deliberation, if my count is correct, a third of the rules, special rules that have come out of the Rules Committee this year have waived the three-day rule, which was put in the House specifically to encourage deliberation. Uh, and, and that is something that may deserve some reflection. If we're going to start building into the rules more guarantees and more opportunities uh, and, and, and ways to stop people from circumventing the process. Um, finally, and it's been kind of interesting to listen, in fact, one of the most interesting things about being at the hearing today is the question of representation. What does it entail? And I'd suggest that one of the elements of it that's been left out in some of these discussions that you're elected, it's not a plebiscitory democracy, is the obligation of the representative back to his constituents. Mr. Enhoff was just talking about this, that certainly there are going to be times when a representative is going to feel compelled to differ with the majority of public opinion in his district. However, electoral democracy requires that the representative go on the record about that, go home, explain that, uh, and ultimately be subject to, to uh, some sort of judgment at election time. Uh, and I think this process encourages that. Uh, and I do think there's a real issue at stake in this question. Certainly there's a difference between co-sponsorship and signing a discharge petition. No one is suggesting that things be automatically discharged, for instance, when there are 218 co-sponsors. However, uh, there comes a certain point in the legislative process near the end of a Congress uh, when there is a serious question about whether a member genuinely supports an initiative which has been bottled up in committee for six months, eight months, 18 months, uh, and refuses to do what's necessary to take the next step and get it out on the floor. And I think that's what this is particularly targeted at. Um, and similarly on the question of majority rule, which has also been brought up, the party's responsibility and so on, clearly the majority party has responsibilities for management of the House schedule and so on like that. But equally clearly, the majority of the members of the House, however that might be composed by party or whatever, uh, has a, a right and a duty uh, ultimately to work its will. And I think this procedure uh, would aid them in doing so. Um, doubtless, open discharge petitions will make members' jobs harder. Um, uh, representatives are going to be subject to greater pressure. Uh, but the pressure, if open and openly debated, I think will, will help rather than hurt. Uh, and so I don't think there's any reason to maintain the secrecy of the discharge petition process. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Mason. <clears throat> Questions of our witness? Got a couple of approving guys over here that I don't have much to ask you about. Mr. Yeah, I, I don't have any criticism for anything you say. I, I would only comment that I, I think sometimes we, we tend to want to talk about bring too many other reforms in on this thing. You know, this, this, is, this is one horse to ride, and there are a lot of other horses out there. And the only thing that we're trying to do is just do away with the secrecy. And, I, and, and so I, I appreciate that. My concern has been when, they, uh, when I heard different options that might be sent out by this committee, that there might be one option or some type of a rule that they could invoke that would allow with this to come out and subvert a recorded vote, and this is what I don't want to happen. I just want to have this issue out where we can talk about it. If they want to put a lot of other reforms on with it, fine. So long as we have the opportunity to vote just on this issue, and then later, if they want to change the system, we can address that. And of course, that'll be addressed under the new system where there's no longer secrecy. And so anything that you know, conceivably could come out. And I, I guess that's the, the main thing I want to get across is that uh, just, to do, just to put it out in the open where everyone can see. Uh, I understand you don't want to load this up too much. At the same time, uh, you've got the advantage now. In essence, you're, you, the Democrats here have conceded you've won. Are you going to win? Um, and I think Professor Smith's admonition about thinking about are there little modifications which you've made now will make your victory more permanent and less subject to attack later is something you may want to think about. 
uh, if, if having achieved this victory, uh, there's some way that you can show a little bit of acknowledgement to some of the concerns of the other side, uh, you might uh, cement uh, the change much more firmly than waiting because you know next year, a uh, year and a half from now on the first day of the session, there's going to be a whole package of rules changes submitted uh, and various changes in the discharge rule might be buried in that and you'll have very little opportunity to, to get on well, it. So I, I understand you're, you've got a pure issue, a clean shot here, but I wouldn't let that stop you from saying, okay, are there a few tweaks, a few changes here that might make it work even better? Well, we'll certainly look at those tweaks and changes. Then the only other comment I have to make about uh, your presentation is that when you used the minimum of two months, that's really assuming that you get your signatures in one or two days, right. and, and it took me five months. Yeah. And so it's yeah. a, I've, I've felt it's going to be at least a three-month project. Yes. And not many of them are going to be willing to do that. In fact, I don't think it's going to end up in many more discharge petitions being filed because the mere, merely the fact that the chairman knows that that is out there is going to encourage people to hold hearings who otherwise would be reluctant to do so because it might be inconsistent with the philosophy of the, of the leadership. Thanks again, Mr. Thank Mason. Thank for coming. Our next witness is Mr. Thomas Schatz, President of Citizens Against Government Waste. Mr. Schatz uh, previously served as Director of Government Affairs for Citizens Against Government Waste. He served for seven years on Capitol Hill as a staff member for Representative Hamilton Fish, one of our good colleagues. If I, may say. I also want to extend a personal word, if I may, Mr. Schatz. I only yesterday, I think, discovered that uh, you folks, your folks, you you, anyway, have been supportive of my little effort, I don't know if you knew it was my little effort, mm -hmm. um, to require guarantees on road building uh, yes. and That's so on because uh, in fact it has generated, uh, some other time. generated a number of phone calls from members around the hill, so it seems to be working. Thank you for your help. Sure. Thanks. Okay, you're here on something else, however. That's true. On which we may not agree. It's good to have you here. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I represent the 550,000 members of Citizens Against Government Waste, and I appreciate very much the opportunity to present our views regarding uh, what may become of the uh, discharge petition process, and I am probably, I guess, one of the first witnesses to acknowledge the strong efforts made by Mr. Inhofe over the past five months to get this to this point. <laughs> Citizens Against Government Waste believes that passage of the in-house bill to make the names of members signing discharge petitions public would make members of Congress more accountable to their constituents, and it would allow for more open debate on a number of issues. I agree that it will spur, in fact, more committee action on legislation that tends to get buried, because in most cases it would constitute a reform of the system. Uh, we're less concerned about legislation that would increase spending than we are about legislation like term limits. In fact, many of the pr proposals in the National Performance Review are simply being buried in subcommittees. I agree with Mr. Inhofe that the only real broken part of the discharge process seems to be the secrecy that surrounds the signing of the uh, petition. Uh, I think that uh, the will of the people has been made clear. This is a grassroots effort. Uh, the public has spoken. I think that the committee really should give members a chance to vote up or down on Mr. Inhofe's bill. If an alternative is offered, it should not be offered in a rule that prevents his bill from being voted upon. I think that would be a great disservice to the American people. I also agree uh, with uh, what has been said, uh, particularly by uh, uh, Mr. Goss and Mr. Inhofe, that this will not open up a flood of discharge petitions. It's very hard, as uh, Mr. Mason pointed out, for special interests to get all of these people out in the open to come out and say this is what they want to do. It's much easier for them to go to one subcommittee chairman or a few staffers in a lot of cases and say, we don't want this to happen. And it doesn't. It seems to me the discharge petition has really been used to get those things out that tend to be buried that tend to be beneficial to taxpayers as opposed to antithetical to their interests. I also think it would make uh, members accountable uh, probably in ways that they're not aware of. Maybe that's one of the unintended and possibly positive consequences of this type of uh, proposal. Uh, so I, I think that uh, this should go ahead. I think it's a, a good reform. Of course, there are a lot of other things that should be done, but, but this in and of itself deserves to be debated on the floor, to be discussed, and to be put forward for a vote. Thank you, I sir. Uh, would appreciate my comments, uh, formal statement being entered into yes, the record. Yes, it has been. Well, Thank you very much. Questions, Mr. Gosser, Mr.
And let me only suggest, parenthetically, maybe we can hear the next gentleman, too, and almost finish up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with that. And in the interest of time, and I agree with what Mr. Chad said, I'm uh, very familiar with the position of his organization on this, and I think they have imparted great wisdom, and I appreciate him coming forward today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You okay? Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much, sir. Mm -hmm. Our last witness is Mr. James Gattuso, who's Vice President for Policy Development of Citizens for a Sound Economy. Prior to his current position, Mr. Gattuso was, hope I'm pronouncing you right, sir. That's right. Uh, was Chief Deputy of the Office of Plans and Policy of the Federal Communications Commission from 1991 to 1992, he served as Associate Director for the President's Council on Competitiveness. Again, I'm repeating myself, but it's good of, good both of you to be here and good of you to have been so patient. But along with us, perhaps you've learned something and listened to all these other chaps who preceded you. Please. Thank you very, thank and, you very and again, uh, your entire statement will be in the record, but you're more than welcome to use it or speak as you wish. Okay, I have a very short statement, and what I will do is, is summarize it since I'm the, the last well, witness on a very, very long day. Uh, my name is James Catuso. As you said, I'm Vice President for Policy Development of Citizens for a Sound Economy, a 250,000-member uh, citizen uh, advocacy group based here in Washington. I would like today to state CSE's full support for HRS 134, which not only uh, would force uh, uh, the discharge procedure to disclose the, the, the names of members of the House who are signing the petition, but I think be a very important step in its own right towards the goal of increasing openness in government. Um, as our name implies, Citizens for a Sound Economy works for the implementation of sound economic policies in the United States. Uh, given this, it may appear unusual for groups such as ours to be taking a position on an issue of congressional procedure. Nevertheless, we believe that it is clear and undeniable that there is a connection between the way that Congress operates and the economic policies that result. For that reason, we feel it is necessary to take a, a firm position on issues uh, where congressional procedure impedes the ability to enact sound economic policies. H.R. Res. 134 is one such issue. Just last week, President Clinton and Vice President Gore unveiled their plan for reinventing government. CSC applauded the goals of that initiative, which is intended to make the federal government more responsible to its customers, the American people. HRS 134 provides Congress the ability to do the same. By forcing members to work to implement the policies they claim to stand for, this bill would eliminate an arcane role that serves to protect the agendas of Washington's many special interests over the needs of the public. The current closed system that is used for, for discharge procedures, we believe, encourages deception. Because of the secretive nature of the process, members can tell their constituents they support a bill, but not sign the petition, often effectively preventing a vote. The constituents would never know what they have done. Members who sign can also be pressured to drop their name from a petition, again, without ever having to explain their position or their change to their constituents. Now, it's very important to realize that this discharge petition process doesn't apply just to any particular type of legislation or to the interests of any particular group. The subject of petitions have ranged tremendously from the proposed balanced budget amendment to the Civil Rights Act, from the line item veto to D.C. home rule. This is simply not a liberal versus conservative issue or a Republican versus Democratic issue. It is an essential safety valve which prevents any legislation, uh, 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 which protects any legislation which may be unduly bottled up in committee. Now, let me respond to a couple of the criticisms that have been made of HRS 134 during the course of today's hearing. Uh, first, there, there have been um, a lot of discussion of, of the uh, concern that the legislation would make discharge petitions the primary means of moving legislation, uh, displacing committees. We believe this is highly unlikely. The legislation would not allow a single member to move legislation to the floor, or even 10 members or 100 members. As under current practice, it would still require 218 members, a majority of the House, to successfully enter a petition and move it to the floor of the House of Representatives. And as was pointed out earlier today by uh, Mr. Beth from CRS, even at that stage, the success of the legislation is, is not guaranteed. There still must be a motion on the floor to discharge the legislation from committee, and then a vote on the substance of the bill itself. Uh, in the past, very few of these have succeeded, only in exceptional circumstances. And I think we have very little reason to, to believe that this would become the primary means of, of moving legislation in the future. Secondly, critics also argue that this legislation would increase the power of narrow special interests. It would, they say, allow special interests to uh, 
pressure members to approve legislation which is contrary to the general interests of the public. We find this to be a very strange argument. In, in our experience, special interests thrive most in secrecy, where the public cannot watch them. Openness and accountability, which this legislation would provide, would decrease, would not increase the power of special interests. Now, what it will do is increase the power of the average citizen to, to hold their representatives accountable. But it wouldn't at all equate the, the views expressed by, by people, uh, by average citizens, by views expressed at the grassroots as being equivalent to special interests. I think there's a very uh, uh, important difference here that, that has to be remembered here. Uh, in conclusion, at a time when the public is demanding open government and more accountability in government, HRS 134, excuse me, <laughs> let me start over again. At a time when the public is demanding more accountability in government, Congress should not be hide behind a secretive discharge process. This legislation, by making public the name of congressmen who sign their names to a petition, would help break legislative secrecy and restore the right of citizens to know where their representatives stand on a bill. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Caruso. Any questions for the gentleman? That's it then. Um, let me say the uh, thank you very much as, as, as we thank everybody who's come here to testify. The committee has received additional material for the record and if there's no objection I'd like to submit for the record a statement by Matthew Pincus, guest scholar of Brookings Institution, a statement by Professor Barbara Sinclair, University of California Riverside, an excerpt from a CRS report from December 1992 on selected issues and options for congressional reform, an excerpt from the congressional record during the debate on the rules of the House from 1931. We'll also of course to the extent anybody wishes us to uh, add anything else to the record. We will come back, obviously, and discuss this issue. It's not going to go away. I do want to give my personal thanks to our chairman, uh, Mr. Moakley, for spending so much time here with us today. I know he's had some other things pulling him in other directions. To our friend, Mr. Goss, for, for being here. And to our friend, Mr. Inhofe, for, except for the time he was off giving his one-hour speech, presumably on the same subject elsewhere. I hope he uh, said nice about us. Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> hope you told him we were hearing his bill. Uh, in all seriousness, I uh, appreciate very much your sticking with us throughout this day. And for the moment, at least, uh, the hearing is adjourned. Sir. Send comments on this hearing to the House Rules Committee. The address is H-152 at the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. Saturday, Ross Perot will speak at a rally against the North American Free Trade Agreement. The event, sponsored by Senator Don Regal, will be held.